All right. Good morning, everyone. And thanks for joining. Welcome to Salt Lake City. I am Joanne Serena, Vice President of Stakeholder Engagement and Customer Experience. So when we were planning to come to Salt Lake City, I was kind of hoping we would have some cooler weather from Sacramento, but no such luck. I think it's going to be 98 degrees here. And I just figured out, you know, we're at a higher elevation, so we're even closer to the sun. So what do you do, right? Well, anyway, welcome to Salt Lake City. Hope everyone um, uh, had some hopefully uneventful travel. I know travel has been a bit challenging uh, the past few months, so glad everybody made it here. Um, just a couple of logistics before I we turn it over to the group and start our discussion. So for meals next door, you you probably noticed we had continental breakfast in there. So we will have lunch and breakfast tomorrow in that same room next door. We also have a breakout room to the left. So if you come out of the doors and go to the left, there is a breakout room. If you need to take a phone call or you want to have a private meeting, that room is available to you. In terms of restrooms, go out the door left down the hallway. There are restrooms sort of at the end of this hallway on the left. Okay. In case of an emergency, which hopefully we don't have any anything that's going to constitute an emergency, um, but Right outside in the lobby area, you'll notice there are exit doors on both sides of that lobby, and you can go straight out to the parking lot, okay? We do have um, secure Wi-Fi here, so if you um, access Sheraton Meeting Network, and the password is CAISO22, C-A-I-S-O-22, so that is um, available throughout today and tomorrow. For this morning's discussion, um, I wanted to introduce the panel. We have Mark Rothleder, our Senior Vice President and Chief Operating Officer. We have also Anna McKenna, Vice President of Market Policy and Performance. Milos Bosanak, he's our Regional Market uh, Sector Manager. Danny Johnson will be joining us virtually. He is our Market Design Sector Manager. And then George Angelides will also be joining us virtually. He's our executive principal of Power Systems. Um, and we're looking forward to today's discussion. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Brenda. She's gonna talk a little bit about meeting logistics, how we're gonna handle taking questions and interaction with all of you. So thank you and again, welcome. Thank you everyone. Welcome to the Extended Day Head Market Technical Workshop. Here we're going to be discussing our market transfers and design components of the EDAM. We do have a few meeting reminders to go over with you. And part of my responsibility here today will be facilitating this meeting as well, providing any information to help you create wonderful discussion and solutions for the EDAM. The presentation and related material is posted to the EDAM website under staying form, policy initiatives, and the main landing page of markets that are in the extended day ahead market settlements. On the website also, we will also be doing a few reminders. So this call is being recorded and will be posted for information convenience purposes only. As well, for those who are here today, we are open to open dialogue and please respect each other's um, discussions. In the interest of time, we will make sure we would like no repeating or reiterating of topics or comments in order to continue this discussion. And if you do experience any technical issues for those virtual callers, please send a quick chat to my event producer, Chris. For our in-person attendees, you're welcome to please use your raised hand and we will bring a microphone to you. And those, when you do use your microphone, please make sure you state your name and organization clearly before speaking. We wanna ensure that our virtual attendees are able to hear you as well know who's speaking. So if we actually, if we ask you kindly to repeat yourself for your name and organization, we might do that. And also for our virtual attendees, they're also um, able to use the raise hand on the Zoom feature and we'll be able to submit a question as well using our chat. But for those attendees on virtual, please also include your state and organization so we can make sure we highlight your question correctly. For today's agenda, 
we have a jam packed where we start very, um, we start off the bat with confidence and EDM transfers for the morning. And from there, we'll have a break between those. And at noon, we'll have our lunch, come back at one and continue on a greenhouse accounting stakeholder feedback and responses. We'll take another break in the afternoon for that and prepare ourselves for public generating pool zonal greenhouse gas approach and then LA Department of Water and Power greenhouse approach presentations. And then we will have a wrap up of the next steps and closing remarks from our panelists. And then from there, we'll have a networking reception here at the Sheraton to invite you all to network with us for this evening. So we do look forward to that. Agenda for tomorrow will be that we will have a continental bre uh, breakfast in the morning from eight to nine, and we will start our welcoming re opening remarks and have our modeling greenhouse accounting approaches and have a smaller break for that and end the day with the settlement greenhouse awards and different approaches. And then and conclude our meeting around noon so we can have everyone travel back safely. With that, I will go ahead and hand it back to Mark for our opening remarks. Can you hear me? All right. Um, great. Well, thanks for uh, your attendance here for those who are on Salt Lake City and thanks for those who are on the phone. Um, I guess I wanted to make some opening comments in this first segment on uh, the, the confidence of transfers. Um, it's a discussion that is going to leave everybody a little bit uneasy because it's going to be talking about situations that are undesirable. You never really want to get into the position where you have to consider, well, what am I doing? And uh, do I have to consider load shed versus uh, other things? And EDAM itself is really try to be designed to really prevent getting into those conditions in the first place. But there is a need, it's a, it's a necessary discussion we have to have is what happens when you get into all those things happen, contingencies happen, uh, you use your whatever capability you have in the market and you're down to those last things, what things are at the disposal of the balancing area. And I say the balancing area because ultimately this is a balancing area function. This is not a market operator function to differentiate um, uh, load shed versus uh, uh, transfers and the priority of those two. So um, this is not an RTO, uh, and an RTO that would be probably a, a balancing area function as a aggregate balancing area. This is multiple balancing areas voluntarily participating in a market, and ultimately the balancing areas need to coordinate heavily with each other uh, when these types of situations happen. And the objective of that coordination is to really minimize the impact to anybody. Um, it includes things like mutual assistance, uh, emergency assistance, and everybody's trying to help to make sure that uh, people are bringing what they can to prevent uh, this, the ultimate, uh, avoid the need to load shed anywhere across any balancing area. And so as that, plays out, operators have certain discretion about to about decisions they make uh, at that point. Um, this is really somewhat beyond the EDAM because the operators and the decisions they make are informed, they're coordinated, and they will have to make decisions about, okay, if someone is in worse condition than, than they are, they have the discretion to make those decisions to say, um, uh, we'll do this action to prevent uh, load shed anywhere. I say that, and we've talked to other we've talked to other RTOs, ISOs. This is not different than how other ISOs and RTOs operate with each other, and some of the coordination that happens between RTOs and ISOs and in other locations. They have to make these these decisions. Um, they assess the actual conditions at the time and they try to minimize the impact. So this is not, no different from anywhere else that we've seen. Nonetheless, um, we have to have this discussion. Uh, we wanna have this open discussion. 
uh, the stakeholder comments indicated there there needs to be more detail about what happens in these corner solutions, and that's why we're having this discussion. Um, I know Danny is uh, going to be walking through this remotely. Um, um, Danny has some limitations in terms of personal limitations from being here. Um, please bear with us. Uh, he's going to walk through this very carefully. We'll help. Uh, be here and answer any questions and try to facilitate discussions, but I think it should be a robust discussion and I encourage you all to engage in this and make sure that we are clear. We we will provide clarity as much as we can. We will not make statements that will will tie operators hands. Okay, so if you will ask specific questions about what happens in this specific scenario we may come back and say it depends on the actual situation it depends on who's who's more in uh in a deficit or, or in, a, in a worse condition and i cannot give you a guarantee that every scenario will play out exactly as we describe um and just bear with us on that so i think with that uh i'll see if there's any questions before we get going All right. All right. Thank you, Mark. Good morning, everybody. Uh, let's see if we can. I'll start off with a just a little bit of, of a reminder of some of the milestones of where we are, and then I'll introduce the topic, talk through a few slides on confidence and transfers, and then we'll talk about some of the details, uh, examples that we have. But just to take stock of where we are, we're in the workshop stages here. Um, Tomorrow's workshop concludes really this uh, particular uh, milestone of, of technical discussions uh, ahead of the publication of our revised trial proposal, which we're still targeting for August 11th. And the stakeholder meeting then for uh, the revised trial proposal, at this point, we're looking at tentatively scheduling that on the 29th and the 30th of August. Uh, we're looking to provide a little bit of time for stakeholders between the publication of the revised straw proposal and the stakeholder meeting to review that straw proposal and come into that uh, stakeholder meeting um, informed by it. And uh, we will solidify that date this week. Uh, we're looking to move certain aspects of the board meetings around because that same week it's, it's our board meeting. But this is the tentative uh, two-day session, uh, full day on the 29th and then half day on the 30th for an in-person discussion on the revised trial proposal. Let me just, uh, just to start then with the substance of the discussion, I'll introduce the topic. I'll go through a few slides, uh, talk a little bit about uh, the framing of this topic, some of the stakeholder comments that we heard, and then we're gonna go through a number of, or a couple of detailed examples to facilitate some discussion. So just as a starting point and, and to, write an overview of the straw proposal ahead of this discussion is that I, I, we recognize the confidence in market transfers is really a critical component of the overall design of the EDAM. Uh, in an EDAM, similar to the EIM, entities are relying on these market transfers to reliably serve load, and the EDAM is going to be committing different types of resources across the footprint to reliably serve that load. And so it's very important that there's confidence in, in the reliability of these transfers coming out of the market. As a reminder, each EDAM balancing authority area, similar to the EIM, continues to retain key functions. It's transmission planning function, it's resource, long-term resource planning function, but also it's uh, responsibility for managing the reliability within its own balancing authority area. And we recognize that each balancing authority, uh, authority area may have different tools that it relies upon to maintain grid reliability. And we're gonna to touch on, on the role of these tools a bit later in the presentation when we walk through some of the examples. But that's a key tenant here is that each balancing authority area continues to retain, as Mark said, that discretion in managing its reliability and that responsibility as well. And um, just as a highlight again, in the straw proposal, we introduced the concept of equal priority in those corner cases that market transfers uh, have equal priority to load in those stress system conditions. And we're gonna walk through some examples to illustrate what that means today. But, but that, that equal priority in our mind provides really the confidence that EDAM entities can mutually rely on the transfers across the footprint 
particularly in those stress system conditions. And again, we'll illustrate that through these examples and, and we encourage dialogue um, as we try to illustrate both what the market will do and then uh, what may occur in that operational time frame. Just to highlight some of the features, I think we've talked about this before, but uh, I, I think it's important to highlight these as we have been discussing a number of these elements throughout the workshop since July 11th through the 27th. But there's a number of features of the EDAM design that really help um, enhance reliability and are critical tools in enhancing the and providing that confidence in, in market transfers. One of them is the resource sufficiency evaluation. And EDAM entities bring sufficient supply to the table to meet that forecasted demand and uncertainty. And uh, across the footprint, if all of those entities are coming in sufficient, that provides a large and robust pool of, of supply that can be uh, leveraged to help manage different conditions. And so in prior workshops, we've been talking about how do we ensure our robustness of this resource sufficiency evaluation because we recognize the key role that it plays in confidence uh, in market transfers. Another one is, uh, you know, that 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 it provides and contributes to that confidence. It's market ensuring that it's providing feasible commitments and dispatch um, through its operation. That the market will ensure when it's committing resources uh, that in that commitment, it's it's ensuring that load and uh, transfers coming out of that BA can be feasibly met. And we'll talk about and touch on that as well as we go through some of these examples. And then another critical component is the imbalanced reserve product. This really, this type of a product that we're talking, particularly in the day ahead market enhancements initiative, but as well through our EDAM process, really provides the ability uh, to have flexible supply that, that can respond to changes in system conditions between day ahead and real time. And we'll touch on that as well as we walk through some of these examples. But we think that these features, along with others, really help position the footprint uh, to address system conditions and really minimize that risk of stress conditions becoming emergency system conditions. And hopefully that's what comes through some of these examples. And we welcome any discussion and, and permutations to, to what we'll cover a bit later today. Let me just touch on some of the stakeholder comments because I think these drive some of the aspects of the examples that we're going to be covering shortly here. But um, I think from the stakeholder comments on the straw proposal, um, the majority of stakeholders, I think, support this concept of equal priority between transfers and load. Uh, the concept that, that, that those transfers are going to be afforded that equal priority in those stress system conditions and 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 providing that confidence in transfers that they can rely, reliably depend on them to serve load. Now, while that concept is supported, I think what we're looking to do today is walk through some of those details and really illustrate uh, how does that materialize in the market uh, as well as in the operational horizons. Um, but there was, a, again, a recognition that, that that equal priority helps ensure that confidence in transfers, and there's a desire for a clear articulation how the market can effectuate that equal priority, and, and we'll talk about that through uh, those examples. There's a request for articulation of roles and how that priority is effectuated as well in the operational horizon, and we'll touch on that as well. And then the importance of ensuring, as Mark touched on it, uh, operational discretion ultimately in maintaining grid reliability and the actions that operators may take under different conditions. Um, I do also want to highlight that some stakeholders noted concerns with the concept of equal priority between transfers and load. And those concerns were uh, uh, mainly with, uh, and, or questions around, well, what's the role of the ISO as the market operator in dictating uh, or directing operational actions? And I think as Mark said, you know, our intent is not to dictate or direct operational actions. Uh, those, are the, those are the discretion of the individual balancing authority areas that uh, maintain that reliability and we'll look to illustrate the different tools and roles as we go through the examples. Uh, but there was also some concerns expressed with the compatibility of this concept of equal priority with some of the tools that uh, individual entities may have at their disposal in managing reliability and potential OAT requirements, uh, such as redispatch of NITs or designated resources and and the curtailment of firm point-to-point -point service uh, under the OAT. And we encourage stakeholders as we go through some of these examples, I encourage you to uh, ask some of these questions to uh, look to apply it to the tools that you have available at your disposal, whether it's 
operational tools or tools that you may have under your tariff. I think it'll be important to see how these examples play out with the tools that you may have uh, and the abilities that you may have under your, your own tariffs and how does this concept of equal priority fit. Uh, so we really appreciate uh, a robust dialogue here. We do have about 20 slides, I think, this entire presentation. And the intent here was to carefully walk through a couple of examples, but really leave time for that dialogue and that those questions. So we're going to go slowly through these examples. We'll take our time and, and we encourage, we'll pause. Please raise your hand. Please uh, you know, ask questions for those stakeholders that are virtual. And, and, and let's have a robust dialogue on how this concept of equal priority can be effectuated in the market. Uh, as well as in those operational time frames of the different scenarios. So before then, uh, I turn it over to Danny to walk through some of the examples. Let me pause here and, and test if there's anything else that that you would like uh, us to make sure that we focus on, or if you have any questions as we as we jump into the examples. Okay. Not hearing, not seeing any in the room, and uh, maybe Keone, Brenda, nothing on the on the lines. No questions. Okay, sounds good. Okay, we well, let me turn it over to then Danny the to phone. walk through, walk us through the examples, and like I said, please uh, pause us, stop us, ask questions as we go through this. We have time. We have three hours allotted to this topic, and about I think we have probably about fifteen more slides. So the intent is to walk through these slowly and uh, talk through different permutations and, and make sure that we understand your concerns and, and address them. So, Danny, I'm going to turn it over to you, and you just tell me when you want me to move the slides. I'll, I'll hold the clicker. Can you confirm you can hear me? Yes, it's a little bit faint. Okay. But if there's, maybe it's on our side to raise the volume a little bit. Let's see. Can you test it, Danny, one more time? Sure. Is this is this better? I think so. Let's give that a shot. Can everybody hear him okay? Okay. Well, sounds good. Let's go. Okay. So, as you mentioned earlier, Milos, we have a, a couple examples that try to highlight how we think the WEIM uh, following the EDAM market clearing process would be able to potentially unwind a supply deficiency as well as what the market will be able to do if that uh, real-time supply deficiency and shortfall cannot be resolved by the market. So I wanna add a bunch of caveats before we get into these examples. Uh, first, they assume all, uh, uh, both of the BAAs in this example have passed the WEIM RFC. Uh, these also aren't in any way, shape or form realistic. They don't include imbalance reserve. They don't include reliability capacity there. Energy only examples with two BAAs, a fairly limited number of generators that are really carefully constructed to try to highlight what the market can and can't do to resolve supply deficiencies. Uh, we think for a lot of the reasons that Milos mentioned earlier that getting into these conditions should not be a common occurrence uh, due to the imbalance reserves and each BAA still maintaining their operating reserves, as well as uh, having additional real-time capacity that is offered into the EIM in excess of what may be present in the EDAM. However, uh, to the extent that these are possible, we again just want to walk through what the market can and can't do and see if our understanding and, and how we envision the market working uh, makes sense to all stakeholders. So the two sub bullets are, uh, this assumes that all collective residual imbalance reserves that were not needed to address uncertainty would have been dispatched. Also assumes that all operating reserves uh, where appropriate would have been deployed in the undersupplied balancing authority area and would then be unable to be replaced. So again, these are energy only examples that are not realistic, but trying to highlight uh, concepts of how we envision the market working. Can you go to the next slide, Milos? So this is the first example, and, and this is this example tries to highlight how the market would be able to unwind uh, capacity deficiency. So we have two balancing authority areas. Uh, you have 100 megawatts of transfer capacity between the two balancing authority areas. Uh, BAA1 has 500 megawatts of supply, 
spread across three generators for 400 megawatts of load, and EAA2 has 350 megawatts of supply uh, split, spread across three generators to meet 350 megawatts of load. So uh, the first assumption here is both balancing authorities have passed the EMRSC. So the market is able to then uh, optimize uh, given the supply and demand in these two BAAs. So can you go to the next slide, Milos? So what happens? Well, the majority of the efficient uh, optimal supply is located in BAA1. So the 30 megawatt, 35 or $30, $35 and $50 supply in BAA1 is all dispatched along with the $20 supply in BAA2. The end results are a 50 megawatt EDAM transfer from BAA 1 to 2. In this case, both uh, balancing authority areas have EDAM schedules that are able to meet their expected next day load. Any questions so far? None in the room so far, Danny. Uh uh, Brenda, do we have anything on online? No. Okay. You can go ahead. Then. Okay. Then we can proceed to the next slide. So here's where something uh, not ideal occurs. So generator three, sometime between when we run the EDAM and the WEAM has tripped off line. What is the market able to do? Right, so there's uh, that 50 megawatt EDAM transfer uh, is still there. There is residual uncommitted, uh, but potentially uh, dispatchable resources in BA2. So given that, Milos, can you go to the next slide? We would expect the market to be able to, in the real time, dispatch units five and six upwards to provide 25 megawatts of real-time WEIM counterflow from BAA2 to BAA1. In this example, uh, which again is pretty carefully constructed number-wise, there is sufficient supply that is dispatchable in BAA2 in real-time to provide counterflow uh, back into BAA1, resulting in both BAAs being able to meet their uh, real-time WEIM obligations. So any questions on how we would envision the real-time market providing counterflow back across from BAA2 to BAA1? Any questions in the room? Okay, if not in the room, it looks like we, oh, Mike. Yeah, just a question. So understand how EIM would, um, you know, provide that counter flow. In this example, Danny, are you, I don't know, are, are you contemplating so I don't know, I can't see what they're labeled, but the two units that were dispatched in EIM and BA2 that were displaced in EDAM, are you contemplating a requirement that they would be available in EIM or would they, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking, and if I'm getting ahead of you, I apologize, just thinking if, you know, those units were, were not available in the I am if they're not fast start units or you know so I think that that gets into the second example where where they may not be available I don't think that we would be looking for a requirement that they would be available since that simply kind of unwinds the efficiency of the EDAM market the whole objective would be trying to not uh or to follow the unit commitment decisions, which are, which are made optimally across the footprint. So in this example, they are able to be dispatched in real time. In the next example, 
Uh, one of them isn't, and we kind of walk through what the effects of that would be and how we would envision the market outcome or the results of the market. Got it. Got it. Thanks, Danny. So, yeah, let, let me just add. Sure. Let me just add to that because I think um, Danny said up front, these examples are uh, engineered to do certain things and demonstrate certain things. And we've kind of said we're, we're kind of ignoring imbalanced reserves. But in reality, these resources may be available because they are providing that imbalance reserve that was awarded in the EDAM. And that's how they are being made available to the day ahead. Um, so that's one possibility. One possibility is that they're just extra capacity that is being offered into the real-time market, even though it's beyond what was necessary uh, to pass the RSC test in day ahead. So just take it on face value. They're there. They're 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 in the system for real time, and we're utilizing for counterflow. We do have an online question. Maybe Brenda, you can. Let us know. No more. Okay. Another question. Yeah. VJ, did you have a question? Okay. Any more questions in the room on this particular scenario? Okay, Danny. I think I think you can continue. Okay. Well, then we can go to the next slide. So, I guess this kind of gets to the punchline, what occurs if the market is unable to resolve a supply deficiency? So we're gonna walk through a really similar version of that example. The big change is that, that generator six is a longer start resource that would have needed to be started in the day ahead timeframe uh, and is now unable to be started in the real time timeframe. Again, all collective imbalance reserves and real time supply offers, uh, you could assume they would have already been utilized. This is Again, just carefully constructed to get the numbers to work to highlight what we would envision the market doing. So to the extent the market is unable to resolve the supply deficiency, uh, we do expect, like Mark mentioned earlier, that outside of the market action taken by the BAA system operators would be necessary. Those would be taken uh, to both reduce the impact of that BAA, but also with the objective to minimize the impacts to all BAAs in the EDAM footprint. So can we go to the next slide, Milos? Okay, so here's the second example. It sets up, uh, just like the first example, you have your same two balancing authority areas. You have your same uh, generation quantity offers and price offers and your same load. We can go to the next slide. So you would expect a similar result and, and that's what occurs. Uh, in the EDAM market, uh, they still show a 50 megawatt transfer from BAA one to two. I think the clarification here is BAA a six shouldn't be able to start in real time, but you'll see that highlighted in the next slide and what the impact of that is. So can we go to the next slide, Milos? So here, uh, the resource again, resource three and BAA1 trips offline sometime between the EDAM market running in real time. Uh, the EDAM footprint then has insufficient supply. So what happens in this case? Can we go to the next slide, Milish? So again, the market is going to look to do what it is able to do to try to resolve the uh, supply deficiency uh, using economic bids. In this case, it is able to start up generator five and that generator five is able to provide 15 megawatts of counter flow back to BAA1, but if you sum up all of the generator supply offers that are dispatchable and all of the load, you'll see that you have 740 megawatts of supply offers for ultimately what is 750 megawatts of load. So the question becomes, what do we want the market to do uh, with this uh, imbalance between supply and demand? There's a 10 megawatts of 
imbalance between supply and demand. Where should that show up uh, in the market results? Should it show up as a power balance constraint relaxation in BAA1 or in BAA2? And can we go to the next slide, Milos? Our operating assumption uh, that we put out back in the work groups in the spring was that the shortfall should be isolated in the BAA that ultimately uh, created that shortfall. Uh, I think we need to go back one more slide. So to do this, we would need to pass the EDM schedule into the real-time market and have it sitting there to be counterflowed against. Uh, you do that and combine it with this infeasibility constraint. So it's the SJ plus times your net transfer less than or equal to zero. We'll talk about why this is important more in the next slide, but those two things together should ensure that the EDAM schedule would receive priority in the real-time market and would not propagate the shortfall into neighboring balancing authority areas. Uh, to us, absent the isolation of the supply deficiency, uh, the market could start to do some pretty wonky things. Uh, you could get partial power balance constraint relaxations in multiple BAAs. If the market is simply trying to balance supply and demand and there's no more supply, uh, the next thing it will try to minimize is likely the marginal losses that are calculated as part of our market. To the extent that marginal losses could be minimized across the entire footprint by partial power balance constraint relaxations in multiple BAAs, that is a potential if not likely market outcome, the issue with that type of outcome is then there's no equitable reference point, which we think is needed to eventually make all the, the manual operator adjustments that, that ultimately will be what resolves the supply deficiency. Can you go to the next slide, Milos? So this is, a 3,000 foot level of the mathematic formulation of how we think and would actually plan to implement this in the market. You may recall this slide from materials George presented in the spring RSD workshop. I've added a little bit more context. I wanna walk through it and make sure we all have at least a functional understanding of how this would work. So you see the power balance constraint on the upper left-hand corner. That is looking to ensure that the generation minus the demand minus the transfers equals zero. You have two additional variables in this equation, SJ plus and SJ minus. Those are the under generation surplus and over generation surplus variables. When we refer to relaxing the power balance constraint, what we actually mean is that in satisfying this constraint, those variables have to take real actual values. Uh, for the under generation surplus variable, uh, if it has a 10 megawatt value, you could assume that there is a 10 megawatt shortfall across the system that this variable had to take to satisfy this power balance constraint equation. So this then combines with the BAA infeasibility constraint. And the one I wanna highlight is SJ plus. Uh, times your TJ minus T bar J is less than or equal to zero. What this constraint does is it ensures right now in the WEIM, no BAA is able to export themselves into a position where the under generation surplus variable would need to take a value. So in layman's terms, no BAA would be able to export themselves into a supply deficiency. Think about this in terms of the KISO BAA right now, uh, that T bar J is your base transfer for KISO that is zero. So if KISO, ha so if you assume that, then this constraint would not allow KISO to have an export transfer, which is T sub J, uh, if the surplus variable were to have to be relaxed. So that, that's what right now in the WEIM would prevent the KISO from exporting itself into a shortfall. Uh, this constraint is applied to all other WEIM BAAs 
that T sub J bar uh, isn't zero, it is the base transfers that are reflected in the base schedules that are submitted by each VAA. So now kind of put this in terms of the EDAM. Think of VAA two. Uh, that's the VAA with the EDAM import transfer. So we would plan to pass that EDAM transfer in to this infeasibility constraint under that T bar J uh, term. It's negative 50 megawatts because it's it's receiving that import. So you have a negative, you have a minus, a minus that that's in fact a plus. So these T the T terms, so the TJ minus T. Uh, I think we need to go back a slide. T bar J is going to become a positive value. Now, if that's a positive value, as soon as that SJ plus would take a actual value as part of satisfying the power balance constraint, this infeasibility constraint would then be violated. So in effect, it does not let SJ take a positive value if it means or take a positive value. So functionally, in the example we just walked through, uh, it would not let the counter flow go beyond 15 megawatts back from BAA2 to BAA1, because as soon as it went to 16 megawatts uh, to satisfy the power balance constraint, that SJ plus would have to take a value of one, at which point this infeasibility constraint would then be violated. This in net should ensure that transfers can't be relaxed as a means to achieve the uh, power balance. It should take the EDAM schedules and give them a priority in the WEIM market, uh, ensuring that they are honored and that they are not curtailed and supply deficiencies are shifted in between different BAAs. Now, there's one other thing that I want to mention at the bottom, and I think it may spur a more robust discussion later, but the question is what type of day ahead tags would we use to inform this? We would have the ability to just pass these day ahead schedules directly from the EDAM into the real time market to the extent that there's a desire for static day ahead tags that would then have to be overlaid with the real time dynamic tags that would represent the counter flow. I think that is something we could facilitate, but would be a lot of additional uh, work and potential complication for both the ISO and EDMBA because now you have two tags for the exact same transfer with some netting effect. So I'd like to pause here and see if there's any questions on how this, on how we would envision uh, these constraints working together to give priority to the EDAM transfers. So I, I know we just gave you a math lesson and that was not the intent. Um, the, bo the bottom line is, and I think Danny did a good job of explaining is this constraint, this mathematical constraint in the optimization is doing nothing more than ensuring that we can find the economic solutions of transfer to and from balancing area to balancing area B, but it is bounded to the point where one power balance constraint in one area doesn't propagate to the other. And you'll see how that plays out in this example when we, we go beyond this, but I wanted to make sure that before we go to the numerical example, you at least got the formulation understanding conceptually down, and then it will kind of solidify as we go through the example. So is there questions around that? You wanna know what T hat is? You wanna know what SJ positive is? Okay, so if we have online. We do have questions online. We, um, operator, please unmute Thomas Burns from Pacific Corp. Good morning, Danny. I, I certainly appreciate the example. It is, uh, it, it's, you made it, you explained it as intuitively as I think that this subject can be handled. And it's a good explanation for 
when bad things happen. Um, in principle, I think that that's in line with a, a lot of um, WSPP Schedule C transactions today. So, you know, the, there's there's no issue there. I guess my concern is how do we prevent bad things from happening and getting to this place? And the, the question that I have and the, the question that comes into my mind, and if you're addressing this later in the presentation, please just make, you know, say that you're addressing it later in the presentation. But if, if we are appropriately applying the RSE and the EDAM timeframe, it is unlikely that we will end up in this scenario. And the question that I have is, how do we know what resources are necessary to pass the RSE and what resources are in excess of the RSE to make sure that, that you know, somebody passes the RSE using a basket of resources and then goes out and, and commits them someplace else. And that's especially damning if they're committed outside of the EDAM footprint. Yeah, thanks, Tom. So I think there's two different groups of solutions on how we can prevent this from happening. The first is uh, actual EDAM market solutions. And that gets to what you were saying earlier about having a robust RSE. One of the things that we've grappled with, though, is that each BAA retains their own reliability function. So we can test for each BAA's ability to meet their obligations and meet their demand. Their uh, selection of and ability to meet their ancillary service requirements is determined by them. On top of that, uh, their ability to replace those reserves if they are needed any time between when the day ahead and real-time market runs is also up to them. So I think there are options through the EIM or I mean the EDAM to help with this. One of the things we've talked about is that pool WEIM RSC approach. This both pools the imbalance reserves that could be utilized more broadly, but also depending upon how you would plan to allocate the diversity benefit could supply some residual capacity that the footprint as a whole could use to prevent these types of situations. The other piece on the RSC that I think you're getting at is the resources being double used. I think after the discussion we had in the RSC working groups, we are looking towards having a fairly high uh, requirement of BAA specificity on the WSPP Schedule C contracts that may not be resource specific in the day ahead timeframe, uh, we think that is a important step towards uh, being able to count these correctly in the RSC and ideally try to have them not be double, double counted in the EDAM RSC. Now, that's the EDAM side of this. There's also a number of market or out of the market BAA operator actions that we're going to walk through in a minute that. Uh, additionally can help us to try to resolve this type of situation if the market is actually uh, capacity deficient. I hope that maybe helps. I miss some, it, it helps, but maybe I missed something because if, if you count everything and you're going off your net demand and you have to have sufficient a sufficient basket of resources to pass your RSE, after your net demand is calculated through crediting WSPP, Schedule C, and, and anything else, you've got this basket of resources. And let's say in a specific example, there's 500 megawatts of capacity that's necessary to pass the RSC. And you put forth a basket of 1,000 megawatts of, of resources. So you're clearly going to pass the RSC. And then at that point, how is the entity going to be made aware that they needed 500 megawatts to pass the RSE and not the additional 500? Or is this going to be, you know, the additional 500 could be made available for bilateral marketing? Or is that going to be the responsibility of each individual BAA at that point? Okay. So. 
I think um, I, I understand your question a little better now. This is one of the reasons that we want to have those on-demand advisory EDAM RSEs prior to actually running the market. So starting at 6 a.m. through 10 a.m., we would have advisory RSEs where each BAA would be tested. Uh, get, their bid stack would be tested against their sure, sure. demand and uncertainty obligations, and they would have a reasonable expectation of knowing the supply that they would need to make available mm -hmm. to pass their RSD and participate. At that point, they could then choose to make any additional supply available for efficient market use if, if that's what they think the best utilization of their resources is, which I think is something that we would we would like. Uh, but to the extent that they want to take the other portion of that bid set and make it not available to the market and bilaterally transact with that, that is their right. That the obligation is just to meet the demand and uncertainty with bids. So anything beyond that is uh, at the BAA's discretion for if it is utilized by the market or not. Dan, Dan, Danny, I think there's two two time frames you have to clarify. One is what you just did before the EDEM market closes. How do you know you've got sufficient resources going into the day ahead? I think coming out of the day ahead market, you will have got clarity about what resources are obligated to either provide energy or imbalance reserve. And those resources um, will will be required to provide that into real time. If you have some additional capacity that has not been awarded imbalance reserve, um, I guess you're freed up to make some arrangements with those, but I would expect that the real time pooled test to um, track that. And if you created additional obligations into real time, that's going into the real time pooled test such that you maintain your pooled uh, capability to be sufficient in, in real time going into the WEIM. Is that correct, Danny? Yeah, yeah. I think that if that trend, if some of that capacity was bilaterally transacted, we would have to figure out a way to have offsetting requirements in the W. Well, if it's between two EDAM BAAs, I think it's fine. If it's outside of the EDAM footprint, then we would need to account for it. Okay. But yes, that's I, correct. Long way of saying that's correct, Mark. I, I, I appreciate that explanation. Uh, one more thing that I'm gonna make a request on, and that is we need to come to a clear understanding and definition of what we're referring to when we say ancillary services and the responsibility of each individual BAA. So that's just something that I haven't heard clearly defined and I wanna make sure that we're talking apples to apples. So, so well, let's do that right now because um, again, we simplify these examples and getting rid of the operating reserve ancillary services um, that exists too. So every balancing area, in addition to the EDAM energy cleared and the uh, imbalance reserve, they should be designating uh, what capacity is meeting their ancillary service or operating reserve obligations for their balancing area. And that is capacity that is not available for um, EDAM optimization, but it's it's really there to, uh, to dispatch when you have a contingency event and you bring those resources up. So Again, these examples are oversimplified uh, because technically balancing area one would have uh, some operating reserve and because that was a contingency event, they would deploy their contingency reserve in response to that event. We've pretended here uh, for illustration that that doesn't exist. So we go straight to the bad point in the example um, and kind of skip over the the reality of what happens in between a contingency event and 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 uh, and 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 kind of these more uh, stress conditions. So I I want everybody on the clear page that EDAM does not replace your re required operating reserve. You have to maintain that and you have to show that. Um, could we evolve EDAM? This is a different this is a different discussion. Could we evolve EDAM to optimize and procure ancillary services? for a balancing area yes that's a potential 
uh, we're not contemplating that day one. So the balancing area needs to uh, ensure that they have those operating reserves secured. Okay. Does that, and does that answer your question, Tom? It, it, it does, Mark. And I, I guess specifically what we're saying is operating reserves is contingency reserves. Those two things are equivalent and we're limiting ancillary services to contingency reserves or operating reserves. Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for the explanation. And Tom, the one thing I would add is I think the way we've contemplated this is in the RSC, we would just do a validation to ensure that whatever resources were set aside to meet those operating reserves weren't also double booked with energy bids that could be utilized by the market. That's where we would draw the, the line with kind of go live EDAM treatment of AS. Okay, or very operating. similar to how it is in the WEAN. Yep. Perfect, thank you. The next, the next question we have is from Bonnie Blair. Bonnie, please state your name and organization, please. Hi, uh, this is Bonnie Blair. I represent the Six Cities Group. Um, I, I had two questions. I, I think maybe you've answered the first one. The first one was, how does the, the RS, the EIM RSE um, affect this situation that you're describing? And, and I, I think what I heard is the EIM RSE should prevent the really bad um, situation from coming to pass by recognizing that that the one generator was long start and and couldn't be brought in and that in the EIM RSE there should be enough capacity if it's done right to sort of compensate for that long start if I followed the pretty long discussion that that we just had does that Am, do I have the gist of it? I think it, if you're referring, yes, there's two elements and, and you might be referring to the residual imbalance reserves, which we think would help. And then really this gets back to that pool WEIM RSC approach and trying to leverage the imperfect correlation of uncertainty materializing across the broad footprint to basically create extra imbalance reserves for the footprint as a whole to utilize. Okay, I think I'm with you. So my second question is um, the constraint that you say exists now that prevents a BAA from exporting itself into a deficiency. Uh, yeah. um, I'm I'm wrestling with the math because I'm I'm math challenged, but um, conceptually, it was my understanding that under current conditions, it is the case that the CAISO BAA from time to time does export itself into a deficiency, and I. I'm struggling with why that happens if that constraint is in place. So you're kind of, is this tying back to the WEIM HAS issue? Among others, maybe. I mean, it, it yeah, it, the, the, the concept of offsetting imports and exports so, and, and not making the symmetry that, that you know, I, Bonnie, can I chime? So Mark, I can I chime in here? Because I think, um, again, under the EDAM, there's additional mechanisms in place. By adding that imbalance reserve, that uncertainty into the integrated forward market, um, you build that into the integrated forward market such that the exports that uh, or the transfers, the export transfers that result, are supportable. There should be enough supply plus imbalance reserve to cover those uh, under today's, we resolve that through the combination of IFM and the residual unit commitment. If there is an export uh, that is unsupportable, it's, it's likely an, a low priority export. 
and we identify though out of ruck today those exports that may have cleared integrated forward market but then are not supportable if we look at our um our forecasted load that was used in the residual unit commitment that's the mechanism today with the combination of ifm ruck to ensure that and put on alert those uh relying on those exports those low priority exports we will alert them to say we weren't able to clear them in ruck and they are at risk if um, higher loads transpire and so forth. So that's the mechanism we have today to deal with um, that potential of, of uh, clearing exports that maybe ultimately are not supportable if system conditions change. We're pushing that back into IFM by use of the imbalance reserve, which helps ensure that what comes out of the IFM is supportable and is coordinated across that EDAM footprint. So the, the one thing I would add to that, Mark, too, that I think might help Bonnie is this constraint does work in the real-time market. I think the confusion in the WEIM RSC is basically those LPT exports get counted in the CAISO's uh, obligations in the WEIM RSC, which could cause it to fail the WEIM RSC. So that's one of the reasons that in the RSEE phase two, we're looking to not have the CAISO uh, fail because of those low priority exports that may not have been sourced from its BAA. Because if we can avoid that, then this constraint should actually work when we dispatch the market, uh, ensuring that the CAISO uh, would not be exporting itself into a shortage or a supply deficiency. There we go. Okay, so the, so the constraint so I guess if I understand, then the constraint isn't applying until you get right down to the real-time dispatch. The constraint's in the dispatch, not in the WEAM RSC. Yes. Okay. All right. All right. I got that. Thank you. Thanks. Brenda. I think we can go to the next question. Oh, yes, we can. But we do have a quick question in chat. Um, we could go ahead and read that out loud, Isabella, if you're still there. Yes, sure. So we have a question in the chat from Rafael Emmanuel McKentengue. And the question is, could someone please provide additional descriptions of penalty price mentioned in slide 25? Uh, OK, so this is uh, on the right side. Uh, th there's a controlling objective function of, of the market that is trying to minimize costs. So I think what we're trying to say is that it will not export any BAA into an infeasible uh, position where the undergen surplus variable has to take a value uh, to the extent that there are multiple BAAs where that would need to occur. I think that the market would then optimize the transfers to minimize the total cost. Uh, assuming that that SJ plus variable, I think, goes in at the bid cap. I'll just say that the penalty price will be coordinated in a manner such that it does not relax uh, before, obviously, economic um, solutions have been determined. And we'll have to coordinate that relaxation with other relaxation variables. But the intent of that would be that it is one of the last things to relax so that we do not propagate the uh, infeasibilities or the power balance constraints from one area to the other. So it's a fairly high penalty price. And just so we're all clear, talking about penalty prices and the optimization, those are the mechanisms to um, kind of set the priority between different constraints, not penalty price in the sense that we're penalizing anybody with this price. Um, we will go ahead and take the next three raise hands. First, Kathleen Colbert. Your lines are muted. Please introduce yourself and your organization. Hi, this is Kathleen Colbert from Vistra. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, 
I have a simple question that is back on slide. Give me one second. Um, slide 16. And I will give a caveat. I've been out on vacation for a little while, so please, I appreciate your patience. This may be something that you've discussed in some of the meetings recently. Um, but I wanted to make sure I was keeping up and trying to catch up. Uh, so just on example one, thank you for doing these examples, by the way, this is very helpful. Um, so for my question here is on the title slide, something, um, so it caught my interest because it, it reads the EDAM footprint will fail the WEAM RFD. And if I'm trying to think through whether or not I'm reading too far into those words, because when I think about the WEAM RFD, I today it's applied at each BAA level, not a footprint level. And I just wanted to confirm whether or not there had been discussions that I may have missed about the real time WEAM test being performed at a footprint level or if all or if that's reading too far into this. I can't hear Danny. Can everyone else? Sorry, I was I was on mute. I think no, I was getting a drink of coffee. Uh, thanks, thanks for highlighting that. One of the things that we are contemplated and have put out there and I think would look to propose in the next iteration is to test the EDAM pass group collectively in the WEIM RSC. So there's an underlying reason of why you'd want to do this, and that's to the extent that a diversity benefit is allocated. Uh, that really is just lowering the uncertainty requirements. So if you do that and don't test the W in the WEIM RSC, if you don't test that footprint as a whole, uh, each BAA could have lower quantities and confidence levels of imbalance reserves than that, I think, 95% confidence level threshold that we originally put out there. You can take this a step farther and start to think if you allocate part of the diversity benefit and not the full diversity benefit uh, and you use this pooled approach, there's additional residual capacity that could be set aside to address issues like this as you move from the EDAM into the WEIM. But there's a pretty lengthy, we had a pretty lengthy discussion on this the afternoon of Friday the 15th. And I think we have probably 20 or 30 slides that kind of walk through how we would envision this working uh, with examples about how it could be leveraged to have either more optimal uh, forward showing outcomes or more optimal reliability outcomes. Okay, great. No, thank you, Danny. And thank you for pointing out which, which day it was covered. That's, that's really helpful. Um, I'll go take a look and make sure that the recording's there um, and, and listen to that. So with that context, is it all right if I ask another clarifying question? Assuming that sure. BA1 is the path, let's say BA1 is the path group and BA2 would be a BA outside of that, if I understood correctly? No, I think we'd envision both of these have passed the, the EDAM RSC together and they would be tested uh, together as a pool in the WEIM. And then what I would add is, I think to the extent that they failed, the consequences of limiting transfers into that footprint would be in place and then potentially that footprint could cure those transfers using the financial consequences we're trying to develop as part of the second phase of the RSDE. But just assume for this example, they've both passed and uh, this is a two BAA footprint. There's only two BAs in EDAM and two BAs in the WEIM and this is what their options are. Okay, no, that's that's helpful because I was just working through it as if they were two separate groups and assumed for the sake of that being the scenario that they're not in the same past group that we would evaluate them separately and that the yes. impact that you're trying to highlight is that on the VA one, the net transfer amount out of EDM will still be counted and so it would be seen as a shortfall. With that. No, it's, so that's an important thing to point out, actually. Uh, 
the transfers we propose that the transfers between ED and BAAs will be treated with, with equal confidence to the load in each BAA. Uh, exports out of the EDAM footprint to non EIM BAAs and non or non EDAM BAAs, those we would view similar to a low priority export in CAISO's existing market. So, to the extent that uh, somebody would want to export out of the EDAM footprint with high priority. The criteria for that high priority export would have to be met. Absent that, it would be a lower priority export that would be subject to curtailment before either the load in any of the EDAM BAAs or the transfers between any of those EDAM BAAs. Okay, that's helpful. Trying a lot to unpack. And if it's an export out of and maybe this is something to talk about later or you are, or you covered it previously and I'll catch it when I listen to the recording, but an export out of a BAA, out of the pass group of the BAAs that passed within EDAM into an EDAM BAA that did not pass, would it also be lower priority treated or treated differently? I think that, I, I think that depends on how we would look to cure uh, through the EDAM. The way I've envisioned it is if there is surplus uh, support if there is surplus supply in the EDAM that we would allow the BAA that would have otherwise failed to cure that deficiency through the EDAM, at which point uh, it would become part of the pass group. Obviously, there would be some financial consequences involved with that to not uh, leave that out there as a tool to, to meet your next day planning, planning obligations. But uh, if it passes, if you can cure through the EDAM, uh, we would think that those should be equal priority transfers between those BAAs. If you're unable to cure through the EDAM or that BAA would choose not to, then our proposal, I think, would be to only allow the bucket one transfers that are associated with pre identified forward contracted supply into that BAA. Those would be protected, but they wouldn't have any additional transfers actually optimized with the remainder of the footprint. They would be isolated. Great, thank you for your time. I hope that helps. That's a lot of information coming back from vacation. Chris, can we go ahead and unmute Michelle? Hey, this is Michelle Keto from the CPUC. Um, one of the things I'm still struggling with is the idea of intertie bids. So maybe. Um, one question is, can intertie bids at CAISO's border effectuate EDAM transfers out of CAISO? Yes. Okay. So in this, imagine that there's, in my, in my world, imagine that there's a thousand megawatts, uh, that CAISO is fully resourced and it has enough resources to pass the EDAM and meet its load. It has a thousand megawatts of intertie bids at its border. It effectuates a thousand megawatt transfer out of its system. For whatever reason, that intertie bid does not show up. Does CAISO have to bear the consequences of that failure and support that EDAM transfer? And I think the answer is yes, but at the same time, in the EDAM context, you isolate it to the failure of the 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 bit the the resource where the resource is coming from so that's what i'm struggling with so you are right in this example uh the inner tie bid could be used to clear an edam transfer uh we aren't contemplating allowing inner tie bids from edam baas into the kaiso so this would be uh from a non edam baa at which point the kaiso would have to bear uh the shortfall within its baa uh and would afford that EDAM transfer equal priority to its own load. Now, I think I know where you may be going with your next question, which is, well, this seems like it's probably worse than the existing setup where that export transfer would be an LPT export and would be curtailable. I think that's something that I would agree with. Ultimately, we may have to implement some type of export constraint for the KISO BAA that would look at the KISO's BAA RSE supply, their demand obligation, and then set an export limit such that we wouldn't be clearing exports out of the KISO BAA 
net exports out of the CAISO BAA that would allow this situation to occur where the CAISO could be left holding the bag for these intertie bids. Right. Yeah. I mean, so this is my issue that you have potentially a non-firm resource at the border touching CAISO and then becoming a firm transfer that California load has to has to support. So that that is my issue. Yes. So, okay. And, and and we recognize it and we recognize the asymmetry of it. And that's why I think even as, as distasteful as like an export limit would be, uh, that would solve the problem. We're still trying to think of better ways which we could solve this asymmetry. Okay. So you guys are still thinking about ways to address this issue. Well, I think we have a feasible solution that if we went live right now, we could probably implement some type of export constraint that would prevent this. Uh, having net export constraints is not conductive to a very efficient market. So we're still exploring other alternatives to try and better address this issue. Okay. Um, just one more question. So um, the premise here is that um, load and firm transfers are equal. And I'm just curious, are you saying that's for CAISO or are you really saying that's for all EDAM entities? We would expect that this is an agreement that is reached between all EDAM BAA. So if, if uh, any, if, APS is exporting to the CAISO and, and APS were to, were to be BAA1 and have a resource outage, we would expect that they would honor the EDAM transfer into the CAISO BAA with equal priority to their own load. Okay, thanks for the clarification. And, and that's even caveated with uh, the next few slides we kind of walk through. We would expect the BAA where the shortfall starts to try to resolve the issue on their own and not just jump to uh, curtailing EDAM transfers, uh, that would be the last step that they would undertake uh, when they've exhausted all of their other operational tools. Okay, thank you. Sure. Next, we have Kelsey Martinez. Let's get her line unmuted. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm Kelsey Martinez from PNM. Uh, this is a very practical question regarding operator tools. So if you want to avoid these very practical questions, that's fine. But um, it's, it's regarding the tools to limit or, um, or freeze ETSRs or transfer exports in real time. So will that tool that operators have right now, will it be able to differentiate EDAM transfers from EIM transfers? And if not, if not, how will it give EDAM transfers priority? Well, I think this gets back to that, that formulation question. And you have that T bar J, and those would be the EDAM transfers. So I think the operational tool to freeze EIM transfers, which would be more like dynamic, dynamic real-time transfers, would still be there. But we wouldn't allow that to be used to block uh, the unwinding of a EDAM transfer since the formulation of this should prevent the unwinding of that EDAM transfer from causing an issue. Okay, yeah, that's how I was hoping it would work. Thank you. Sure. Next, we have Lindsay. Let's have your line unmuted. Hi, Lindsay Schluckaway with NV Energy. Um, I have a quick question. Um, maybe to address later down the road, because this is a slightly different topic, but um, it was something that you stated that kind of spurred this thought for me. Um, you stated that EDAM exports leaving the footprint would be classified as low priority exports unless they met a certain criteria. Um, and I'm wondering, I'm kind of wondering how the market will integrate um, with the RAP program and how exports um, that maybe needed for RAP participants outside the footprint would be met, and if those would be a low priority exports as well, and kind of how that would be integrated. But it was just something I just don't want to lose sight of, um, but we don't have to go down that now. I just wanted to kind of note it. Okay, so just to make sure I understood, and, and you're right, I'm not sure we're going to solve that today. 
you're concerned about like the sharing events that would be called before the EDAM. And if one of the exports out of an EDAM BAA would be needed to meet that sharing event, how could we ensure its priority uh, to honor its obligation to the RAP program? Correct. Okay. I, I think that the first and easiest uh, answer would probably be the capacity that's needed to support that export shouldn't be being also offered into the EAM for, for efficient use if it's actually going to be needed elsewhere. Uh, but to the extent that it could be sourced from a pool of resources, we may need to give some more thought about having a different tier of priority. Okay. But okay. I don't like, that's one I'll take back and think about. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Lindsay. And lastly, we'll get Mark on the line. I muted. Mark, please introduce yourself. Thanks. Good morning. It's Mark Holman with PowerX. Uh, good morning, Denny. These are uh, helpful slides to talk through this topic. I, I wanted to come back to uh, the topic that Michelle touched on, um, but coming at it from the other perspective as we think about inner tie bids and, and we think about what we're likely to have for uh, circumstances when we get to 2024, 2025 with the RAP program in existence. I think I understood from previous calls and, and from what maybe you touched on this morning that that you're still proposing that you you may include inner tie bids that don't have an e-tag day ahead as supply to pass the day ahead RSE. Do I have that correct? Uh, I think that is an open question still. I there may be opportunities for certain flavors of those if they're self-scheduled and can show a resource, but maybe don't have a full tag for them to count. But I was talking about it here more in terms of those bids would actually be used to clear the market and could displace RSE supply. And I think that's Michelle's concern. Yeah, and I understand that. And I appreciate that concern. If there's supply that's not supported by real identified resources and transmission that are inner tie bids and that supports ex EDAM exports from the KISO, I understand that could be a, a problem if those inner tie bids don't show up. Um, but I think there's a related problem and really um, I, I think it, it comes back to including supply that's not identified and deliverable. So if you don't have a day ahead e-tag requirement, it seems the only reason to not have one for RSE supply, and again, we're just talking about RSE supply, is because supply, you want to include in, the, in one or more BAs that have intertie bids, supply where the marketer either doesn't have any identified resource or doesn't have transmission. Because if you have an identified resource and you have transmission to deliver it, there shouldn't be a problem putting in a day ahead e-tag by 3 p.m. Now, I think if you don't go with a day ahead e-tag requirement, I think we see the opposite of what we understand the circumstance Michelle's describing, but I think we also see the opposite occurrence, which is if you pass a BA that's including inner tie supply that might not show up, you could get an EDAM solution where another BA is transferring into that BA so let, let's say that, you know, you can pick a BA. There's, a BA, there's one BA that transfers into a BA that has passed when it shouldn't have. And now that first BA gets into trouble, it's going to have to continue to support transfers to that BA that passed when it shouldn't have. And the footprint would have been fine if all the supply was real. So as an example, you know, today the KISO has inner type bids. If the KISO includes inner tie bids that don't have an e-tag to pass its RSE, and then another BA gets EDAM transfers to the KISO BA as an EDAM solution, but that source BA gets into trouble in real time because it loses a unit for multiple hours, et cetera, I think your proposal is it's going to have to there's going to be no counterflow for those EDAM transfers, and it's going to have to hold those EDAM transfers whole even though there should have been counterflow available if the KISO BA actually had full real supply versus inner tie bids that didn't show up. So I think this, 
inner tie bids being included in the RSE that aren't tagged day ahead can cause exports out of the CAISO that you really don't want to see happen, as Michelle points out but it can also expose the other BAs that they may have EDAM transfers to the CAISO. And then when they get in trouble, the CAISO doesn't have any counterflow when it should have because it didn't really have enough supply. And so I think it, it comes back to making sure that RSE supply has a day ahead ETAG and it's real. And I think when we think about RAP, RAP is requiring all resource adequacy supply to be identified seven months ahead of time. It's requiring a percentage of the transmission to be secured seven months ahead of time and entities to follow through with priority transmission to meet their load as they get into the operational time frame. And so I, I think not including a day ahead ETAG is one of the critical issues that can expose reliability and in an inequitable way in both directions. Mark, this is, uh, this is Mark Rothlater. So I appreciate the comment. I, I do think we're stepping back into the discussion of two weeks ago, um, which I think was a, a good discussion. We took a lot out of that. Um, I don't think we have to go back there right now. I think you made your point there. You made your point again about having, uh, in your opinion, a tag coming out of what cleared um, IFM in terms of those intertie bids. Um, I, I don't think I don't think you meant it this way. I think you need a tag going into uh, RSE, um, and I think we have some ways of differentiating what the expectations are for those bids that are counting towards RSE, those intertie bids that are counting towards RSE, the expectations and the obligations on those post day ahead. And, and one of those is to consider if they tag, and if they don't, what happens downstream uh, into real time. Um, so I think we have took away a lot of good discussion from last time. I think we're trying to focus the discussion today around what happens when you get in those corner solutions. Um, if I understand that some of these corner solutions may be predicated on concerns about uh, intertie bids or loss of resources, um, but if we wanted to focus on um, what happens when you get into that corner solution uh, in, in the market and operational time frame. So I don't want to keep on going back to um, what we talked about two weeks ago. I wasn't suggesting going back, Mark, and I think the description you just gave actually was not what I was suggesting, which is, and I think at the time two weeks ago, the discussion was to save that for the discussion around priority of transfers was not proposing that all IFM awards have day ahead e-tags. I think what I was stating was that all supply that goes into each entity's RSE should be identifiable supply and it should have transmission uh, to deliver that to that BAA. And that should include a requirement to submit a day ahead e-tag so that that can be validated. I think that's different than saying all intertie bids have to have a day ahead e-tag because you could have additional intertie bids that are for economic displacement that are above and beyond what you need for an RSE. You may want to limit your exports, as Michelle points out, to not award exports as a result of those additional kind of non-firm intertie bids or intertie bids for economic displacement that might not be real at that time and, and might not be e-tagged. Um, but I think that's two different things. And happy if, if there's a different part of the presentation to discuss it, just think that we want to avoid these edge cases. We all want to avoid these edge cases. One of the ways to avoid those edge cases is to make sure that all supply for all BAs that's included in the RSE is, has real identical supply and has transmission service arranged for it. So Mark, one of the things I've struggled with what uh, I think we're here today to kind of have hard conversations about what happens in edge cases is say every EDAM BAA has a day ahead tagging requirement the fact that we can allow uh, intertie bids that are economy energy that don't have this to displace those I think does present the same concern that uh, to the extent that those displace RSC supply that isn't operational by the time you get to the real-time market then that concern exists regardless. So 
I think you can have economic displacement and still be carrying sufficient resources as required by your RSE. I don't think having economic displacement has to come at the expense of making your capacity resources, so to speak, unavailable if needed. And so I think that's part of the complexity that needs to be worked through is to ensure that each entity comes to the EDAM with sufficient real capacity. And as you pointed out, doesn't take steps to unwind that, such as selling additional bilateral supply that leaves them short. I would say the same thing for intertie bids. You want to make sure that if you're taking intertie bids, that that's not causing you, if those aren't real and aren't tagged, to displace your resources and put you in a, you or any other BA in a bad situation. Well, I think that's a, that's a more complex question because the, the, my understanding is that the objective of the RSC is to be able to test that each BAA has sufficient supply to meet its obligations and then the market optimally uses that supply and to the extent supply isn't needed and it doesn't get a say day ahead startup, then it could not be there when we get into the real time market, uh, even if it was utilized to pass the EDEM RFC. And ultimately I think that's a okay outcome because that's part of the part of the process of clearing a day ahead market is determining what supply you'd expect to need and not need and not need. I think and, it's I think it's an okay outcome if that economic displacement is real and you're decommitting units. I think it's a problematic outcome. Let's say you have a few thousand megawatts of intertie bids. There's no day ahead tag requirement. You decommit units either in your BA or in other BAs. And then that 2000 megawatts of bids doesn't show up. That's a problem. Yeah. And, and I think that, that is a problem, but I don't think that's what the data is showing. I, I think when we looked at last summer, I think, August was our highest volume month and we had over 30,000 megawatt hours and we had like 200 something megawatt hours of tags that didn't deliver. So this is like a 99.92% delivery rate on the non-resource specific, non-RA economy energy intertype bids. And so I, I think- I think the argument you're that's making- That's one of the reasons we're comfortable utilizing these is because that is a really high level of delivery on this type of supply. So Danny, I think the argument you're making there is to say supply that it is not identified, that doesn't have transmission, doesn't have a day ahead e-tag, happened to show up in the past. So it's okay to include that as supply for a resource sufficiency test on the hopes that that will continue under evolving grid conditions. And I think that RSE supply should be real identified supply with deliverable transmission. It's the same reason we see in the RAP program that, that the program requires identified supply. It doesn't say, let's just include supply with this not identified because it happened to show up in the past. Can, yeah, can Mark, we be, that's, can that's, we, that's can, not hold on, what I'm hold on. Hold on. Okay. I, I want to be clear about what Mark is talking about here because we're not talking, we, we, based on the two discussion two weeks ago, we agreed that we probably have to move away from just saying everything that is an intertype bid that just bids in with that's not resource specific should count towards resource efficiency. I think we are in agreement that that needs to be um, differentiated and only count those things are that meet a certain level of criteria. What I think we're talking about here is stuff that cleared a, 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 an economic bid that may not have counted towards resource efficiency in the day ahead, but it clears economically in the day ahead, should that continue to be count because it is expected to deliver into real time, how should that be treated in the real time test? Is that what we're talking about, Mark? I, I think both categories, Mark, and I appreciate that framing because I think the first category you said is for the purposes of the ISE, RSE, not all intertie bids should count. And we would say that, that really there should be a commitment to have a day ahead e-tag, or said another way, identified supply and transmission to deliver to the boundary for the bids that are gonna be included in the RSE. I think the second category, and I, and I don't think that's been resolved to date, and we can park that if you like, but I think it's problematic to these transfers if you include supply that's either not, not, does not have supply behind it or does not have transmission behind it and doesn't show up. But the second category is, 
if you then accept these economy bids, let's say you have a category of bids that there's no supply, there's no transmission, and you give them a war, an award, I think there's two things that pose a risk. One is Michelle highlights, if the CAISO then has exports supported by those and those don't show up, the CAISO could be in a bad situation. But similarly, if those imports cause unit decommitment, that gas is not procured and units are not started up, that's also a problem. And so we got to be careful on both of those categories. The inner type bids that you're including in the RSE should be identifiable and deliverable. And then any economy imports that you're going to allow in the market design, we need to be careful that that does not cause a lack of unit commitment that puts us into trouble in real time, either the CAISO BA or another BA. I agree with you, but I also, um, um, I think the data that Danny pointed to, I think we have to take that into consideration, is that if those economic bids that have cleared have a high degree of um, delivery, albeit maybe they're not tagging day ahead, I think we need to take that under consideration, um, how we treat those into the real time. So I'll leave it at that. I think I agree with you on the first one, and that's where we got to last time in the discussion. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate the discussion. All right, folks, we'll, we'll take a little bit of a break. Let's take a 10 minute break and come back uh, our time here in Salt Lake, uh, 10, 10, 50, 10 minute break. I mentioned that we have over 190 people virtually. So just wanted to welcome all of you who have joined us virtually. Um, thanks for being part of the conversation. Also, I did want to mention that today's event is co-hosted by Pacific Corps. So a huge thank you to Pacific Corps and Mike Wilding for helping sponsor our event here in Salt Lake City. I also wanted to mention that Malosh earlier indicated that we're trying to schedule our next in-person meeting August 29th and 30th. I know some of you have probably noticed there's a couple things on our calendar that are in conflict, but we are working through some of those conflicts. So we're making some adjustments to our board meeting. And there's a couple of other meetings that we're also trying to get adjusted. So right now we're tentatively scheduled for 29th and 30th. So just wanted to mention it's not confirmed yet, but uh, we are in the process of doing so. All right, with that, I think we can start our next session, uh, Malosh. Thank you, Joanne. And uh, I think if we have Danny on, we can pick up uh, with further discussions on how some of the uh, the equations and the limitations that we've talked about before, the constraints, uh, how those effectuate through this example. So I'll turn it over to Danny to walk us through slide 26 here. Thanks, Milos. Uh, so we talked about on the previous slide how the market would be able to isolate uh, where the supply deficiency occurred, in this case, using that set of constraints, it would isolate the supply deficiency and the market results would show a 10 megawatt power balance constraint relaxation in BAA1 where the supply deficiency originated. Uh, the market results would not show any impact to BAA2. However, with the equal priority that we are uh, positing, uh, there may eventually be impacts to BA2, but we can walk through how that would occur. So can we go to the next slide, Milos? So again, uh, the market isolates the infeasibility and supply deficiency in BAA1. This then provides BAA1 the ability to try to coordinate a resolution to the supply insufficiency outside of the market. These are BAA specific operator based actions. Uh, there are a number of different operational tools that the, each BAA has. Uh, they may have excess supply that is held back and not made available to the market uh, to be used for stress system conditions to resolve this exact type of issue. Uh, this could be kind of emergency supply or demand response that doesn't qualify under the PDR or RDR models and hasn't otherwise already been declared uh, in the EDMRSE. 
Uh, they can also look for emergency assistance from neighboring balancing authority areas. This is a really, really simple example that we tried to highlight or use to highlight what occurs. In reality, we have a well-networked system, and I think there's 38 or 40 balancing authority areas in the Western interconnection. This does afford the ability for emergency outside of the market transactions to try and resolve supply deficiencies. One thing that we already mentioned earlier is the curtailment of low priority transactions. For the oat world, this would be something, a transaction that's less than firm. In the CAISO world, this is an LPT export would be available for curtailment to resolve this type of issue. And then a final action uh, would be deploying operating reserves and backfilling those reserve obligations with armed firm load uh, as a means to create additional supply to meet the demand. Can we go to the next slide, Milos? So uh, assume that BAA1 does everything that they can to try to resolve the supply deficiency uh, in their control area, but they're unable to. Now this is where the equal priority comes in. Uh, the market would return a 10 megawatt uh, PVC uh, relaxation, so a 10 megawatt shortfall in BAA1 that would not otherwise be able to be remedied, uh, they would now uh, view that EDAM transfer with equal priority to their own load if they needed to make the operational decision to curtail firm load. If you go through the math, the pro rata uh, E rate on the transfer would be 0.9 megawatts essentially, so BAA1's obligation or their shortfall would be reduced to 9.1 megawatts, and then BA2 would receive a reduction on that EDAM transfer. Uh, that is, since it is equal priority to BA1's load, and that would be 0.9 megawatts essentially that their shortfall would be. Can we go to the next slide, Milos? So then now the ball is kind of in BAA 2's core. What can BAA 2 do to resolve their shortfall? They are going to have the same fleet of manual outside of the market operator actions to resolve their shortfall. So again, uh, they have the ability to call for energy assistance, arm load to release reserves, curtail their LPT exports. Uh, one question I do want to posit is, uh, what is a reasonable expectation for BAA2 to help BAA1? Uh, in reality, the balancing authority area system operators are talking with each other, so I think we would expect BAA2 to help BAA1 to the point that BAA2's load isn't jeopardized, so if they can uh, help BAA1 and, and ensure BAA1 doesn't have to curtail from load, I think that is what they would look to do. But then ultimately the, the hardest part of this conversation is if there is no way to remedy these supply shortfalls, the final option would be the shedding of firm load. Uh, this would be available to BA1 or two in this example. Uh, however, this is not a market operator action. Uh, EDEM is not currently contemplated as a full RTO. So this would default back to each BAA to uh, conduct the firm load shed if necessary within their own control area. So I'd like to pause and see if there's any questions on what some of the additional tools may be or what that equal priority looks like. Danny, we have a question uh, from from uh, the audience. Sure. Yeah. Hi, Danny. This is Mike from Pacific Corp. And I'm trying to formulate my question here, but maybe something's not not connecting for me here. In exam in this example, you know, on page on slide 26, um, you know, we show the the 15 megawatt, you know, redispatch in EIM transferring back to BA one, and we identify the 10 megawatt relaxation I, I guess where the disconnect is coming is, is page 27 because 
because then we show what the the market results look like on page 28 which is a pro rata um you know sharing of that that 10 megawatts pvc relaxation and and the net transfer being the 34.125 megawatts so so this i guess is i'm not not an yeah okay yeah. <laughs> i i think i understand the question mike so i think the market would end on slide 26 with the 10 megawatt relaxation uh in baa1 this slide i i took the the SMEC price is out at the bottom to try to actually indicate this isn't a market result anymore. This is, the market has put the 10 megawatt shortfall in BA1. It's their obligation to resolve it outside of market to the extent that they wouldn't be able to, then the curtailment of the transfer would occur with equal priority to BA1 flows. So this is not a, the market's not saying this is what the transfer is now. This is what the tags are saying after the curtailment has been issued by the operators. Yeah, so this just put simply, this is reflective of the operator actions that are post-market. This is not the market doing it. Oh, okay, I, I thought I had it until until that mark sorry so i screwed um, it up <laughs> no 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 it's okay um okay i i think i so how does that how does that 10 megawatts get shared between the bas is is that that is not a market no that's pro rata. That's, that's a that's a manual pro rata action that um, if the operators determine they need to actually do the cuts and do the load shed, they are going to do it proportional uh, of the transfer to the load that they um, they have to shed. Okay, so I just want to make sure I understand this. So we would get a market result on twenty six. Yes. Uh, yes. And then. You get an operator. We, so, and we go through all of our tools. Like we all, we all of our operators have the tools to, you know, handle this in real time. And you get to the point where you just have to shed load. Then, balancing area one has to shed load. Bal balancing area one is also going to reduce that transfer proportionally. Whether that is going to propagate to a load shed in balancing area two. That's where the balancing area two is going to start kicking in their mechanisms to get the one megawatt. Yeah, 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 to absorb that one megawatt. Okay, so so maybe this is where my question is. Then is is this a kind of predetermined agreement and arrangement by participating in EDAM that if we get to this point? this will be the, the, the this this is kind of the yeah. agreement uh, of participation in edam there's again there is operator coordination discussions going on at this point and right they, yeah they, I they, know. Have, they have discretion all of those so right. that yeah, yeah. so th this is the, but this is their guiding endpoint if if they can't solve anything if they're in the load shed they're going to share that pain uh with the transfers that have uh Word, word, those transfers from EDAM and EIM ultimately. Right. So we're skipping all the way ahead to that. Yes. To that point. Yes. And BA1 is going to tell BA2. I mean, just, I got a shed load. We've got this tra EDAM transfer is proportionately getting cut. Yes. Yeah. yeah. This, the same way today, uh, this would occur with a firm export out of your BA. I'm sorry, Danny, I didn't catch that. Yeah, I, I think our idea here is it would be similar to today's construct of you have a firm export coming out of your BAA. If you had to shed load, you would afford that export equal priority to your load. So it would get a cut as well as your load. Yeah, this is, this is no different from the 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 priority exports today we could get there under today yep okay 
I, to I told you, I told you, you wouldn't be comfortable in this discussion. No, I. Uh, but I, I. But this is this is this is the this is where it ends up if you get to that endpoint. Yeah. So. I and I don't think I. I think we're at the end of your. Uh, presentation Danny so I'll, I'll ask this question and I don't mean to take us back to the RSC discussion but part of that discussion you did say you wanted to hold off till today um, so thinking has the Kaizo given any more thought um, regarding the pri or the priority of transfers so if in this example BA2 had failed the RSC and sorry. So no, yeah, I, I, I'm glad you asked that because uh, Danny, all of these examples, I think he, he started out saying these are predicated on everybody passing through EDAM sufficiency and ultimately WEIM sufficiency. And these don't represent a what happens in the scenario where you fail EDAM sufficiency. And what are the consequences of that? And that brings us back to two weeks ago where we talked about, well, is there is it just a financial consequence? Is it a financial plus some kind of physical consequence? Does it feed into this prioritization that if you get into this corner solution, uh, what happens? And I and I I recall that the feedback was if someone fails the sufficiency test ultimately <clears throat> and you get into this corner you want to have that to be a lower priority than um, than someone who passed the sufficiency. And I think one way of executing on that is if we have this 10 megawatt insufficiency and, and let's say BEA2 was failed, then it would be a slight shift to say well i'm going to cut 10 megawatts of that transfer before i take the sh load ship that's yeah. that's that's the shift in priority right yeah in and you're mind. contemplating this in in the manual realm mark because that like i've given yeah that that, I that, that, that weigh in. It's, no i i i'd still <clears throat> i have a perspective that i i don't believe the market solution be should be shedding load nor cutting uh, exports. Um, it has. To, I think that has to be an operator-driven decision. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about. <clears throat> I'm talking about post hasp, at least. I mean hasp, but it, it could still effectuate a a a, a schedule cut because that, that's still in the market time frame. I think beyond that, I think it has to be operation, and I think um, I don't think it's. I don't think it's appropriate or robust enough to have the op the uh, market drive those uh, very difficult decisions. I, I need operator action engagement before that happens. The operators may be informed by the market solution, just like it is here. They see the power balance constraint in feasibility. They see it. They see they have to take action. Um, they they could be informed by the balancing area too is is a failed sufficiency or failed RSE, they could take that that order and mix it up. Now I'm saying this, we need to we need to get the operators on board on that sequencing and what they need to do um, uh, to supervise the market. Yeah, I think I think I agree with you, Mark. And I I guess I would see that as the same thing kind of last resort. You know, I'm not looking to if he's felt the RSC, that would still be after you've done everything you can before you cut that transfer. That's in my mind, yeah. By the way, I, we, we do want feedback on this because this is an important <laughs> concept. Um, both in terms of the passing of the sufficiency test and what's the consequences and and then truly is is that is that the appropriate consequence for someone who doesn't pass the sufficiency test but is otherwise still participating in the market is that the appropriate pivot in terms of the priority I, I, we, we need some feedback on this because that's what I took away from the last two weeks discussion
Okay, we will get Isabella um, to read our chat question. Hi, everyone. This is Isabella. We have a question in the chat from Sybil Gieselman from a public generating pool. And the question is, could you please explain further the math behind the pro rata cuts? Uh, for example, how were the negative 9.125 and negative 8.875 values arrived at? Sure. So it's just the load that BA1 has to serve and the 35 megawatt export that they are still obligated to make to BA2. So it's the ratio between those two is then reflect is then applied to that 10 megawatt curtailment to determine the pro rata cut. So 35 divided by 400 times 10 is the curtailment to BA2. Okay, it looks like that addressed his question. So thank you. Now we go ahead and take our hand raised in virtual chat. Let's take Kathleen first. Hi, this is Kathleen Colbert from District. Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Again, I have a couple of clarifying questions. Uh, one that I didn't think I was going to ask, and this is a kind of a silly question, but I had thought it was, I think about Pareta, I thought it was 35 out of 435, the sum of both. Okay. That's is that fair right? enough. Like, no, 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 that's, Sorry. that's fair. Yeah. That's, you just made me think of it. Like that made yeah. But yeah, it's it, it's just it's a pro rata curtailment. Okay, okay, just the standard. Yeah, so thirty five divided standard. by four hundred plus thirty five multiplied by ten okay. equals the two's curtailment. Awesome. Okay, sorry, apologies for that. Um, but that is helpful. Uh, so because I'm also working through kind of piecing together, and I think that. What I'm trying to process and understand is is where the where the EDAM market would kind of stop, if that makes sense. What what it would see, and I think you guys have done a good job of, of explaining that with Mark a little bit. But uh, from specific corporate, let me tease out a couple of questions. If you go back to the last, well, I maybe stay here. So this is after the market results. My understanding of your example is that the net transfer that the market would see at the end of its solution would be 35, the 35 megawatts out of the BAA one and 35 megawatts into BAA two as a net transfer. And then all of yep. this is done after the fact. Okay, perfect. And if you can go back to the previous slide, I have a question about pricing or two slides, sorry. <clears throat> If you go to slide 26, I think it is with the yeah with the, with the PVC relaxation. Mm -hmm. So seeing that the the scare the the PVC relaxation is in both BA1 and BA2, but then rooting myself in okay, assume that we're all within this path group. I'm I see something implicit here, and I wanted to ask if I'm understanding this correctly that in the real time, are you thinking about shifting from where every EIM BAA has an individual power balance constraint that is enforced to enforcing a single power balance constraint for the pass group? I think that we would look to have individual power balance constraints. Uh, the pass group concept is just in terms of the WEIM RSC and how the pass group would interact with that application okay um thank you that's helpful clarification um when i'm looking at the price signal assuming that you know with that understanding that these are two you know we're still going to keep the individual pvcs i guess intuitively i would have thought that the pvc relaxation of ba1 would result in a smack of a thousand but the ba2 which is not short and has can meet with the transfer we're respecting at 35 in and its internal generation, its 350 loads would not reflect a power balance constraint price impact. Can you clarify that for me? Uh, to me, I, I think you raise an important point that I hadn't given a ton of thought to. I had kind of thought that we would 
it would be buying an import that is at the cap at a BA1. And so it would be reflected. But I, I defer to Mark or George as you've given this more thought. Should it be $90 in BA2? Like, how would we price that import when BA1 is, uh, has their PBC relaxed? Thanks, Danny. Let's uh, see, George. Hello, can, this yeah. is George Angelovich. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yes, George. Uh, yes, yeah, so in this example, you don't have a, a transfer limit. There is no scheduling limit being hit in the transfer, so there's no price separation between the BAA1 and BAA2, so your marginal price, which will be $1,000 uh, set by the relaxation penalty for BAA1 will also be seen as the marginal price for BAA2. If there was a price separation due to a constraint, uh, perhaps a transfer scheduling limit being binding, then you would have the effect of having different prices and the price in BAA2 would be, in this case, uh, uh, the last price you use, uh, like $70. $90 would be only if uh, resource uh, six was actually online and available. Thank you. Thanks, uh, no, I appreciate that. And this is something I'll think about some more, but I wanted to raise it for the group. I think it's a really important element of your example of how prices when this occurs impact the different BAAs within, <laughs> even within this task group, right? Um, and I think it is, there's a policy question in here. So I wanted to highlight it and ask folks to think about it for further discussion. Um, I have one more thing to tease out if that's okay. I wanted to ask if y'all had contemplated, um, so the market's gonna result in a 35 tra net transfer out of the AA1 into the AA2, we're gonna have settled, and this is kind of a settlement question, this is a settlement question. So the market will settle that 35 megawatts. Um, the, the pro rata curtailment's gonna happen, the curtailments will happen in these adjustments after the fact. In the settlement time horizon, I, are you thinking that the, the EDAM market will settle the 35 megawatt transfer, settle the internal generation um, as, just what the market sees and then any difference of this, this 30 so this transfer amount that's limited in the operational like by operator action is handled out of the market settlement process by those baas if they have any disputes about that or are you thinking about attempting to capture the 35 the difference between 35 and 34.125 in your settlement I think that we haven't given a ton or we're not far enough along on the settlement design to answer that question. So if James Lynn, I don't see him on the call, but I would defer to him uh, in future uh, papers that we put out about how we would plan to handle the aftermarket curtailments from a settlements perspective. Uh, Danny, maybe I can answer this. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, this this is George Angelini. So the settlement for uh, intertie schedules, including transfers, is, is based on what we call the final tag. So although the in this example, the market schedule for the transfer will be 35 megawatts, the final tag, uh, which is the after the fact, will show 34.125, and the settlement is going to be based on, on this value. Thank you. No, that's helpful, George. Um, that's 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 very helpful detail, and I just ask the okay, case. So when you're working through your next kind of documenting some of this stuff, make sure to capture that because we've been talking about these transfers impacting other elements like the um, of transmission as well and uplift mechanisms. So I just don't want to lose that it's important what the actual EDM transfer revenues are being settled at. If you can have that um, in mind, that'd be great. Thank you so much. Okay, Friend so or Isabella, there we go. Yeah, we did have a follow-up question in the chat um, to Sybil's previous question. Um, so the explanation given by an audience member a little bit ago gave a different result. So 35 divided by 435 times 10 
is 0 0.805, not 0 0.875. Um, and they'd just like to know if that was an error on the slide or if it it's, was. Yes, 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 that's an error. I mean, I, I apologize for, for the math error, so. All right, thanks, Danny. Thanks for that, Danny. I, th I think we can go to some of the questions in online, Brenda. Hello, Danny. This is Tom Burns from Pacific Corp. I, I, I do want to say that I appreciate these examples, and I think that they do a good job of demonstrating conceptually what's going on. I, I do have a suggestion because we are you know, even though we're pooling things together, we're still functioning as separate balancing authority areas. Um, the Western power pool footprint has some, some different operating procedures in regards to these types of situations. And so my, my suggestion is that there's coordination done between these groups because there are specific things that the Western power pool does whenever a BAA approaches EA, EEAs within the Western Power Pool footprint and the assistance that they provide. Um, not, not expecting this to be contemplated in these, you know, uh, slides or, you know, in, in this conversation, just food for thought as we proceed forward. Tom, this is Mark. I appreciate, you say, I appreciate you saying that because I think it is part of that tool set um, that exists, especially for those in reserve sharing groups that uh, they could afford themselves um, to prevent getting into this, situ this, this end state condition. So I, I agree with you, and maybe we should just mention that, uh, especially for those in the reserve sharing groups. Thanks, Mark. Next, we have Mark Holm from PowerX. Hi, Danny. Hi, Mark. Um, Good discussion. Um, I, I want to come back to something that that uh, the the exchange between between Mike Wilding and yourself, Mark, and you're talking about uh, curtailments outside of the market solution, which you know I think as a principle we we don't want to curtail any transfers that cause a reliability event if there's enough supply. Um, to maintain reliability. And I think that's one of the foundational principles. It's also come up in the EIM uh, resource efficiency. But I think another principle is we don't want to, we, we don't want someone who fails the RSE to pull another BA into uh, emergency or, or potential even load shed. And I'm wondering if um, there's perhaps a dual solution for a failing BA, both in the market and post-market. And that would be that if a BA fails the RSE, the transfers, the EDAM transfers to that BA drop a priority level. So you could call it non-firm, you could call it priority two. And then in the market solution, those get transfers get curtailed just before a power balance. And so rather than sending a BA that's got export awards to that BA into a power balance, you relax those transfers just before a power balance. And then if there's a further problem in real time post market solution, those transfers would also be labeled as lower priority. So if there's a manual action that needs to happen, the operator you know, needs to cut some more transfers to protect their load, they would curtail those first, that there might be both a optimization solution and a post-market solution that seems to be appropriate and consistent with at least what I understand the principles to be, which is we want to allow those transfers to occur to maintain reliability, but we don't want to pull another BA into a reliability situation to serve a BA that failed the resource sufficiency. Um, just wondering if you have any thoughts on that. I appreciate the um the question you pose i we need to think that through and how if it e could be even facilitated in light of the fact that you're already incorporating some economic penalties into the solution for the failed um balancing area so i can't think about what that solution looks like in isolation now that we're going down the road of considering the the financial 
um, consequences. But we'll take that under consideration. I, I appreciate that, Mark. And I think that's true when you think about the financial cost that was posed for EDAM, when you think about where EIM RSE seems to be going, there's a combination of allowing those allowing incremental transfers at a penalty price close to the or at the offer cap. And I think this is uh, a similar concept of curtailing EDAM transfers or limiting them. But I think it needs to be carefully thought through. Again, the, the principles we're trying to achieve here, I think, is we want to allow the transfers if we can safely do so, including to BAs that fail. We don't want a BA that fails to pull another BA into emergency conditions or potentially even load shed. Um, but I appreciate the opportunity to suggest it. We have a hand in, in, in the room, Stuart. There we go. I'm a somewhat what with Mark Holman on this, that we need to strike the right balance and don't get in a position where someone's failed the RSC, there's a financial penalty, but the end result is one or more um, additional BAs get dragged into that problem. I don't think that's a good outcome at, at, at all. And I, I don't think that we're good trying to defend um, those load sheds and it's only picking up a penalty price. Um, it's, it's trying to, I appreciate where Mark's taking the dialogue in this one, but I think that's just a bad outcome. I, I, again, Stuart, I think if we go back to the equation that um, Danny talked about earlier, I think that equation for a failed or, an, or, a, or a passing RSE a balancing area or a failed balancing area helps prevent, again, having a power balance constraint propagate to another area. So I think that already addresses that uh, that concern. So even the failed balancing area will not propagate to another balancing area through that equation, if I understand it correctly. That's a fair point. I accept that, that's a fair point. Um, I do then start to worry about the all the coordinated actions that are going to have to take place between the respective operators when they're under a clock. I just, yeah. you know, you start to lower transfer, try to isolate the transfer. You're, you're just trying to, you know, get, get things, either shed load or not, right, basically? Yeah. Well, I think, Stuart, that's one of the almost advantages of kind of sequencing EDAM and the WEIM RSC is we're running advisory uh, real-time unit commitment runs between four and seven 15 minute intervals out. So to the extent that that it looks like there could be a shortfall, that can actually provide additional forewarning, uh, which then the BAA operators can use to better coordinate their responses. Good point. We can take Doug's question. Hi, this is Doug Bochignone for the Bay Area Municipal Transmission Group. I just wanted to, to um, sort of run by how I'm interpreting this and see if you agree with my interpretation. It, it seems like what we're saying here is that each balancing authority is responsible for firming up the internal resources that are used to serve its load and any transfers out. It's, is that is that right? I guess I would. I you characterize it either way. I, I think that I think it is right. I think that part of the construct of EDAM is that you are agreeing to. Um, you're not going to be one balancing area on RTO, but you are agreeing to coordinate and uh, to Mark Holman's point, forego potentially commitments you otherwise would have made. You would not be able to do that if you couldn't rely on those transfers. So yes, I think part of the construct is the expectation that those transfers have have a level of confidence in them. If it doesn't, <laughs> right. it doesn't break, it breaks down. 
Yeah, and so it seems like then, and then the BAs would have to rely on whatever tools they use to to be comfortable that they can support those resources and to serve their load and the transfer. And for the ISO, the ISO will rely on it's the market tools like the day head market enhancements features. I'm thinking of in particular to to firm up any variable resources that are supporting transfers out, for example, or just uncertainty for conventional resources. Um, and then, I mean, it seems like that all holds together, but then when we're talking about transactions in that aren't coming from an EDAM entity, thinking about the conversation with Mark Holman about, you know, uh, intertie transactions, it seems like that's, that, that's the key question is, Who's firming up the intertie transaction? And when the source is known, it's obvious it's the source BAA. I think the scenario he was describing where somebody's not performing, you know, that's that's where I think you have questions. Right. If if somebody didn't make the delivery, then they didn't have a source BAA. Yes, I, I agree with what you said. Um, and I think it comes down to how do you ensure rather than just assume that if it if it, if it comes out of the day ahead market without a source at that point, rather than assuming that it's not going to deliver, what is the what is the assumptions you should make and what are the expectations on that um, that inner tie bid that cleared? And I think we have clear mechanisms right now setting the expectations uh, of delivery of, a, of that, and there are penalties for non-delivery. Um, but I understand the question, and we have to make sure that this is something everybody is comfortable with in the in the EDAM context. Um, and so I understand we, 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 this is something we just have we'll have to grapple with. Um, yeah. I don't think. I don't think we can just say, well, no intertie bids uh, or any intertie bid that clears is uh, effectively uh, a zero credit to real time. I think there is something in between and we have to come to that right place of, of characterizing that. Yeah, and I, I agree with you completely on that. And, and I think it's important to recognize that, you know, we're up, this is what's happening today. And if this was a big problem, we should be experienced. We should have already been experiencing these big problems. And I think you alluded to to the analysis that says it hasn't been a big problem. And I don't think what I don't think EDAM itself really would change the what's happening in in that regard. I think it'll just happen more efficiently than it happens now. I agree with you. I think it expands the. I guess it expands the interest in the outcome. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I think you need to make sure you deal with the outcome for these unusual circumstances appropriately. But I don't think, I, I think this is going to be a really rare occurrence. And we shouldn't let that stop the operation of the market. Thank you for that last comment. We have one more question from Thomas. Thomas Burns with Pacific Corp. So once again, and, and this is not a criticism of these slides or these examples, because I think that these examples are great to demonstrate these corner cases. But I think some place where it seems like people are getting hung up is if somebody fails the RSE. And in theory, if we're talking about a wider area footprint involving more uh, participants, there should not be a transfer out of a BAA or, or there should not be an originating export from a BAA that fails the RSC. In those cases, we would primarily be talking about wheel throughs on, on those entities. Is that a correct assumption? I'm, I'm expanding these examples, but is that a correct assumption? I 
Danny. <laughs> I didn't I didn't quite follow it, Tom. Can you can you try one more time? So if you have an entity that fails the RSC, I'm making the assumption that there would not be EDAM transfers that originate from that entity. Yes. So I think the nuance here, Tom, and this ties into where what we talked about a couple of weeks ago is if an EDAM BAA failed the RSC, but then cured through residual supply in the EDAM, they would be part of the pass group and would have transfers that could be optimally exported out of them, uh, but would have been relying on extra capacity that it bought through the EDAM to be part of that pass group. Okay, so they essentially have passed. And what we're, yes. what we're, really, what we're really talking about is the risk of, of pass-through transfers or wheel through transfers for an entity being curtailed. I think that's one way to frame it. I, I'm, I think the concern is just that that BAA cured through the EDAM and didn't cure through the bilateral market is kind of the way I've understood it. Okay. But if, but you're saying if it cures through the EDAM, then essentially they're facilitating wheels between potentially two other EDAM past BAAs, and those could be in jeopardy by the fact that this BAA was part of the optimal solution in the day ahead? Yes. Okay. And, and that's where I, I'm, I, I don't know that we want to make an entity that fails but cures a lower priority we want them all to be the same priority because it might just be a, a wheel through yeah i just i think what you're is there is a real danger there uh because the edam transfers are calculated optimally and are sometimes needed for counter flows uh as part of the optimal solution so if you give some of them a lower priority it does have knock-on effects that, that would be really hard to estimate about what would happen in the real time market. Okay. All right. Thank you for the clarification. At least that's, that's the way I've understood it, George. Does that make sense with kind of how you thought through the EDAM to WEAM reoptimization? Um, yes, Danny. Uh, what I wanted to say is that uh, the will for is always possible, even if a BAA has failed, because even when we uh, even if we exercise the option to lock the, the transfer, is the net transfer that is restricted. So there can always be a will through a BAA that has failed the, the RSC. Um, thanks, George. Brenda, or other, do we have any questions online, Brenda? No? Yep. Okay. Yeah, we do have a question in the chat from Petr Rostonovic. Since EDAM transfers will have the same priority as BAA, BAA internal load, should selling EDAM BAAs increase reserves accordingly? In other words, should BAA export transfer be limited by amount of reserve BAA has? So this then kind of gets back to trying to dictate what the AS requirements are, uh, the reserve requirements are which we've tried to separate out and let that uh, be determined by each BAA. I'm trying to think through how this would work because you don't, it's a little bit hard because you don't know your reserve obligation until you know the transfers, but then you're kind of positing that the transfers should be limited by your reserve obligation. I don't know, does anybody else on the panel have thoughts on this? I, and we need to think about that one. I think one, my, my first thought is, well, are we talking about, about operating reserves or the imbalance reserves covering uncertainty? And then the second thing comes to mind is that you will not know the solution until you know, you, you won't know your reserve requirement until you know the solution, which means some of those additional, maybe you can estimate it, which we can try to do, 
or I guess that gets determined as additional reserve true up that occurs in the real time uh, as the mechanism. Because I don't, unless George clarifies otherwise, I don't see a solution that is dynamically determining the reserves as a function of the solution itself. Uh, yes, you're quite right, Mark. Uh, uh, currently, we do not have this feature in our market. This is George Angelovis, by the way, with the ISO. Uh, we do not um, dynamically determine the uh, requirements for uh, contingency reserves. Uh, however, uh, we have uh, articulated in the past that uh, the contingency reserve requirements are primarily driven by the most severe contingency, and we did um, clarify that uh, that most severe contingency could be the loss of an intertie. Uh, so uh, presumably if, uh, if there is uh, a lot of, uh, if there's a great uh, transfer that's going through an intertie and that the loss of that intertie qualifies as the most severe contingency for a BAA, uh, by NERC requirements, they are required to have a uh, contingency reserve to cover for the potential loss of that intertie. Actually, thanks for reminding me on something because it's the greater of the single largest contingency or I think especially people in reserve sharing groups are probably driven by the 3% gen, 3% um, load rule, which again is not a function of transfer, but in a way does become a function of your load and, and supply. To the extent you have additional supply, it's going to cover the transfer. So um, you, I think, again, I think it comes back to somewhat how you estimate it. And if there's any true up, you can true it up in the real time. Okay, looks like we don't have any questions online. Any more questions in the room? Oh, there we go. Jeff, up front, uh, we need a mic for Jeff. There we go. Good morning, Jeff Nelson, SC. Uh, you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to sort of explore that a little more with the reserves. Uh, like Doug said, it's sort of, you're firming up all these these transfers, you know, in shorthand. Uh, and Mark, you said that we won't really know the transfers until the market runs, right? So, so you can't know in advance you, what you are, and, and if you're supporting those transfers with gen, right, if you're turning on your own internal gen, then if it's a 3%, 3% or whatever that is, that transfer could change the reserve requirements, right? But, yes. But so that's going to be something that individual BAAs are going to have to just contemplate, right? Because the BAAs, you guys are not at this stage procuring ancillary services, contingency reserves for anyone but the ISS balancing authority. Yeah. Just confirming I, that. I, I, I agree with you. Yeah. I don't see it as too much different from today. If you you don't know when you run the day ahead market, what's going to clear the day ahead market in terms of your imports and exports, you only know after the solution. And then you must still comply with your operating reserve obligations as you go into real time. I see. I, I don't. I don't see it as really that much difference, other than yeah. how the transfer or the schedule got facilitated. The fact that you don't know that, you still don't know either way. Okay, that, that was getting to my core question. You said it's a true up going into real time. So, if I understand this whole conversation, just look from the ISO's perspective, you estimate what your contingency reserves are going to be bef before you run your market and you buy a hard target. Yeah. And market happens, and you know maybe you bought too much. And then you've got some extra to sort of sell back in real time in your market. And maybe you didn't buy enough, fine, you'll acquire a little. That's what you meant by true. For, for the market, for the market purchase, for the for a balancing area that's doing it themselves, they they would true it up themselves. Yeah. Right. So the other outside of your market, people are gonna have to guess what their reserves are, see what happens, and then before they get to real time, make sure they have enough reserves. Yep. Okay, I understood what you meant by chewing up. Thank yep. you. All right, looks like there's no more questions online and none in the room. Uh, Danny, remind me where we left off. Did we go on, uh, I think that we do 29? I think well, there's one slide left and I'm not sure if it's yours or mine. 
Yeah, well, the, yeah, this is my slide. <laughs> Thanks, Danny. But but I think we kind of touched on this throughout uh, the discussion today. And just again, conveying that concept of, of continued retained operational discretion and coordination as is the practice, industry practice today in these tight system conditions, particularly when it comes to exercising these, effectuating these priorities in that operational time frame. Um, and and as, as we've noted throughout the discussion, I think the BAs continue to retain that discretion, that communication with, with their adjoining balancing authority area that's depending upon that export transfer. Uh, and there's that discretion that if, if, uh, if the curtailment of the transfer is not going to put the BA2 who's receiving that transfer into a reliability condition or emergency condition, I think there's that discretion not to curtail that transfer. But to the extent that, um, uh, to the extent that, uh, curtailing that transfer uh, would put the receiving balancing authority area into a, an emergency condition or, or potentially a cascading reliability event, I think the expectation is at that point that that equal priority would be afforded to transfers uh, with load to the extent that BIA1 is in that position where they, they've gone through all the tools, the market has done everything they can, the individual BA has exercised all of their operational tools that they have at their disposal, uh, and they're still in that corner case scenario, then the expectation in that scenario is affording that transfer equal priority to load, as we've illustrated in, in one of the prior examples. So I think uh, that really concludes the, the slides that we have. Let me let's just, we have about 10 minutes. I want to see just if, if there are any more questions now on anything that we may have covered this morning, not just on, on the example too, but you know, even the, the first example or anything that you heard today on the confidence in transfers discussion, if there's any clarifications or anything that else that we can provide, any lingering issues or questions that, that you want to share or illustrate. And it doesn't look like there's anything online, uh, any questions online, but yeah. I, I guess as a follow-up to that, there was a lot of requests for um, having this more detailed discussion and understanding about the confidence and transfers and the, the operational orders of what happens. Um, I'm just seeking some feedback. Did this discussion today get at that request? Um, or is there still something like uh, Milo said, is there still something lingering out there that we didn't address? I do understand there's some complexities that we have to address between the disposition of passing or failing the sufficiency test that we have to take up and make those connections between the the discussion two weeks ago, which we have to do, but the mechanics of the the the, the prioritization and what happens and and all the tools did we did we address that next level of detail requested? Take silence to accept it. Hi, Mark. It's is it on? It's Brian Holmes with Utilicast. At least for me, I, I think I heard quite a few scenarios. I don't know if that question was really for me, but where there's a lot of nuance uh, in terms of, um, you know, a transfer, whether it's uh, which curtailment procedures would apply when there's a wheel through situation, whether those are all, all the wheeling through outs are, you know, subject to curtailment on BA action, equal priority. Um, we've got a scenario where there's RA to someone that's not part of this footprint. We've got Western power pool coordination procedures. Maybe not everybody's in the Western power pool. It feels to me as I'm trying to, you know, the passing failing, which you mentioned, as I'm trying to stack, you know, what would happen in each, each different case in my mind, I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, how this would be defined in penalty prices, how we would communicate this to operators, whether there's a difference between the transfers that are part of T bar, which you guys held out as different than T. Um, and I'm, if I had to try to stack it right now, I don't think I could. Um, and I'm just wondering if that's maybe the next level past this one. I appreciate that, appreciate the feedback, I guess. In order to do that, I, I guess um, we need some scenarios spelled out for us because some of those are things that are outside of the market right. 
capability, so I can't answer all the questions about what I agree. what WPP would do and the reserve sharing. I, I accept that they exist, and I accept that they will have mechanisms to do that. Right. The 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 I think we have some of them. I, I think we have done a fairly good job of trying to describe what the market would do and how it stops at a certain level, yep. and then what operator actions are. If you start get going into the next level of detail of every scenario that the operators see and all the discussions that they may have and every little um, branch that they could decision tree, um, I think that gets a, to be a little bit difficult, but I, I've tried to generalize the, the point. And that's why I left some of this to operator discretion because those those discussions between operator and operators are critical and they're they're the ones experiencing the actual situation on the ground and they sh they need to have some discretion i can't i can't i can't put together a scenario of every saying that this is what you do in every case yeah it, and um i agree that there are market and non-market concepts and some of these things aren't even new um right most of the scenarios that we're talking about here are I mean, this these scenarios are occurring in real time and you're talking about adding a day head component, but agreement on the order in which we would treat these, these transfers amongst all the operators and making sure that there is clarity, even if that's maybe not the ISO's responsibility per se, I think is something we're gonna eventually have to yeah, and get I think, to. And I think we tried to convey that. So, so. But appreciate that. And, and again, if there are some more scenarios that have details to them, we can try to consider those. Any last questions? Well, looks like Jeff. So uh, Jeff Nelson, SCE, uh, this sort of touched on the back to sort of the wheel through issues. Uh, and it's just sort of a, if there's a wheel through supplies coming in, coming out just through the market, my understanding is that that wheel through is never contemplated in the RSC. So if a balancing authority is just sitting there, the RSC is sort of run on basically its load and maybe sort of self-scheduled exports going to the RSC. So, so I just want to sort of confirm that when you do the RSC, these sort of market wheel throughs that might happen after the RSC, they're not even known, so they're not even considered in the RSC. To, yeah, you know, so we didn't, we didn't go into a discussion about the overlay of the wheel through um, priority um, initiative. And if you can get uh, that wheel through capability, you're afforded, and to me, that kind of overlays effectively getting bucket one transmission through the system. You're able to get that. You're able to get that priority. I think that that's one level. And then the other level is that if you have a wheel through, and and and, and then I start wondering, does a wheel through exist in the EDAM footprint? Uh, but for getting that priority, I have to think through that because I don't know what that lower priority wheel through looks like in a EDAM world. I have to think about what that looks like. But I think we would try to maintain that differentiation, but I don't. I just don't know what that lower priority wheel through looks like at the end. Okay, so there may be sort of, again, we're doing other moving pieces. There, there may be some wheel throughs and some exports that are known before the market runs and those go into the RSE test. Okay, fair enough. Right. It's the RSE's content. Then there can be just a bunch of stuff that happens in the market. It was just like never contemplated. And kind of, I don't really know how to articulate the question and how it goes into here, but if there's all these transfers and wheels and all these things that happen after the market runs but weren't part of the RSC, whose RSC do they wind up in? I mean, so they're in the, I think they're in the, well, I think they're in the pools going into real time uh, for the pool that, that stays together. So those sort of show up in the real time RSC tests. Yeah. Okay, so you can you can just imagine a whole bunch of extra bids way above and beyond what was needed in the RSC, and then the market just re-optimizes. Now there's a whole bunch of stuff that was not part of the RSC, and it's just sort of the question of 
you know, when does it ultimately show up in an RSE test now that the market said that they'll happen? And I think Doug, back to Doug Buccioni's comments, sort of whoever winds up coming up with the, uh, you know, the, the, those exports coming out of their balancing authority has to firm them, even if they weren't part of their RSE. Correct. Thank you. Okay, so I'll, I'll just keep noodling out this. Then you've got the other issue, does it, you know, wheel through it kind of exists, but for the sort of pre-scheduled wheel throughs yeah. or if it's or just a pool. Uh, but they might because not everyone's an EDAM. There's, there may still be that that wheel through feature for non-EDAM participants that we have today. Okay, so it's just that, yeah. just trying to put all these moving pieces. No, I, I, I see the, the challenge of all those moving pieces between day ahead RC and then real time pooled and then what happens in between and the market market transactions that may not have been um, part of the RSC, but clear they are. Yeah, I, I think I get it. Danny, do you get all that and, and you understand it and have all the answers? <laughs> well, yeah, no, I think I think that highlights why the pool is really important is all of those additional market results are kind of in, are incorporated in a pool in the WEIM. Yeah. I'll, I'll just- But maybe. I agree there, there's an interplay on the non EDMBA wheels. I'll just I'll maybe I'll, I'll close out the thought because I, it leaves it kind of in this unsettled state. But I, I do I do feel that that IFM, being that it, it, it it's co-optimizing and also building in that uncertainty, it's it's doing that. And what comes out of there is now a a, a supportable, feasible solution more than it is today in the IFM. So I I, I feel that that's the case, um, even though it 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 feel like it came out of that cloud of optimization. <laughs> All right, looks like there's no questions online and no more questions in the room. And I think next thing is lunch. Yeah, we're, we're going time to lunch. For those of you uh, able to do so, we're in the next room, same room as breakfast. Lunch will be provided. And uh, for those of you online, we will be back at 1 p.m. So thanks, everybody. We're going to take a lunch break. All right, I think we're ready to get started. So for those of you in the West Coast, in California, I know that's probably an early lunch for you. Here in Salt Lake, hopefully everyone enjoyed a lunch break. So um, let's go ahead and get started. And our next topic is greenhouse gas accounting and Anja Gilbert is gonna kick things off. So turn it over to you, Anja. Sure. So uh, I'm not Anya, but uh, <laughs> I just want to make some cup opening comments on the GHG matter. Um, I, I recognize uh, there is still interest uh, to continue to have the ISO consider alternatives to the resource specific. Um, I personally, I probably would have liked to have been uh, kind of settling into one versus the other, but I think I've always been of the mind that where we start, uh, we may evolve over time. So I think in that vein, I think maintaining um, and having discussions about what the remaining issues are and any, uh, including the regulatory challenges of alternatives to the resource specific, I think is a good discussion to continue to have and then I think you overlay that with the LA idea, which um, I think from our perspective is probably a hybrid um, of some something in between. We'd like to explore that one further as well. So I think at this point uh, and in the uh, revised straw proposal, you'll probably continue to see a discussion of um, all three. Uh, and again, we'll probably, you'll probably, Hear us leaning towards a, a what may be a starting point uh, for resource specific, but I think continuing having that open discussion and see where there is opportunities to consider the alternatives. And with that, I think uh, that's that's kind of the discussion we'll be having today. Great, thanks so much. Can folks hear me? Sounds like the audio is coming through. Um... So first, just let me start out by saying thank you to those folks that submitted comments. Um, we really appreciate the feedback, the comments, the questions that came in as a 
former CAISO stakeholder, I know the amount of work <laughs> and coordination that goes into creating those comments. So I just wanted to say thank you again. What I've done on this slide is organize some of the comments we received by theme um, as a means of guiding today's discussion. Um, so let me walk through some of that feedback as a means of orienting you to today's agenda for the resource specific proposal. We did hear from stakeholders that advocated for including transmission constraints as part of the RSC, kind of the benefits of creating a more accurate GHG counterfactual. We did hear from stakeholders concerns regarding the GHG resource specific optimizations attribution and transparency around that attribution. We also heard from stakeholders an interest in data reporting for both mandatory compliance purposes as well as clean energy program reporting. And then I'll categorize the bucket of feedback that we received in terms of an interest and clarification around a few of the design elements related to the GHG pseudo tie design, the geographic boundaries, whether the resource specific proposal complies with state regulations as well as the scalability and adaptability of the resource specific approach. We also received numerous requests for modeling or simplified examples to compare the zonal and resource specific approach. Tomorrow, uh, George will be providing an overview comparing all three proposals, the resource specific zonal and LEDWP's proposals. So I hope folks can attend that as well, but it won't be a part of today's discussion. So in regards to the questions around and requests to include transmission constraints in the RSC for a more accurate counterfactual, the EDAM RSC working group is working to evaluate the feasibility of doing so. Um, some of you may have attended the July 14th RSC working group um, and some of the design elements kind of included there discuss some of the timing of running uh, uh, RSC that includes transmission constraints um, in terms of running that ahead of the day ahead market. And we also talked about the geographic granularity on a BA by BA basis. I do want to clarify that today's discussion is simply on a GHG counterfactual and not related to transmission in the RSC for RSC purposes. Um, and in the GHG counterfactual discussion, we're not at a state anymore of if we'll consider transmission constraints in the RSC, but rather how we will include and to, to what um, level of accuracy is compared to a full market run, we'll include those transmission constraints. And our thinking has even evolved since putting together these slides. Um, I'll flag you know, the gold standard of creating that greenhouse gas counterfactual um, would be to do a full market run with import zeroed out, which assumes the BAA is serving its own obligation. So we're evaluating the feasibility of this approach, but also evaluating if there's areas that we can simplify. And just to give you some insight in terms of how we're thinking about this, some of the questions we're considering include, what's the appropriate consideration of network impedance, contingency, and flows in that counterfactual determination? And this matters um, in cases, you know, in summer, if you don't look at power flows from the Pacific Northwest to the desert south, or Pacific Northwest to the desert southwest, um, you may end up with a different counterfactual. Other considerations and, and thinking about how this might mirror the full uh, market run or not include a consideration of, you know, is a DC power flow with static loss factors is acceptable? And for the KISO BAA, what's the appropriate treatment of intertype bids in determining that KISO BAA counterfactual? Um, I recognize we've also got Danny and George on the line. Danny or George, did you want to add anything there? Um, hello, this is George Angelis. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh. Uh, just to uh, build up a little bit on, on what you said, Anya. Um, if we are to consider a sort of like a full market run to have the sole, with the sole purpose of calculating uh, greenhouse gas counterfactual, um, it uh, really matters what we want to put in that. Um, 
And if we make it as close as possible to the full market run that we'll have anyway for uh, IFM and the pass before it, the market power mitigation, uh, if it's a similar problem that we're going to solve, uh, perhaps adding uh, just a constraint on the greenhouse gas transfers uh, so that we have no imports into uh, the greenhouse gas regulation areas, so essentially you have no attributions, uh, then you, find, you will find an optimal solution that reflects how the uh, load is served optimally in the ADAM footprint without having any um, uh, situation where external resources are serving uh, load inside greenhouse gas regulation area. So if that is an acceptable uh, greenhouse gas uh, counterfactual, then this is a very similar problem to the one that we're going to be solving anyway in the market power mitigation. Uh, we just have this additional constraint. So that presents uh, the possibility for uh, efficiencies in terms of performance, which will uh, give us uh, the ability to potentially include it in the, in the market run. Of course, we cannot commit at this point. Uh, we have to evaluate um, internally and discuss with our vendor on how we can uh, perform this. But if this is uh, a direction that uh, will get us to the outcome that is desired, we'll uh, definitely are going to look into it. Thank you. Thanks, George. So we'll be further fleshing this out in the revised straw proposal and are interested in stakeholder feedback. I do want to emphasize this is for the resource specific proposal um, when it comes to creating that greenhouse gas counterfactual. Mary. Or could we get a mic to Mary? Thank you. This is Mary Wiki from the Public Generating Pool. I just have a clarification question, and I apologize that I have not been in the discussion in the RSE working group, so I may not completely understand um, this proposal. But does the does having the RSE with transmission constraints in it for the counterfactual make a difference in terms of then what qualifies as being attributed to California? In other words, does it create any kind of a transmission connection between what is attributed um, ultimately by CAISO to California demand? So Mary, this is uh, Danny. I can, I can try to help on the RSC. On the RSC part of this, we would simply be looking to see what gets credited as part of the supply stack that uh, would be usable by the market that's made available by each BAA. So I think the idea is uh, if you included this in the RFC, you would be making sure the capacity that was uh, that was shown wouldn't be bottled up due to uh, any internal constraints within a BAA. I think we're looking to try to bifurcate that from the GHGs. Uh, the whole construct of the RFC is it'll be run multiple times before the market, which uh, obviously involves some accuracy trade-offs to get the solution times acceptable to facilitate that. So. I think what Anya is getting at is, uh, and what George highlighted is, we do have the potential to have much more like a market run to establish that GHG counterfactual, but there are still some open questions about what this should look like. I think the first uh, bullet there highlights some of them. Uh, should a contingency, uh, are we running the full contingency deck for the entire footprint uh, in determining California ISO BAAs? Uh, GHG situation, like so, should contingencies and uh, or near our boundary ties be run as part of informing our optimal dispatch within California BAA that is ultimately used for the resource specific counterfactual? So that's, I think, the type of input we're looking for of what level of accuracy and what assumptions should we make in trying to determine a CAISO BAA counterfactual. Hope that helps, Anya. Sorry to interrupt. I, this is Mary again. I think that helps. I mean, essentially, this is restricting. The, this is a restriction in the counterfactual, but does not necessarily impact the manner in which the attribution is made. It doesn't impact the manner that we conduct attributions, and I'll discuss that shortly. Um, 
but it does impact kind of the accuracy of the counterfactual itself. Got it. Thank you. Do we have any questions in the room or it looks like Brenda might have something um, online? We do have Callie Wells. Let's go ahead and unmute her. Hi, this is Callie Wells with WPTF. Can you hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, well, first of all, I wanted to say thank you for teeing up this specific topic here in the GHG um, discussion. We we were ones that really wanted to continue talking about um, kind of the, the benefit of including transmission in the GHG counterfactual run. Um, so again, thank you guys for giving that some more thought. I had a couple clarifying questions on here. So one, um, on the geographic granularity, um, during the working groups, and I thought in the straw proposal, when it came to GHG, it was really, it was focused more on doing it in terms of GHG areas and non-GHG areas. Um, but here I see the geographic granularity as being run on a BA by BA basis, which are not necessarily the same. Um, and then George just noted in the counterfactual zeroing out the GHG transfer. So I was hoping you guys can help me kind of connect those two statements and back to kind of one of the objectives of doing GHG on those G GHG more state boundaries rather than BAA boundaries. Okay. Kelly, that's a great question. I'm gonna see if George has a, a response there just in terms of some of our internal thinking. Yes, thank you, Anya. This is George Engelings with the ASO. Um, so tomorrow's uh, presentation that will include examples and the methodologies will make clear uh, what we mean here with the geographic granularity, and I uh, will um, describe it here briefly. Um, essentially, you have uh, two planes where you have two different granularity um, uh, aspects. Uh, you have the regular plane that we are all used to, where we have BAAs and we have transfers between BAAs. I call this BAA transfers. And then we have a parallel plane, you can consider it on top of that, where we have now granularity at the level of greenhouse gas regulation areas. And you have greenhouse gas regulation areas and the, and the re remaining of the area, which is the uh, what, what, what I call greenhouse gas region zero, meaning there is no uh, greenhouse gas regulation in that area. And you have now, similarly to the BAA, to BAA transfers, you have now transfers from area zero into its greenhouse gas regulation area on that plane. And you solve those at the same time, you co-optimize everything. And um, that's what we mean with uh, geographic granularity. So you observe both BA to BAA transfers and the scheduling limits and the greenhouse gas uh, transfers that uh, they lead you to the greenhouse gas attributions to resources in the area zero. So the examples that we have, and we're gonna walk through um, slowly tomorrow, uh, they will show these, uh, these two features, how they work together. Thanks, George. Okay, that is really hel helpful, and I'll, I'll defer any more detailed questions um, for the discussion tomorrow. Um, and then the second, comment I want, I guess it's more of a comment than a question. So on the idea of using the market power mitigation run, um, that's an interesting thought and one that we had kind of toyed with a little bit. Have you guys, are you going to include more discussion on that tomorrow or is that going to be something that you guys elaborate a little bit more on in the, the next proposal? That'll be elaborated on in the next proposal. Unless George, are you planning on discussing that at all tomorrow? Uh, we still need to put our heads around this, uh, Kelly, and uh, no, no need to discuss it tomorrow. I can say a few things today at this point, uh, since uh, you know you brought it up, and I did kind of earlier. Um, so, assuming that the problem we want to solve for determining the greenhouse gas uh, counterfactual uh, is very similar to the problem we've been solving in the market with the exception of that single constraint on the greenhouse gas transfers, essentially allowing every other transfer 
to optimally be determined, but with that constraint on the greenhouse gas transfer to be uh, uh, zero in the import direction into uh, greenhouse gas circulation areas, then the problem, that particular problem, is very similar to what we'll be solving in the MPM anyway. So potentially we could start the MPM pass, and I'm thinking aloud here, um, have that constraint on the greenhouse gas transfers. We'll take probably two and eight iterations to get uh, a reasonable solution converged at that, extract the greenhouse gas reference from the solution, remove the constraint on the greenhouse gas transfers now, and continue with the MPM solution to probably another two uh, iterations to have the, the MPM solution. Uh, this will save us with all the input output of having a really a, a dedicated market pass for the greenhouse gas transfer, which will be you know, very taxing on performance. So it, it makes the, the whole um, ability of having a greenhouse gas reference calculation with the full market solution uh, potentially feasible. We'll have to work out all the details and, and see how we can uh, perform this. But that's, that's the idea that I have in my mind at this point. Okay, that's really interesting, and we'll look forward to, to more discussion on that in the proposal, the next iteration. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Brenda, it looks like we've got another comment online. Yes, Tang Wu from WAPA. Your lines are muted. Hi, this is Tang Wu from WAPA. Uh, I think the RSE problem and the GSG problem are fundamentally two different problems. Uh, RSE is a reliability. It's a power flow problem and a power resource problem. Uh, GHG is really an accounting problem. Uh, for states that has fee-based uh, GHG uh, programs, um, so uh, it's really a you know, question, who wants to pay the fee? And to join that, uh, to join that program. Now, for all the resources in California, all the resources will have to show allowances. For resources outside of California, they have a choice, and they have to be given a choice. And so for those who have choices and who decide to participate in California uh, market uh, or uh, to meet California load, and they can submit uh, an adder in their bid. So can we set up a uh, kind of a market separation constraint or balancing constraint, not from power uh, point of view, but from GHG point of view. So all the resources who have the bidder, bid adder uh, would be subject to that constraint. So then you will not have any leakage because you know from accounting point of view, you don't have this. Uh, but there is no guarantee that those resources that have a bid adder would uh, deliver their electrons to California. You know, there's no way you can guarantee that, regardless of GHG or not. It's a, a purely accounting. So, so it, that's kind of I'm just laying out the kind of background or the foundation of this discussion. Uh, uh, I wonder if uh, you know you can just add a, a market separation country. Another power balancing constraint just for the GHG participant. So then naturally you would have a hurdle rate because you have a market separation, you have two different uh, regions basically. And then you don't have to do any counterfactual. You know, I don't know whether this is gonna work, but I just wanna throw out this idea so that you know, uh, I don't know somebody can comment on it. Yeah, Tom, I can I can tell you that that is uh, that is how it's working today in AIM. Essentially, the resources that they have uh, greenhouse gas bids are considered uh, as part of the greenhouse gas transfer. To, of course, in AIM we don't have the concept of the greenhouse gas transfer. We're using uh, BAA to BAA transfers to synthesize what goes into California. Uh, but uh, the concept is the same with what you're describing. Essentially, you do have a constraint that says that whatever is uh, net import into California is composed 
of the greenhouse gas attributions to resources that they have greenhouse gas beds. So it looks like what you described as a market separation constraint. I wouldn't call it like that, of course, but it has that property that these resources, they have, uh, and the attributions, they're like uh, on a separate plane serving um, load in California through the greenhouse gas transfer. So that's, this concept is, is, is in place in the IM and it's part of the uh, proposal here for the resource specific approach for EDAM as well. I, I thought, George, the current proposal is that whoever submitted that bid adder is deemed as providing energy to California. There is no explicit constraint, uh, it's deemed. So, so maybe I misunderstood. Oh, the, you do have an explicit constraint. Yeah, yeah, that is a constraint. Uh, basically, just by the fact that you have a greenhouse gas bid, that doesn't mean that you get an attribution. Uh, yeah, and we'll we'll get to that in the next few slides. All right. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. And it looks like there's another comment online. We do have Mark Coleman from PowerX. Sure, go ahead, Mark. Hi, good afternoon, Mark Holman with PowerX. Um, just a couple thoughts and I'll, I'll save our other comments once we um, go through the numeric examples uh, for tomorrow. Um, but one of them is just, this is obviously a complex topic and uh, something that's been discussed for quite some time. I think the naming convention of the two proposals is a little confusing. We're calling the one, the, the deeming approach resource specific and the other one zonal. And it almost suggests on the surface that the first one's more accurate because it's resource specific and the second one's just at a zonal level. The zonal approach has both a resource specific or specified source component and an unspecified source. So it has specified source that we think is much more accurate and unspecified source. You know, I think it would be a lot more accurate to describe it as the deeming approach versus the zonal approach because both have resource specific or, or specified source components to them, just to, again, to um, avoid confusion. I, I think the second one that would just be helpful to touch on as we go through this, when we talk about a GHG counterfactual for an EDAM, or when we talk about base schedules for an EIM, I think all of the proposals we've seen to date under the deeming framework bucket still allow resources in the counterfactual, resource output in the counterfactual, and base schedules in the EIM, the output associated with base schedules, to get deemed delivered to California or you know, could be Washington in the future. And I think it's just really important to make that clear because we see very broad and pervasive problems with anything that effectively will automate resource shuffling and deem delivered base scheduled supply that is clearly either in the counterfactual or base scheduled in the EIM to serve load somewhere else and deem it to go to the GHG zone and then dispatch something else and not deem it. And so I just think it's really important to highlight. And I know your proposal has been shifting. I, you know, we see that the slides are different than the proposal. And I know this is a complex topic, but I just think that's a really important point to be clear with stakeholders about because we have not yet seen a proposal that under the deeming framework prevents this deeming of base scheduled or counterfactual supply. Thanks for your comments, Mark. Brenda, are there any more? Okay, great. So, we touched on this um, with some of the participant comments um, that came in so far today, but also in the comments that came in in response to the straw proposal. Um, there were some comments that warranted maybe some more background on the optimization and the attribution process. So I'd like to provide some of that background here. Um, just a reminder, crisis market is least cost security constrained optimization. Um, and as the gentleman from, from WAPO is outlining, the, the cost of compliance for greenhouse gas regulation is really reflected through an adder submitted by participating resources, which is dependent on where they're located um, and where they are electing to, to offer into. So to offer energy outside of a greenhouse gas regulation area, the optimization is only going to consider 
a resources energy bid. This is because this area is not subject to any sort of greenhouse gas regulation in their area. To serve energy inside a greenhouse gas regulation area coming from outside that area, the optimization would consider the resources energy bid and the greenhouse gas bid adder. Um, and lastly, to serve energy inside a greenhouse gas regulation area coming from within that greenhouse gas regulation area, the optimization considers the energy bids, which already include the cost of greenhouse gas compliance. Oops. And then that leads to the attribution process. So the optimization um, is, is pretty straightforward in terms of it takes the total imports for a greenhouse gas regulation area and then attributes resources lowest to highest. That marginal resource that satisfi satisfies the total imports for that GHG regulation area sets that greenhouse gas price. But this does result in the market attributing transfers to resources based on their composite energy bid and greenhouse gas bid adder, which can result in higher emitting resources that are more expensive to backfill um, and this attribution to serve load and other BAAs. We've referred to this and others as secondary dispatch. And some states have taken the approach of calculating that secondary dispatch in order to allow them to take responsibility for their atmospheric impact um, over time. I thought it also might help to provide a history of some of CAISO's efforts over time to limit secondary dispatch, and also as a means to flag markets do evolve. <laughs> this greenhouse gas design in the EDM will also continue to evolve. Um, and I'll focus here on the GHG bid quantity column and the other column. At EDM Go Live, and also with the one-year enhancements, the attribution was limited to a range between zero to the Pmax of the resource. In 2018, we made some updates in the WEAM to limit attribution so that it was between zero and the difference between the upper economic limit and base schedule. With EDAM, in light of there not being a base schedule anymore, and instead we're using the RSE as that GHG counterfactual, we're limiting attribution between zero and the difference between the upper economic limit and the RSE solution. In addition, in light of some of the stakeholder feedback and concerns that we've heard, we're also including some constraints to limit that attribution in cases when attribution exceeds the export capability of that BAA, or if that BAA is a net importer. And to illustrate kind of the impact of this, we can't do it for EDAM, EDAM isn't live, we don't have the resource bids, but if we take those constraints and imagine and apply them to the WEAM data set, what we've been able to determine is the level of reduction if the WEAM had those same net export constraints. And so what I'm showing here is three flavors of WEAM attribution that occur today. GHG attribution takes on three flavors. One, when there are exports below transfer limits. Second, when there are exports above those transfer limits. And third, when that BA is a net importer. Under EDAM, what we're proposing is that the area highlighted in this graph as purple, so exports above the transfer limits, and in green, when that BA is a net importer, those would no longer be attributions. And so what you see on the bottom of the slide, on the left-hand side, is the percentage reduction in GHG attribution. This is over the time period of January through late April of this year, and in the revised draw proposal, we plan to extend this data set. But what this shows is that on a percentage basis, it varies by day, but varies between a 20 to 80% reduction in attributions. Um, on the right-hand side, you're seeing kind of the, the volumetric look at those um, attributions that occur today. Um, and I'll flag that limiting these greenhouse gas attributions both reduces the potential for secondary dispatch, but also limits transfers. 
Any comments or questions? Go ahead. Uh, Jeff Nelson, SCE. Just, uh, I'm having, I love the look of this graph, but I don't understand it. Uh, can, can you go sure. a little slow-mo on this? Sure. What does it mean to export above transfer limits? How do you export greater than a limit? So let's start there. And maybe it's the attribution is counted above what transfer limits would allow for. So if transfer port limits from a transmission perspective is 100 megawatts, Today, the CAISO would still attribute resources if, say, transfers were GHG attribution was 120. We would still attribute 120, even though physical transfer limits were only 100 megawatts. So okay, flagging so that there's a difference between the physical realities that occur today and the GHG attribution, and we're looking to better align the two. Okay, so uh, let's explore that a little bit. Sure. Again, I like the graphs. Uh, so are we, in your hypothetical, only 100 can flow, but we're attributing 120. Are we paying 120 megawatts of generation from Portland in your hypothetical? The no. G, the marginal GHG adder today? There is that GHG attribution that's occurring um, in terms of which resources are attributed, but in terms of power flow, that incremental 20 megawatts is not physically flowing. I guess I'm getting at, are, are, are we handing people money today unnecessarily because they don't have an obligation to retire allowances? James, did you uh, want to take- Jeff, maybe I'll, maybe I'll be able to, to help with this. Um, so the, the export is, is, is actual megawatts being exported from the BAA, right? Uh, but the attributions, as previous discussion that uh, uh, Tong Wu uh, was, uh, was bringing up here, the attribution is an accounting uh, exercise. So although you could have a BAA uh, exporting 100 megawatts, uh, you could have uh, resources in that BAA collectively get uh, greenhouse gas attributions of 120 megawatts uh, because of the accounting. Essentially, we're accounting 120 megawatts uh, of uh, uh, generation from that BAA serving California load, let's say, and 20 megawatt uh, is backfilling from outside the BAA. So you still have a net 100 megawatt export. So the accounting uh, for the greenhouse gas attributions uh, allows this, this outcome. Uh, but we realize that this outcome uh, probably aggravates uh, the backfilling and the secondary dispatch. So if we insert a constraint in the um, uh, distribution of the greenhouse gas transfer to uh, greenhouse gas attributions that says, we don't want to attribute in a BAA more than what the BA actually exports, then in this scenario, in this example, we will only attribute 100 megawatts of internal generation to that BAA, not 120. It will be limited to 100. Uh, today, uh, there is no such constraint, so we could potentially attribute 120. And yes, there will be a payment for 120 megawatts at the marginal greenhouse gas uh, price. Uh, is that... Um, um, explanation uh, uh, fulfilling for you? Yeah, I, I had, I'm sorry, George, your connection is pretty good, but I still had a little trouble hearing everything you were saying. Uh, but so just so I, I think- I don't, I, Well, to answer your question straightforwardly, yeah. I, 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 don't, I don't think we are paying someone that doesn't have an obligation. obligation. Okay, yeah. I, don't, I don't think that's created. I think the issue is, <laughs> I think the issue is, well, this reflects is a change in that you're not allowing anybody who is not net exporting to support transfers to the GHG area. So I think you are getting a, a reduction of attrib attributable megawatts, but you're also effectuating a, a change in what is available for uh, GHG transfer itself. So this is quantifying that that change. If you don't let a net exporting entity be attributed, you're, you're changing what is 
available for transfer to the GHG area. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of rephrase it. What I think I heard today, the hypothetical there may be 120 attributed that really has a reporting obligation and they it really does. get paid for it. Yes. Under this new approach, that that the amount coming to California may be reduced to 100, and it still has an obligation and it's yes. still being attributed. So Correct. that that's sort of the Correct. The that's my understanding. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for clarifying that. And let's see, did I have any other questions on this call? And that payment results in that compliance obligation. Right. And and why, so I get that one sort of decreasing a lot. Uh, why are all the, why are the other colors decreasing? Sorry, could you rephrase that? Yeah, sorry. Uh, so we've got three colors, right? Exporting below the transfer limits, exporting above and impacting. So am I reading the green one, right? Importing. Importing. Uh, so I understood the discussion we just had, and I guess the the exporting is just you've got a new constraint that says only net exporters uh, have any attribution whatsoever. Is that, only that, when net export, only when exports, or in cases when exports exceed transfer limits, we wouldn't attribute yeah. above those transfer limits. I think it's the green area that's the largest that would be removed in the future. That occurs when a BA is a net importer, net importer. and we're Got doing it. that attribution today. We would no longer do so in the future, recognizing it's a net importer. Okay, okay, thank you. That clarifies yeah. the net word does. Okay, thank you. Okay. Stuart. Stuart Kelly, Ali. <clears throat> Just on the, the baseline um, from the RSE test and the improvements regarding transmission getting included, plus the net export constraint, LA welcomes these improvements. Um, uh, I would pick up on though there is the potential for still instances whereby as part of the deeming, a renewable resource gets deemed, it doesn't have a GHG obligation um, and potentially gets incorrectly deemed still, albeit it's substantially limited with these improvements and, and in turn gets an incorrect payment. I'm interpreting that as a comment. Yeah. <laughs> I'm confused. If you're deeming the renewable resource and you've deemed it incorrectly, in turn, it will get the marginal cost for GHG. It will get that GHG payment when it shouldn't have got that payment. So in effect, you're paying the wrong resource. I think that's a different question than I think Jeff asked. You're asking, is that clean resource due a GHG premium, which it is due a GHG premium, its compliance obligation is zero because it's a clean resource, not because it got misappropriately mis deemed. Yeah, it's it would only be deemed if it has submitted that GHG bid adder because when our attribution process we go from kind of lowest to highest, but based on a submitted energy in GHG bid. But as part of that, uh, help me. Stuart, maybe I can, I can, I can answer this. Uh, uh, it's not an incorrect attribution. As I mentioned earlier, uh, it's an accounting uh, a, a element. Uh, you are considering in the example that you can have 120 megawatts of internal uh, generation to be getting an attribution, 20 megawatts is backfilled by generation from outside the BAA, you still have a net 100 megawatt export, right? So it's not that they're incorrectly attributed. Uh, however, we do recognize the fact that there, this uh, increases the amount of backfilling and therefore uh, it presents potentially a solution with a higher secondary dispatch, right? So that's what we're trying to to reduce, uh, I wouldn't say it's an incorrect uh, attribution. Uh, there's nothing incorrect, right? You're still doing an optimal uh, attribution of the greenhouse gas transfer to resources based on the greenhouse gas bids. Okay. Yeah, in in terms of the transfer, I accept all that. I just th thought think there's a more general point where there is this incorrect deeming that could lead to a missed payment to the wrong generator. But I need to I need to think about it more, obviously. Okay, feel free to follow up on, on those thoughts. 
Um, looks like we've got some more feedback um, remotely. Go ahead, Brenda. Hey, Anya, before we move, I just want to answer something to Stuart. Stuart, the, one of the things is if you don't attribute it back to that generator, that, that wind resource, its LMP reflects the negative marginal greenhouse gas price. So it's actually getting paid less than its bid. When you put the greenhouse gas attribution to it and you pay it back, it's not getting a premium. It's taking it back to the marginal energy price, and therefore it is being made whole. We'll go ahead and take Mark Holman from PowerX call. Hi there, thank you. Can you go back to your uh, chart that you showed? I just had a question about that first. Sure, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, when you did this analysis, did you just look at the resources that were deemed that would no longer be eligible to be deemed and take those out? Or did you actually rerun the optimization to see how the optimization would now deem different resources? No, this was looking at total attributions that occurred and examining when that attribution occurred, um, when export limits were exceeded, when that BA was a net importer, and when exports uh, were below transfer limits. So it was, it was not a rerun. Okay, that's, that's really helpful because I think at the heart of the issue with the deeming algorithm or the algorithm that, that deems is there is no link that requires that the resource that is deemed actually increases its production above the GHG counterfactual or in the EIM above the base schedule. And again, still trying to understand your, your latest revised proposal. So maybe a question is best. If a BA had one megawatt of export in the counterfactual and it was a hydro BA, could the software then see that the least cost solution might be to enable an import to California to dispatch a thermal resource, coal or gas in another BA, but attribute it, let's say 500 megawatts to the BA with one megawatt of export and deem its base schedules or its counterfactual schedules as the source of that import when it's actually increasing the production of thermal resources. Because I think that's the heart of the issue with the algorithm is that there is no link between the resource that actually increases its production and what can be deemed delivered as the source. Brenda? We do have a question from Kathleen Colbert from Vista. Your lines are muted. Hi, this is Kathleen Colbert from Vistra. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, in the spirit of struggling through, I'm I'm also struggling through so a couple of questions. Um, I really appreciate all this, Anya, by the way, uh, and George for walking through this stuff. So I wanted to, and, and for the sake of, I guess, this question, um, add a slightly different, more a, a new perspective to what we've been talking about from an internal generator inside of the greenhouse gas area, rather than kind of, I know we've been focusing a lot on those outside, but when I think about, and I, I, did, I like your charts too, but um, when I think about that chart and what's happening, in the current software today and what we're discussing as potential enhancements. I think I think of it more similarly to what I think Mark was getting at, but I'm gonna frame it in the way that my, my view on it. So the way that I think of it is that if the deeming allows clean, let's say the, the cleaner resources are gonna look more economic. So in the least cost solution, they would be deemed sooner rather than resources that are have a higher GHG adder on top of their energy costs, all things held equal with the energy, just to assume the efficiency is in the same merit order as their economic offers, to make it simple. So in that scenario, 
yeah, imports. The- it's going to serve kind of at least cost based on energy price and GHG. Go ahead, Kathleen. Yeah, no, thank you. Perfect. So with that assumption, so the way that I understand the current functionality and the concern that we have about kind of moving forward with that into EDAM, and I see this as an improvement, so I'm trying to unpack it and make confirm that, okay? Uh, just the context. So the way that I understand it is that the market would economically dispatch resources outside of the greenhouse gas area. I mean, you might be cutting out a bit. I, could you repeat that? I just heard the market. I may need to reconnect. Let me reconnect via phone and then I'll raise my hand again. Okay, sounds Thanks. good. We're going to go ahead and try a phone call that's in line. I'm ending in 9-5. Let's go try that. Hi, this is Callie Wells with WPTF. Can you hear me okay? Can you guys hear me okay? I'm having really bad audio issues on my end. Yep, Callie, you're coming in through clear. Oh, perfect. I had to disconnect and call in, so sorry about that. Um, so I had, I really appreciate you guys doing this analysis and kind of showing the potential impact this improvement would have over the current deeming. I was curious, I know during the, the workshops, uh, WPTF also put forward, you know, some other improvements. Um, did you guys happen to take a look at what impact that those changes might have had? Um, so we can kind of do a cost benefit analysis on, on all the improvements that are on the table. So let me play that back to you. I think I heard that as, can we do a cost best benefit analysis of all of the enhancements we're making um, for in, in the resource specific proposal as compared to today? Was, was that your suggestion, Callie? Um, my question was whether or not, I appreciate you guys doing that, um, kind of looking at the impact this improvement would have on the resource specific approach. I was curious if you guys also did some sort of assessment on what the impact, um, the limited deeming enhancement we had put forward as con- to consider would also have. So we can really compare everything and do do kind of the appropriate trade-off. Can, I'm sorry, can you, can you ref- help me understand what enhancement you're referring to? Yeah, so during the workshops, one thing that, uh, that we included in our presentation um, to consider is to limit the deeming. I think this gets at um, some of the previous comments. To limit the deeming to only incremental dispatch above the counterfactual. Okay, and today we look at limiting the deeming between zero and the difference between the upper economic limit and that counterfactual. And are you looking for, okay. So in our, in during the working groups at the beginning of the year, um, it's been a while, but a couple months ago, we put forth kind of looking at whether or not you could limit it to, to um, only deem a resource for the amount that it was dispatched above the counterfactual, which would address the secondary dispatch. Yeah, we can take that back and think about that further, just in terms of looking at what that counterfactual or impact could be, so. Oh, okay, yeah, no, I would appreciate that, thank you. Thanks, Kelly. And Brenda, it sounds like there's another question. I am gonna have to maybe cut it off after this question just to get through the material, but um, go ahead, Brenda. Of course, um, our last raise hand we'll take today, Reno Bertar. Let's go online as I'm unmuted. Hello, this is Peter from SGM. Uh, this discussion about counterfactual is pretty much identical to what was tried about five years ago with two two pass solution. The current RSC is not exactly the same because each individual BA is, is calculated separately for counterfactual. But if Kaiso moves to kind of the whole footprint with transfer to, to GG zones, that was zero. This is exactly what was tried a couple of years ago. And there were major concerns with that approach that caused Kaiso to uh, disregard that approach. So if you are coming back to the same approach, we have to address the same concerns that were there before, and I believe they are there today. One fundamental concern is that setup for counterfactual 
is not looking outside of GDG zone in a proper way. And I believe one proposal was to use GDG bid adder or all emitting resources outside of GDG zone just for right calculation counterfactual. And I think that's still more accurate to address this issue about exporting about transfer limits because if there is resource shuffling that is approved and correct, it's okay to calculate that in, in deeming to GG zones. That was the one, one concern. The other concern was that if we are deeming and paying resources outside of uh, GG zones, then those resources are encouraged not to be dispatching counterfactual and increase their prices. So in the second run, they would then be deemed higher. And that pretty much can be addressed with uh, the proposal that LA has, where you are not paying resources, you are giving uh, the GAG uh, revenue pretty much to the market operator to load. If you continue paying resources and you have this similar to two-step process or current BA-based RSC, you have the same problem, the same concern. And I'll flag kind of the two past solutions predates my time at the CAI, so I'm not sure if anyone, um, George, if you wanted to respond to that. Hello, this is George Engler. This can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, so what Peter was saying, um, we did perform some. Uh, pretty exhaustive tests and experiments uh, early on to uh, find out how uh, we can get a reasonable solution with a reasonable attribution and reference. And um, we did experiment with a two-pass solution and we did encounter these problems that uh, Peter mentioned. We also uh, experimented with the um, uh, proposal that uh, Kali was uh, referring to it's um, I would uh, I would call it uh, dynamic uh, uh, limiting of the attribution to the portion of the dispatch above the base schedule. In, in our case, that would be the, the reference. Um, and we did also find with that approach uh, some I would say insurmountable problems from a market solution perspective because we had. Um, and consistent pricing of resources. And we found out that this solution is suboptimal for external resources serving external load. Uh, so we didn't consider it as uh, a potential uh, good solution for uh, the, the, the greenhouse gas attribution methodology. Um, so we didn't commit to reevaluate uh, this. I think we. We did perform an exhaustive evaluation of all these options in the past. Uh, I don't see uh, the value of redoing all this work. I don't think anything has changed. George, I'm, George sorry, sorry for interruption, but earlier on you said that you are considering improvements for RSC instead of doing BA for BA to do it the whole footprint with transfer to GAG zone set to zero. And this is exactly what was done in two-step approach. Or I misunderstood you what oh. you said earlier. Oh, we um, well, Peter, we have moved off from the RSC. We we're at the point now where we want to bifurcate, as Danny mentioned earlier, the RSC from the exercise to find the greenhouse gas uh, reference. So this will be different processes because they really have different objectives, and we didn't want to introduce transmission constraints into the RSC and lose all the progress that we have achieved in the RSC being a simple optimization approach that we can do on demand. We didn't see the value of including transmission constraints in the RSC, but we do see the value of including transmission constraints in the greenhouse gas reference calculation. And that's why we're discussing this separately from the RSC as a potential. So, so how, how do you calculate in, in your idea, how do you calculate counterfactual? Um, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, maybe you were not on. Um, no, I was on. The, I was listening. The, okay, well, then I'll repeat. Um, 
we start the market power mitigation pass, okay? And yeah. we're solving essentially the same problem. We're just introducing a constraint that limits the greenhouse gas transfers into greenhouse gas regulation areas so that you don't have any import into the greenhouse gas regulation areas. So obviously without import, you don't have greenhouse gas attributions. So you solve that problem and the solution of this problem will give you uh, a very uh, good, in my opinion, uh, greenhouse gas reference that tells you how all external resources are serving load externally without serving load in the greenhouse gas regulation area. So that's, that's, that's what I call the primary dispatch. That's so in that, in that, in that optimal gas. solution, George, in that optimal solution, you are limiting only GG transfers into GG zones, but you're not limiting, uh, let's say, non emitting resources transfers to GG zones. No, I'm limiting non emitting resources to GHG zones because we want to see how these are going to be deployed to serve external load to get the primary dispatch. Because otherwise, I, I, do, I, mean, I, I, the main I understood you correctly, and I don't think that's different than what we had in two step solution, but we'll see details later. Thanks. Okay, but, but this proposal will do it in one step better. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, I did want to provide a note about the transparency and the data that we provide today to scheduling coordinators when it comes to attribution. Um, today, through settlement statements and CMRI, the customer market results interface, we provide that attribution level information. Um, and with kind of the evolution from self-submitted WEIM base schedules to using the RSE as the counterfactual, we anticipate being able to make that available to EDAM entities as well. Um, an area we'd like feedback on, particularly in the revised straw proposal, is you know what data would be helpful to promote transparency and over what period of time. I'd like to move on next to uh, reporting. Um, there are numerous questions about uh, data being reported for compliance purposes, for mandatory reporting programs, as well as for um, to support clean energy programs and states. So starting from the compliance perspective, um, I thought it'd be helpful to outline what's reported um, today and in the future for those compliance programs to states and to market participants. Today, Kaiser reports megawatt hours of greenhouse gas attribution to CARB, both at the total level and by the WEIM entity level. Um, for validation purposes through OATI, CARB collects total megawatt hours of tagged imports. So those imports that are operating outside the EIM, um, which is used for their own validation processes for their MRR. Um, we are willing to provide total WEIM and ED EDAM transfer to states with GHG pricing programs. Um, for market participant reported data, currently WEIM market participants receive their attribution information through settlement statements and through CMRI. And similarly in EDAM, we'll provide those settlement statements that include GHG attribution of day ahead in real time, um, as well as through CMRI. From a voluntary or more of to support clean energy program reporting, you know, we're observing three kind of flavors of clean energy programs throughout the West, RPS and, and REC compliance, um, programs that are GHG percentage reduction programs, and third, GHG absolute reduction programs. Um, so maybe starting with RPS and, and REC compliance, um, another observation is many states outside of California do require um, deliverability to the service territory of the purchasing utility to take credit for that rec. Um, and I do want to emphasize, and we've brought up this point in the past, that Kaiso's market does not take a claim on that rec. And today, for reporting purposes, Kaiso does provide meter data to Regis for renewable resources. This is only in the case when Kaiso is the qualified reporting entity but that being said, we're the QRE in 99% of cases for those renewable resources. I also want to highlight that if Regis moves to all generation tracking, um, Kaiso could support data sharing from, a, from an all generation tracking perspective as well. 
And this is an area that's been brought up by stakeholders in terms of area of interest um, of reporting. Um, in light of some of the concerns raised about REC um, reporting and REC issues um, in the market, maybe as a long-term recommendation, a suggestion is that buyers and sellers update applicable contracts to unbundle RECs from energy deliveries to the service territories. Um, and that would allow for market participation and also allow for that utility to still take credit for the REC. This has been kind of the story of resources in California um, after the launch of MRTU um, and, and could serve as, as, as an approach. The other two flavors of, of greenhouse gas uh, reporting we're seeing at, at for certain states or those programs, greenhouse gas percentage reduction programs um, in which states require utilities for, to reduce their portfolio average of greenhouse gas emissions by a certain, by a certain percentage by a certain date um, as compared with the base year. And then also greenhouse gas absolute reduction programs, which require the annual average emissions to be at or below an absolute value, which may or may not decline over time. And this is an area where to support these type of programs that are not GHG pricing programs, CAISO could support um, by providing emissions intensity information to states for their in-state generation and then also provide the megawatts of BA level transfers. Um, and this would allow states to apply their own unspecified emissions factor to determine kind of the emissions intensity associated with the transfers um, into, into their area. Um, this is another area of feedback where um, in the revised draft proposal, we'd like to understand if this type of reporting is helpful. Um, I'm also interested in what specific data over what time frame and why uh, folks would, would like certain data um, to see if and how we can support those programs. Go ahead, Mary. Thank you. This is Mary Winky from the Public Generating Pool. And I just have a couple of comments and, and reactions to this. I appreciate you outlining the diff different types of clean energy programs and, and broadly agree with the buckets that you have here. I do think that the comment about revising contracts to unbundled RECs is an important one, but also just want to note that many state programs do have um, significant limits on the quantity of unbundled RECs that can be used for compliance. So as a long-term solution, it would likely also require changes to those state policies. That is my understanding, at least for many of the Eastern markets, that's the direction that they went, essentially completely unbundling um, attributes from markets and, and energy transactions. So I, I do think that is a, is a still a worthwhile conversation, even though I think it would require changes to state policies. Um, but I do think there would be immediate and kind of an immediate barrier to that solution. Um, and then the other thing that I just wanted to comment on here is that the, the data that you provided or are suggesting to provide, I think would be helpful. And, but, but I do think that this conversation is not solvable just with more data. So I, I, think, I, think, I do think there's a broader conversation to be had in the West on this topic where CAISO and potentially other market operators are important. Um, stakeholders in that conversation, but I'm not sure that this is something that the market can completely solve. Okay. Thank you. And it, it looks like Claire also has a comment up front. Thank you. Um, and thank you for thinking about the, the data and transparency issues. Um, on this slide here, and I don't object to anything you've suggested in terms of potential data improvements, but I think you're missing some stuff. And in thinking about this, you know, you, you've appropriately laid out that there are different flavors of regulatory programs. And I think we're going to have different flavors of regulatory programs for quite some time. And I, and I don't think you need to worry about um, 
massaging or uh, presenting data necessarily in a way that meets this program and putting data in another way to meet that program. I think instead you should err on the side of putting out as much data as possible and then allowing the states to determine how that's best used in their program. And so for instance, uh, you mentioned the unspecified emission factor. I'd love to see you guys play, report better data, both on average emission factors for the entire footprint, as well as average emission factors for what's deemed, and then marginal emission factors um, for across time for both the entire footprint and what's deemed, as well as potentially residual emission factors. So what's the, what's the emission factor look like after we've deemed everything to the greenhouse gas zones? And then if you pu publish that sort of information, states have information, for instance, to, to decide, oh, do we need to think about revising our default emission factor? Or what does this tell us about how the markets are affecting our utilities ability to comply with the, the emission performance standard in the states? So rather than design your data meet state programs, I would think more in terms of just generally improving the transparency and, and amount of information that you present on greenhouse gas emissions. No, I, I appreciate that comment. And I'm particularly interested in your comment about what data um, might be missing. Um, on the subject of reporting emissions intensity, some of that information, you know, when is when it when we have the emissions factor that allows us to to provide that information, but we only have that um, it's, it's not a required field today. And so it's not always information we have access to, particularly for non-GHG regulation areas. So there's, there's also an issue of what, what data is available on our end to produce those numbers. But I appreciate that comment. Brenda, are there any comments? On? Okay, great, go ahead. We can take Kathleen's question. Hi, this is Kathleen Colbert from District. Can you hear me now, Anya? Yes. Okay, good. So sorry about that. I was having some technical difficulties. Um, and I appreciate that you recapping the reporting. My question is not directly related to reporting, so I appreciate the opportunity to ask it. Although I think that there's a flavor of the fact that there are different regulatory programs is most definitely a concern and a consideration that is underlying my question so and perhaps this is something that you can help provide more clarity on but look my understanding of what this greenhouse gas constraint and this is an improvement to it but the greenhouse gas constraint in the market one of the impacts that it can result in is that it it it, it because resources that are lower costs with their energy plus or greenhouse gas adder are being considered deemable up to that constraint to set the greenhouse gas shadow price. The greenhouse gas shadow price itself is effectively undervaluing what we would believe the greenhouse gas shadow price should be valuing once you factor in that it's really only incremental dispatches relative to this baseline counterfactual we're talking about that are contributing to the unspecified rate that you would kind of consider as the greenhouse gas shadow price should be valuing is what is the carbon composition? What is that marginal cost of greenhouse gas cost of the, of the net import that is coming into that greenhouse gas area? And so like our concern is that if it's shadow price is undervaluing because it's deeming from bottom up, which can dip into the, by the upper economic limit minus the counterfactual can actually be megawatts, not dispatch, right? There is a, a chance that we're dipping into megawatts that are serving that internal load. And so some of it, and so this can have a price suppressive impact on the greenhouse gas shadow price, which can have an adverse impact to internal generators if they're displaced because their greenhouse gas compliance costs are in their offers and not dispatched when in reality there may be resources externally with a higher carbon cost that would have set a high, higher 
greenhouse gas shadow price if we were deeming differently. Is that consistent with your understanding? This is where it's not a trick question. I'm, I'm really trying to unpack the mechanics. Yeah, when it, George, did you want to talk about the, the shadow price aspect that Kathleen's referring to? Thank you, Anya. Uh, hello, this is George Anglis. I'm sorry I was uh, engaged in some other activity. I didn't uh, hear the question from Kathleen on the shadow price. If uh, Kathleen can briefly recount sure. it. Sure. So we have a greenhouse gas constraint. And my understanding of the current formulation is that the the risk of what I, I'm trying to clarify is, is larger because you could deem more than the physical limit. And so this is an improvement and, and I appreciate that. Um, even with this improvement, just trying to understand what we might be accepting as, as potential market outcome. So my question is the greenhouse gas constraint, let's say now we're gonna limit it to the net import. So it's now that 100 megawatt, not 120 megawatt. We deem resources up to the 100 megawatt but it's still coming from the least cost up to that requirement from resources based on their upper economic limit minus their this counterfactual. And so I think there is still some contribution to setting that shadow price as coming from a portion of these resources that may not be dispatched. And when we when you kind of invert that it may also look like counting some of the megawatts from resources that would have been base scheduled. If, you know, if you flip it on its head, I believe that means by taking this approach of upper upper economic limit minus the counterfactual, that it would set a lower greenhouse gas shadow price than if, for example, we did the dispatch minus the counterfactual. And I wanted to confirm that working understanding. Uh, so, yeah, so the both constraints are actually uh, enforced. Uh, so, you, essentially, the greenhouse gas attribution is limited by multiple things. So of course, it's limited by the bid, the megawatt amount on the bid, that's clear. Uh, it's also limited by the dispatch. We will not attribute above uh, the dispatch of the resource, that's clear too. And it's also limited by as you mentioned, the difference between the upper economic limit and the greenhouse gas reference. Uh, now, the constraint that we're talking about here introducing an additional uh, limitation on the uh, aggregate greenhouse gas attribution into a BAA, that is um, that will be limited by the net exporting uh, out of that BAA, will um, reduce potentially the greenhouse gas attributions. Uh, so with that constraint, obviously you'll have uh, a higher cost in the solution because any constraint that becomes uh, uh, enforced in, in an optimization problem, uh, you know, increases the cost. And what you will see, what you will potentially see is that the marginal greenhouse gas um, price uh, may be slightly elevated and uh, potentially the greenhouse gas transfer could be reduced because there is a limitation now that limits the aggregate greenhouse gas uh, um, attributions to that specific BAA. Um, thanks, George. Let me ask a quick follow-up. So I hear you saying, I hear what you are saying. My understanding is that this proposal would still result in a portion of the deemed megawatt coming from the the counterfactual area of that resource. And I just want to confirm that understanding of the proposal. Yes, this this constraint is still there, like it's an EIM. We're not we're not talking about this constraint, it's always enforced. We're talking about the new constraint that is more of an aggregate constraint on the total greenhouse gas attribution resources into a BAA. Understood. So just to share with 
the Kaiso team while you think through this. I do think this is a step in the right direction from today because it limits from 120 megawatts down to 100 megawatts the risk of total amount of that counterfactual portion that is being allowed to contribute to the shadow price, but it still can happen. And I do believe, at least on my current understanding and George's confirmation, that that results in a lower greenhouse gas shadow price than if we were to limit that amount to ensure that no amount of the counterfactual of a resource could go towards setting that shadow price. When those- uh, Okay, I said higher, higher. Higher price, right? Yes. If you enforce higher. a constraint, you get the higher price, yeah. You expect the higher price. Yes. And if we can for, and if we were to enforce a higher constraint on the megawatt side, you would get a higher price as well. One I would argue, one I believe is a more accurate greenhouse gas shadow price. And so I think that is part of what I'd like uh, to ask you to take back and think about is when we're thinking about the impact and what's important about these details we're, we're kind of, you know, talking about is that shadow price being lower or higher has an impact on the market solution that also impacts internal generation, not only external generation. And some scenarios working through that and how that impacts dispatches and pricing, um, I just think is the next step because we need to understand that um, to kind of further consider this proposal. Uh, thank you so much. For, thank you so much for I going through that. I understand. That thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, Moving on, the, the GHG pseudo tie was an area where we did receive feedback um, just in terms of mechanics. Um, there, uh, we may have may not have aptly named it. Maybe it shouldn't be called a GHG pseudo tie, but potentially something else. But I do think it's important just based on the comments we received to outline how the pseudo tie concepts differs from the GHG pseudo tie itself. I also want to preface this um, in the straw proposal, Kaiso had proposed to apply the GHG pseudo tie concept to both proposals. And at this time, um, we don't view it as necessary and it won't be included in the resource specific proposal, but to implement the zonal path one and path two, kind of viewing resources that is internal to a GHG regulation area on a long or short-term basis, we see this feature as, as necessary there. Um, so just to go through the comparison of the pseudo tie versus GHG pseudo tie, a pseudo tie today is any resource outside of a BA that the Kaisa treats as if it were internal, whereas a GHG pseudo tie is only viewed as internal for GHG accounting purposes only. Um, in no other way is it viewed as as internal to that other BAA. We do have specific requirements for pseudo ties. Um, they need to use a participating generator agreement called the pseudo tie participating generator agreement and follow requirements in our tariff that are listed in Appendix N, as well as have an agreement with their BAA. The CAISO also needs to have an agreement with their BAA. Um, we have an open question uh, for stakeholders in terms of what requirements should be necessary um, if, if using the GHG pseudo tie concept. Um, and that's something that we'll pose in the revised draft proposal. Other differences include treatment in the RSC. Um, because from a modeling perspective, the pseudo tie um, is viewed as internal, it is included in the RSC, whereas a GHG pseudo tie would not because it's only viewed as, as internal for greenhouse gas accounting purposes. Um, another aspect of both proposals includes how we treat e-tags and the requirements around e-tags. They are required for pseudo ties. For GHG pseudo ties, this is an open question if they should be required or not, and an area will also be seeking feedback. Um, there are also different settlement implications between the two um, pseudo ties. So the pseudo tie itself does have special considerations to avoid double counting energy. Since the modeling and physical flows are different, there aren't necessarily um, settlement impacts for the GHG pseudo tie itself. Um, just, oh, George, do you want to go ahead with your comments on the pseudo tie? Yes, thank you, Anya. Um, and uh, what I wanted to say is that um, we, 
describe here the concept of the greenhouse gas pseudo die, which is an accounting mechanism because it goes along with the greenhouse gas attribution um, in the in the <clears throat> in the resource specific approach, or more generally for any other approach, um, is an accounting mechanism. However, um, there are some issues with it, and it's shown here. Uh, one of them is shown here in this table, as you can see. Uh, a real pseudo die uh, is included in the RSC for the BAA that is uh, the attaining uh, BAA. Uh, but the greenhouse gas pseudo die, if it's only an accounting concept, uh, obviously that resource is, is not included in the correct BAA for uh, resource efficiency evaluation purposes. So that's incorrect. Uh, also, from a, a power flow um, standpoint, in the, in the market solution is incorrect because although it's an accounting mechanism, um, the, if we account that the greenhouse gas pseudo tie is serving load in another BAA, um, then it should be in the power balance constraint for that BAA and not the native BAA. So it has to actually be pseudo tied to a BAA that at least overlaps with the greenhouse gas regulation area or the greenhouse gas pseudo tie accounting takes place. So I think we need to uh, go to the next layer in supporting this feature. It's described here as an accounting mechanism, but to make it work and have a, a correct market solution, both from a power flow standpoint and market optimality, this needs to actually become a real pseudo tie to a BAA that at least overlaps with our greenhouse gas regulation area, so that then it's accounted as part of that uh, BAA's power balance constraint in the optimal solution, and as part of the resource efficiency evaluation for that uh, BAA. Thank you. Thanks, George. Just being sensitive to time, we also received some feedback and requests to discuss the geographic boundaries at the at this technical conference. Um, throughout the working group process earlier this year, we discussed that we are moving from looking at the geographic footprint from the BAA to now at the GHG regulation area in recognition that states with GHG pricing programs don't always nicely fit into the BAA construct. Um, but I think there were some questions around, well, how is Kaisa going to implement this? Um, I'll flag that our initial thoughts about implementation is that we would have the boundary areas in the master file. There would be a new GHG regulation field that would indicate if this um, is in California, Washington, or a non-greenhouse gas regulation area. And then we would associate nodes and resources. So those pricing nodes, aggregated pricing nodes, and scheduling points. And really, this is intended to ensure that we're able to reflect the costs associated with greenhouse gas compliance programs, um, but avoid including those costs for states that are not subject to those programs. Um, so just wanted to open it up if there were further questions about this modeling or recommendations from stakeholders. Um, I see Mary has her hand up. If we can get her a mic. Thanks, Anya. I just am curious if you've thought about how this works for a multi-state balancing authority area. I'm thinking specifically of Bonneville, where a portion of their system is in Washington and a portion isn't. I think I'm struggling to kind of understand then how this impacts the sort of attribution to the GHG regulation area when it's a just a portion of a of a BAA. Right. So when we associate generators as a more gen with that geographic area, it would either be, and BPA is a tricky <laughs> scenario because I think there's further considerations there, but we would have to associate it with Washington and then a non-GHG regulation area. Um, there might be further considerations that I may not be aware of special to BPA's case. So, um, but for a state that straddles different areas, that would be the approach we would take. Oh, so is this this is just for generators, not for load. Is that it's I think we're still considering kind of the load aspect of this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. 
Thanks, Anya. Uh, just a follow up on that. Um, to what extent, since we're, we're talking about Washington, um, to what extent are these changes necessary only to do the default energy bids? Or are you also, are, are, to what extent are they necessary for those or would they also be, um, or are they tied to potential decisions about who bears the compliance obligation in Washington's program? I'd like to separate kind of the Washington specific issues um, since they have a, a different timeline and we're looking at some enhancements in WEIM for Washington. Um, there are proxies um, to this approach. This is a more accurate approach, um, but there are ways to estimate that for the default energy bid aspect as well. Um, and we'll talk about that separately in, in the Washington GHG enhancements initiative. Yeah, uh, this is Mike from Pacific Corp. Just thinking about the geographic boundary and, and Mary's question, obviously Pacific Corp falls into that category as well where our BA straddles um, multiple states. And, and so I just wanna make sure I understood that right. So, um, You, you, the generation would be assigned where it's geographically located. That's right. I think I have lots of questions, but I, I have to get them straight in my mind first. Thanks. Okay. It looks like there's a question on remotely. Go ahead, Brenda. We can go ahead and unmute Kathleen. Great, thank you. This is Kathleen Colbert from the district. I had, a, I had submitted a couple modeling questions in my prior to drop the public comments. Um, so this, thank you for touching on this. It was one of the things that we wanted to better understand was the modeling approach for it. I think I heard George say that for the greenhouse gas pseudo tie is a concept and you're still working through the mechanics. Is that act did I hear that correctly? Um, is that where can, we are? Can you repeat that, Kathleen? Sure. Um I here we go. Um, can you go back to the prior slide? Perfect. I think I heard that with the greenhouse gas pseudo tie, this is conceptually what you're proposing, but you have not identified a specific market functionality approach that you plan to implement is was that an accurate understanding i don't know if i'm following your question but for the pseudo the ghg pseudo tie itself i think there's still I think. Um, some questions around the requirement itself can you can you help me narrow, narrow that oh. question down yeah i think i yeah i can so. search Oh, yeah, it was something so, I heard you yeah, what, Thanks, George. Yeah, what I said is that there need to be some rules around the greenhouse gas pseudo type to make it uh, workable in the sense that it provides the benefit for which it's designed without uh, creating um, issues uh, with the optimality of the market solution and the power flow solution. So we have to essentially work with the greenhouse gas pseudo tie through the existing concept of the actual pseudo tie and we'll have to bridge those two so that we have a, a reasonable uh, feature that works well both for the market and for the intended benefit that the greenhouse gas pseudo tie uh, uh, strives to provide okay thanks george and as someone who asked for additional clarity on this point, um, I'll give you an example, kind of like what I'm hoping to see in a future iteration. Um, in my both need for details and wanting to keep, um, try to keep it simple, 
Mark, you made a joke about the notation not being interesting this morning. I love notation. So what I'd really would be really helpful to understand the market functionality. And when I say that, what I mean is in my mind, we have in the market, we have an objective function and we have set, we have multiple sets of resource nodes that are defined within sets based on their note and have different node indices assigned to them. The physical pseudotypes have a node index that is assigned to being a physically, and they are modeled as physically within that area. I believe a greenhouse gas pseudotype functionality in a simple world is to create a node index for that greenhouse gas area, which we have today, and include the pseudotype resources in that set of nodes. So in my mind, this has always been a fairly simple market implementation of defining the set and including them as a node within that set defined. And then the objective function when it comes to treating them as inside the greenhouse gas already includes them in the set. Um, but that would be very clear to me if you're also thinking that it is as simple as that. If in the next iteration, you could provide a description of the node indices that you're thinking of using and how they would be reflected in the objective functions that we have in today's CPM, um, just to kind of see what the tweak is that you're proposing actually on that level of detail is what would help at least us understand going forward. And I want to um, appreciate your time. Thanks Kathleen for that directional feedback on what would be helpful. Um, to, to round out the discussion, I, I wanted to talk, touch on regulatory alignment and some of the scalability and adaptability of the resource specific uh, proposal. Um, when Mark touched on this in the beginning, but with any of these proposals, they need to meet state and federal um, laws and regulations. We've mentioned this previously, but we're not seeking to reshape greenhouse gas accounting or reduction um, laws or regulations at the state or federal level. And we do need this alignment in place before implementation ahead of, ahead of 2024. And recognizing that our processes may move faster than, than some state um, policy changes that, that could take years. And just to touch on, on what I mean here is at the federal level, those statutory laws and judicial doctrines and at the state level, both for CARB and Washington, their respective cap and trade, cap and invest programs, their mandatory reporting rules, and first jurisdictional deliverer construct. I also wanted to touch on some of the um, scalability aspects of the resource specific approach. Um, we do believe it's scalable if and when there are additional greenhouse gas pricing programs in the West. Um, we've touched on this in the past, but any sort of linked program could simply reflect their greenhouse gas costs as part of their energy bid. Um, however, when there are unlinked programs and states have not gone through their official channels of designating their states as linked, multiple GHG bid adders would be necessary. Um, I also wanna conclude with the fact that this greenhouse gas design will continue to evolve. We've evolved it through the WEIM and will continue to do so through the, the EDAM. Um, and we believe that the resource specific approach is foundational and adaptable to the zonal or LEDWP approach should state regulators move in that direction. Um, other aspects of the resource specific model I wanted to highlight is how it's trying to align with state policies in terms of future constraints, um, in terms of not allowing certain resource types to serve load within that GHG regulation area or certain emission intensities. So we'll discuss this more in the revised draw proposal, but I did wanna to touch on the scalability and adaptability piece. Are there any other final comments or questions? Stuart. Anya, can you speak to any kind of CARB approvals that may be needed um, to implement the resource specific approach in, for, for EDAM? Because I think the rules contemplate EIM dispatch, but not EDAM. So I would assume there has to be some approval or some rulemaking by CARB. Is that correct? I might defer to Mark on this one. Um, since compliance ultimately is uh, based on the actual um, deliveries, 
I think there may be, I, I don't know the answer, honestly. Okay. And I, I don't know if we've had that discussion about whether it needs to change. Um, I think the EIM, if EDAM came through and informed EIM, I think the EIM still holds together resource specific. So I don't think there's anything that fundamentally needs to change. Do they need to have some references to EDAM to make it work? I don't know. Um, I, I can't think of any right now. Um, if we wanted to do something like a zonal or the LA approach, um, I think there would need to be some recognition of the uh, who's the complying entity. Brenda, are there any? Oh, no. All right. Well, thanks so much. I think this heads us into a break and looks like there's snacks in the back. So thanks so much. Sugar, sugar. All right. So I think we're ready to get started on this next segment on the zonal proposal. And I'm very pleased to welcome Mary Winkie, who's going to be joining us for this discussion or leading this discussion. She's the executive director of the public generating pool. And she's joined by Anya Gilbert, our lead policy developer. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Anya first to kick it off. All right, sounds good. Folks are fueled up and ready for, <laughs> for part two of a three-part GHG session. Um, I wanna start out by thanking Mary for, for coming and, and sharing kind of additional details. Um, I think having these additional proposals only helps strengthen the ultimate GHG design. Um, so really appreciative of kind of these proposals being put forward. Um, I also wanted to provide an overview, similarly to what I did for the resource specific approach to talk about some of the comments received um, in response to the straw proposal on the zonal approach. Um, so we did get requests for the zonal proposal on the design aspects, the hurdle rate, which is now being referred to as a toll, um, as well as some of the mechanics for reporting and compliance. And this was really in an effort to inform stakeholders uh, decision. Um, we also had a lot of support for the zonal proposal um, equal to that of resource specific. And there was a lot of support um, associated with the lack of reporting obligations for non greenhouse gas regulation areas. Um, there are also some questions about potential emissions leakage and lack of comparable treatment. Um, and we also received, similar to the resource-specific proposal, requested feedback from state air regulators on if the zonal proposal complies with existing state regulations. Um, some of the, this next slide um, really goes over some of the open questions that we've been discussing both in the, the workshop um, that we held for a few months in the beginning of this year um, and throughout the um, straw proposal design. Um, I've talked through these with you know, who will the first jurisdictional deliverer, deliverer be for the zonal proposal. Um, and that really matters in terms of who holds the compliance obligation, who holds the reporting obligation, um, and can there be a FJD for specified so sources um, and uh, non-FJD for unspecified sources of power. Um, also some questions around the GHG revenue allocation. So ourselves, we're a nonprofit. Um, questions around if e-tags are required um, under the path one, path two proposal that would view resources um, as kind of long-term commitments um, for the greenhouse gas regulation area. Open questions on if there's going to be the ability for an EDAM entity to elect not to serve a greenhouse gas regulation area um, and what data would be uh, available for porting. So I'll turn it over to Mary now, but just these are some intros in terms of the feedback we heard from stakeholders and some open design questions that she'll be getting into. So thank you, Mary. Thanks, Anya. As Anya mentioned, I my name is Mary Winkie. I'm the executive director of the public generating pool. And I'm going to talk today about regulatory considerations associated with the zonal approach. 
proposed by uh, PGP and PowerX. And I'm gonna focus on some of the regulatory considerations, both state and federal that are implicated by this, by this, propo by this proposal. Uh, I do wanna emphasize though that um, while I have, I have experience as a FERC attorney, as well as a state regulatory attorney, I am neither of those things in my current role. So this is not an exhaustive legal analysis. This is raising issues for consideration and discussion and entities will need to decide whether and how and when further legal and, and some more substantive analysis is necessary. So I'm just gonna briefly do a little bit of background on the zonal proposal. I'll try to go through this quickly. I did note in the beginning of this session, Kaiso noting that there's an expectation that people have read the materials. So I'll, I'll try to go through the background relatively quickly. And then we're gonna talk about cap and trade compliance obligation for unspecified imports. That's getting to this FJD question that um, Anya was just teeing up, addressing leakage some federal considerations, and then verifying specified source imports, and then leave a little bit of time for discussion. I will also note that there are some slides in this deck as a technical appendix that has have more detail on some elements of the proposal if you are looking for that information. So just a little background that I wanna go through on some of the, the regulatory frameworks in which we are we are operating and what the purpose of a greenhouse gas pricing program what we're what we're trying to accomplish and the per the purpose of a ghg pricing program is to reduce ghg emissions by imposing a cost on those emissions within that ghg pricing program's footprint intending to make low or not emitting resources more economic relatively speaking and and the rules also are applicable to imports to prevent leakage. Leakage is a phenomenon where emissions are shifted out of state versus actually reduced. So the policy framework in which we're operating, California cap and trade has been in place since 2013. Washington cap and invest begins in 2023. The cap and invest rules are very closely based on the California rules. So very similar programs, uh, in particular as to how they are implemented on treatment of imports. Notably, the, Cal the Washington rules do not have um, rules specifically addressing the EIM on a resource specific basis the way the California rules do. Both programs apply to energy, gen energy generated in the state and imported into the state. Both state programs separate in imports into specified and unspecified buckets. So I wanna emphasize this in part, I know this is basic for some folks that we've been using these terms already, but these are categories that CARB developed as part of its rulemaking process when the program was being implemented to define imports that were, that were coming in through the bilateral market. <coughs> specified imports generally where the source of the import is known and unspecified where the source of the import is not known. The specified import emissions rate are based on that resource specific emissions rate and the unspecified emissions rate is a default emissions rate. CARB set that default emission rate at 0.428 metric tons of CO2 per megawatt hour in the onset of the program. It has not changed since then. It was based on what was anticipated to be the marginal unit that was likely to be the unspecified import. Both programs regulate the first jurisdictional deliverer. This is the entity that delivers the energy into the state. And it's when the state has the authority to impose a compliance obligation. One of the challenges with that, that um, was identified, you know, back in the early aughts, um, was a challenge if a single state wants to impose a cap and trade program, the lack of regulation on imports would create leakage, but regulating imports is challenged due to the jurisdictional restriction of a state imposing requirements on out of state entities. Importers with a compliance obligation must purchase and retire allowances. 
and one allowance is retired per ton of GHG. So just one more element on this before we move on is that generally the specified and unspecified buckets are separated and the importer is identified based on e-tags in the bilateral market. So the e-tag identifies the specific resource if it's a specified import. If it's unspecified, the importer is identified also based on the e-tag. And I think Anya already mentioned this, but CARB collects data directly from ODI and then um, verifies data from individual entities based on their e-tags. So a little bit of background on the design proposal for internal resources in the GHG zone, they include their costs and their offer prices. Specified source imports are transfers at a specific, um, transfers of specific resources at that resource specific rate. And then unspecified imports are assigned a default emissions rate associated with the aggregate surplus generation in the external region. So this is functionally similar to how it works in the bilateral market. The, if, the unspecified default rate that is currently applied to unspecified imports in the um, bilateral market is still based on, it's, it's, it's based on what that marginal resource is expected to be. The difference with the zonal proposal is that you do not have a specific importer identified for that unspecified import. You're just aggregating a quantity from the external area. So I'm gonna skip through a little bit of the next slides to get to the meat of this. So I do wanna talk a little bit just about the settlement here. Uh, in this scenario, the market operator is collecting surplus revenue um, from load. And then in external resources receive less revenue, but receive revenue based on what they bid into the market. So the market operators receiving that excess revenue and the, that revenue is going to equal the quantity of allowances that need to be purchased and retired because the revenue is based on the quantity of unspecified imports. So thinking about compliance for unspecified imports. So as I mentioned, the unspecified imports are not linked to any particular resource and not to any particular importer. When the GHG zone is a net importer, price separation between the zones reflects the unspecified, will reflect the unspecified rate. So again, we talked a little bit about this already, but I think the, the key piece here is that this proposal is revenue neutral in that the market, rate, the market operator is collecting the quantity of revenue that is ultimately needed to cover the quantity of emissions that are calculated as imported into the GHG zone. I'm going to pause here and just see if there's any questions on the background before I kind of get in, more into the meat of the presentation. Okay, it looks like there's a question on the phone. Oh no, that's, oh, the red light means none. How, how clever, thank you. Okay, so a little bit of background and more information on the first jurisdictional deliverer framework. So initially the first jurisdictional deliverer approach was developed as the Western Climate Initiative program design, which was, I should have put the date on here, but in the, kind of early 2000s, mid 2000s range. Is that right, Vijay? You're nodding. Um, and, and it's really something that that effort came up with as a way to address emissions leakage that we just talked about that can occur if a single state is imposing a cost on emissions but surrounding states are not. And that approach has evolved over time through public rulemaking, primarily at and the California Air Resources Board, and is also intended to ensure in-state generators and importers are treated the same way on a comparable basis and provide for accuracy and verification of emissions reporting. For power that is generated outside California or Washington for consumption within those states, 
The FJD is the first entity that delivers electricity over which the consuming jurisdiction has regulatory authority. So this is a critical element of both accomplishing the program goals of minimizing leakage, and then also having a framework that is legally defensible for the state imposing the program so that they are imposing a compliance obligation only on an entity that it has jurisdiction over, an energy that it has jurisdiction over. In the bilateral market, the FJD is the electricity importer, who I already mentioned is based on e-tags. For specified imports, individual external resources are identified and resource specific emissions are used. For unspecified imports, individual external resources are not identified and a default emission factor is used. As I already mentioned, in both cases, an external entity is identified as the entity with the compliance obligation. And that is the purchasing, the last purchasing selling entity on the e-tag crossing into the state. And this is the same framework that is going to be applied in Washington. There are some, I can't help but mention, there are some um, ways that this is differently applied for multi-jurisdictional entities. Um, but we are not going to, for the purposes of this conversation, we're not going to go into that detail. Happy to talk about those elements offline. Um, but I think the important, just the key piece here is it's, it's, a, it's effectively the entity, you know, carrying the energy across the border, uh, if you will, is, is the entity who is being regulated when it comes to electricity imports. So this slide is a little bit of a, a, a thought slide, um, and, and we're not going to focus on EDAM for just a moment here, but to really think about what the FJD framework might look like if you were in a fully organized market. So, so set aside for a moment the EDAM and just consider how you would think about an FJD framework in a, in a, if we were a fully organized market. In a fully organized market, We've talked about this already, generally no specific link to where resources inject and where loads withdraw, and no longer a mechanism to identify individual importers, either specified or unspecified based on e-tags or bilateral transactions. So you have just a completely different framework under which you are operating, and identifying the individual FJD becomes much more difficult when you don't have a bilateral framework to rely upon. Um, generally, individual resources are sold at their location, and the aggregate output from all resources is simultaneously delivered by the, op by the market operator to load locations. So energy delivered is not tied to any particular location, and approaches that require the market dispatch to accurately link resources to loads have the potential to be arbitrary. We talked a lot about uh, some of the challenges with the approach taken in the EIM. Um, I think that there are challenges with any approach, to be clear, but I think what, what, what we're thinking about is a way to potentially move away from the, a requirement to actually create a link that essentially doesn't exist within the market that you're operating in. In the context of a fully organized market, the entity responsible for delivering electricity for resources loads is the market operator. The market operator has taken operational control of the transmission assets and res is responsible for delivering the electricity. However, the market operator is not a source of emissions and does not have ownership over assets that produce emissions. So you also, in the context of a fully organized market, have a disconnect between the entity who's responsible for delivering electricity and the entity who's responsible for um, who has title over the energy, who has ownership over the assets that are actually producing the emissions. So now I wanna kind of come back again to EDAM. I think it was just important to understand just the challenges in applying the FJD framework, framework in a fully organized market. It's, and, and, and also I think important to note that there aren't any, um, there are not any fully organized markets that have tackled this situation. California and Washington are the only greenhouse gas pricing programs in the country that price imports. 
And so there isn't, there, there isn't sort of a, an existing framework within organized markets to point to for how this should be done in that context. So I think the pretty strong or the, the view, or at least, you know, perspective that I want to share today is that the, the manner in which the FDG is identified in the bilateral market is tailored to the design of the bilateral market. It, it leverages bilateral transactions and leverages e-tags in order to identify the FJD. So in thinking about that FJD framework in a fully organized market or an EDAM, we really, we really wanna also leverage what does that market design look like? The FJD framework can reflect what the market design um, is rather than continuing to try to use a structure that was created for the bilateral market. Oat transmission framework. So the zonal approach for GHG pricing also reflects that hybrid approach, the hybrid market design. You have reporting of specified imports that can be done similar to CARB's existing approach. So under the zonal approach, under the zonal proposal, entities who are wanting to make specified sales, specified imports into the GHG zone can choose. And the reporting for those specified imports can essentially work very similarly to how they do today for um, in the bilateral market. We'll talk about this in a, in, a, in a bit, but again, sort of similar to the bilateral market, there's certain criteria that are met in order to verify that specified imports uh, are valid. You know, currently CARB requires that the generating resource is identified on the tag. Um, it may require a contract um, between the resource and the uh, demand it's serving. So there's there's incremental criteria verification that are needed, but from a reporting perspective, essentially that FJD is still that external entity. Compliance for unspecified imports reflects the reality of that simultaneous organized market dispatch, um, but it's still functionally similar to the to the bilateral market. Revenue is collected from load and used to purchase and retire allowances. That's effectively the framework today. If you have a entity making a bilateral sale to California, they are incorporating into their entry price the cost of having to purchase that allowance. The zonal proposal, the zonal approach effectively um, operates in the same way. Um, only, as I already mentioned, you would not have an individual external entity identified. Data verification in EDAM can be accomplished based on the total quantity of imports into the GHG zone and the application of the unspecified emissions rate, whatever that emissions rate is determined to be. So in thinking about the sort of simplest, most sensible way to operationalize this framework for EDAM, the market operator could effectively, become, could effectively become the administrator of the FJD function for unspecified imports. The market operator will determine the total quantity of unspecified imports that will occur in each, each interval and collect the surplus revenue associated with the greenhouse gas emissions associated with those imports. Um, at that point, the market design has accomplished the collection of the revenue needed to purchase and retire allowances. So the purchase and the purchasing and retiring of allowances effectively becomes an administrative function that the market operator could perform. As we already talked about, the market operator is not a source of generating assets or is not a source of emissions because it doesn't own generating assets but it is, the, it is the administrator of the dispatch of those sources. And so when I think about the market operator being the FJD, they are effectively the administrator of the compliance for those sources. Verification data includes total imports and application of the unspecified emissions rate. There would not be a need to collect incremental data that isn't already collected from the market to perform um, the reporting and verification uh, elements. 
And then ultimately, whoever is assigned the responsibility for the purchase and retirement of allowances, the source of the data would be the market operator um, in any event. So, so as I mentioned, I think the perspective is that the, the simplest solution um, is for the market operator to administrate this function. And, and also, the, the market operator is the entity delivering electricity, so actually best falls into the, the true definition of the FJD under the regulatory framework. I recognize that there may be reasons that the market operator is hesitant uh, to, to play this role. And I know this has been, was an ongoing conversation during the um, development of CARB's program in the first place. So I don't, I, I, while I think it's the most sensible and simplest solution, I think there's also other solutions that could be possible this could be assigning a third party the responsibility, um, essentially that administrative responsibility that again, the, the data is still coming from the market operator to, for, to, to conduct the verification, but a third party could be responsible for purchasing and retiring allowances. Um, or there could be an allocation framework developed for, for, the, for the revenue to be allocated to entities within the GHG zone and then the revenue could be redis redistributed to those entities based on um, their compliance obligation. So this is something that I, I do think that would warrant further conversation, that there may be different ways to allocate that revenue to entities within the GHG zone. Um, you could effectively base it on whether or not entities within the GHG zone are net importers from the market and, and have kind of a a pro, pro rata allocation that way. Um, I do want to emphasize that it would not be, um, you know, any incremental reporting obligation that is assigned to entities within the GHG zone would come with the incremental revenue in order to purchase and retire allowances. So it would still be a revenue neutral solution. It's just a little bit more difficult than the market operator performing that function because you're now dispersing the revenue to, um, different entities within the GHG zone. And, and having to figure out how to perform an allocation that is effectively unnecessary to perform. I'm gonna stop there and see if anyone has questions about the FJD framework. But Jay, I see your hand up back there. Yes, hello, Vijay WRA. Uh, this is really helpful. Thank you, Mary. You've done some serious thinking here. So I appreciate this. So I, I want to, maybe it's a question to both of you, even to Anya in, in a way. I totally agree with you on the observations here or your, your thoughts on the LGD function and the market operator possibly having a role to play because they are, after all, still managing the dispatch and um, satisfying the load needs, uh, but we're talking EDAM, and if I'm correct, with every other market functionality element, resource efficiency transmission, EDAM is still at the BA level. The BAs are still making the decisions on what they want to bid, what they want to buy, what they want to sell. So the question is, even if it's unspecified inputs, why isn't the, why isn't the, I'm calling point of compliance not being the BA here? Why are we bringing up the market operator uh, to be the, um, the, 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 that last bullet source of the data will be the market operator regardless of who's ultimately responsible? Uh, I feel the BA could have a clear role here. Why isn't, why, I'm, I'm curious. Why, why did you go to the market operator level and not at the BA level for all this? Thanks, Jay. So, oh, sure. Go ahead, Stuart. Stuart Kelly, LA, because the, the zonal approach, uh, as Mary's described, in, in part, you've got the the load is actually uh, making that payment, so they already pay um, through the LMP, right? So they pay the market operator, then the market operator passes that funds back to load to then purchase and retire obligations. 
And I think what Mary's putting up here, and it definitely wants further discussion, why have that inefficiency? There's ways that the market operator can directly make the payment. You might not even under the correct construct have to purchase and retire allowances if there's some carbon cost that's set and you think about challenging to i mean i think fundamentally the the zonal approach is is trying to do away with those kinds of of having to make those kinds of distinctions from unspecified imports based either on well which baa is it coming from which generator is it coming from um it's it's trying to do away with the need to even do that and and so i think to stuart's point it's simply not necessary because the market design itself has um, imposed the right dispatch to minimize leakage, has collected the right amount of revenue to then purchase and retire allowances. So there just isn't a need to pursue a more complex solution that probably that may not get you better outcomes. No, and that's fine. I like this actually, but it makes sense. But I just want to make sure I understand the logic behind not being at the B level. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So it looks like there's a question on the phone. Mark Holman from PowerX, your line is unmuted. Thanks, Mary. I thought that was very, very clear. Um, and I'm really glad that we're honing in on this FJD topic. And I really appreciated uh, Vijay's question. And I think you explained it well. Um, and I think your, your framing at the start set it up well that who is regulated, and you know this stuff better than I do, so please correct me where I misspeak, who is regulated is generators inside the state with the program and imports. And imports is the key word. The FJD is really the entity that is taking the power across state lines, so to speak, or bringing it in. And so I think the zonal approach has a significant advantage over the deeming approach, because you know, looking at Mary's slides, you have two options here. Either it's the market operator who took that unspecified source energy and brought it across as the first jurisdictional deliverer into California or into Washington in its market operator role. Or we could say, okay, the market operator for some reason doesn't wanna take on that function. The market operator is handing it off to load inside that state that is a net purchaser from the market. And that load is bringing it in as the FJD. Both are rational and consistent with what the FJD is. I actually think there's a problem with the Western EIM today and with the EDAM because we know the deeming is inaccurate. So today we have entities where the, they're deemed delivered, they become the FJD and they don't have any exports. And that doesn't seem like that they can even qualify to be an FJD if they're not even exporting outside of their BA, outside of California or in the future, Washington. And um, the same thing in the EDAM, if I understand the response to, to Kathleen's question this morning, the proposal for the EDAM will still deem supply from the counterfactual. So you could have a BA that's exporting one megawatt and it gets deemed delivered for 500 megawatts. How can it be the FJD for 500 megawatts if it's only exporting out of its BA one megawatt? And so I think the FJD here, I think these are the two, and maybe a third party, if we wanted to put a third party perhaps on ETAGs to collect the money and, and retire it, but it seems like the FJD is much stronger for the zonal because it should be the importer. I think the spec when you can identify the source, then you can say, well, the generator of that source was the one bringing it into the state. But when we know it's either unspecified or it's inaccurate, that becomes problematic. Tony, go ahead while we, while we uh... so. Wait for Mark to come back. We've been reasonably agnostic on on some of these things, but there there is there is a the importers and the FJDs are not the only regulated entities in the cap and trade program, right? The California uh, covered entities get allocated allowances 
and there are programmatic impacts on those entities based on what they get allocated and what happens with those accounts. And so that's a, 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 as we work these things through, I'd like to see some attention to that. So you can have, you know, a 400 megawatt utility that serves load and they get allocated allowances. And right now they are affected by the way the EIM um, uh, secondary dispatch, I think we tried to get rid of that term, but we're still using it, um, it you know, is impacted on that. And I'd like to be able to trace how each of these programs would, would affect those entities that are not FJD or don't just mirror importers. And, and I think I think one of the reasons, Tony, that it would be, again, sort of simpler for the market operator to 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 perform this function is that you may have an you may have a sort of colorable argument at that point that your that entities who are in the state who've been allocated allowances shouldn't shouldn't be affected at all. Um, that would be obviously a conversation with the K ARB, but I think you could you could definitely make that argument. Um, but even if even if even if the obligation was assigned to entities within the GHG zone, the obligation and the revenue would be allocated at the same time. So you would get revenue to purchase incremental allowances, again, potentially not affecting the amount of allowances that have been allocated um, you know, by CARB to cover cost burden. Um, I had one other point too. Uh, oh, I also think that the zonal approach, we'll get into addressing leakage, but I do think the zonal approach has the potential to do a better job of minimizing leakage and thus providing a basis to eliminate the you know, EIM outstanding emissions framework uh, that has been in place for the EIM. Jeff, do you have a question? Uh, so, so two themes I want to talk on. I want to talk on the complexity of hedging, and I want to talk about market efficiency. Uh, the uh, ISO right now is not part of sort of the carb uh, buying and selling of allowances. The allowances are not, uh, I don't want to describe it, a tax that simply A equals B. This happens, that happens, and the cost is known. Uh, there's horizons over which uh, allowances can be bought and retired. Uh, differential costs, and a lot of complex potential strategies and hedging on how the allowances are going to work. So we've had uh, serious concerns about putting the ISO into uh, a CARB allowance participant, actually injecting them into the CARB market. So I, I just want to say that is a, a concern that we've had historically. I don't think we've uh, relaxed that concern. Uh, the next still goes into the market efficiency. And this still uh, seems to be based on some flavor of a hurdle rate, that, that anything that flows through is subject to some flavor of a hurdle rate. And uh, our, our, our perspective of the zonal, our biggest concern with zonal is the efficiency of, of lower emitting resources or just lower cost resources being penalized up to some flavor of hurdle rate before they could, in our case, serve California. Uh, so I maybe you can just articulate here, am I missing something in this proposal? Is it still basically a hurdle rate? Uh, or or how, how do lower cost resources, lower emitting, lower total cost resources uh, not get discriminated against under this scenario? So I think, and, and we'll, we'll get to this topic going forward, but I, but I think what I'd encourage you to think about is comparing this to how it works currently in the bilateral market where you have entities who are external have the option to sell specified to California if they can meet the criteria that are available to make that specified source sale. That framework exists in this proposal to the extent that entities do not meet those criteria, but they're still selling on a bilateral basis to California. There's a default emissions rate that's applied. I think this, this proposal can potentially achieve a better default emissions rate by better aligning that default emissions rate with the marginal resource in the external area. The current in the current bilateral market, that's not accomplished. Um, but I, I 
I, I think it's a similar approach to what is currently in place in, place in the bilateral market. And that you're not, even though, even though you're not, you are creating um, a price for those resources to overcome in order to be dispatched. It's functionally similar to how a GHG adder might work or functionally similar to the application of a default emissions factor to unspecified bilateral purchases. Yeah, so it's just a reply to that. I, I, okay, if you're, if my mind is kind of in, we're in an optimization. So yeah, you're right. There is going to be vestiges of bilateral for who knows how long and how that's going to interact or interact and play with EDAM. But if we're really in a full EDAM, fully sort of a optimized market, I don't know if George is still on, but he made a point in one of the one of the earlier sessions that really you can either use the resource specific approach that uh, economically optimizes and lets the market through correct economic optimization, and then deal with the uh, secondary effects outside of the market through some other process. But at least you let the market optimize properly. Or, and I'm going to use a little bit uh, language that George didn't use you can undermine the efficiency of the optimization through artificial barriers and hope that regulators don't have to clean up the mess afterwards in addition to undermining the optimization. So I'll just say that's currently where our view is. We're, 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 we're open, but we're not seeing these issues be addressed in any, any of the zonal type approaches. Thanks, Jeff. And, and I just think there there are, and I don't want to get into a, a technical debate because I do really want to focus this discussion on the regulatory framework, but I do think there are differing opinions about whether or not this approach undermines the efficiency of the market or, or improves it. Anything else? Oh, looks like there's a comment or a question on the phone. Yeah, we do. Isabella, can you go ahead and read the chat question? Yes, it's from Pacificor. Uh, the administration of GHG program will necessarily have a disconnect between GHG price assumed at the time of energy settlement and price of actual allowances. There needs to be additional consideration around GHG cost true up. Where will this true up occur and any incremental cost or revenue reconciled under the proposed approach of having the market operator administer FJD function? And I think that's getting to some of the complexity that Jeff was mentioning about any ent any entity who is participating in CARB's program as far as purchasing and retiring allowances and it being being more complex than um, I think it can be very simple or it can be very complex. I guess is how I would how I would put that. Um, I do think that the issue of assigning the allowance price is also an important issue to discuss, but also one that exists regardless of what proposal is pursued. Another question on the phone? We do have a question from Pratar. Your line is unmuted. Well, as, as I mentioned before, uh, it's not just efficiency, like Jeff Nelson said, that the issue is zonal approach. It's, it's pure discrimination. I mean, before EIM, uh, there were three ways for uh, resources outside of California to be either resource specific or asset control supply or on a specified rate. And that unspecified rate was linked somehow to marginal gas unit, which discriminated against renewables outside of California. And this zonal approach didn't, didn't solve that problem. And I really recommend everybody to read Nevada comments on our proposal about this topic and Power Act and what's going to happen at FERC when we go with it. Now, when we compare different methods, I suggest my friend Mark Holman to compare this method with hybrid method because hybrid method is so much superior to this zonal method because it solves problems of resource-based approach. And when he's talking about big and many advantages of this method, I would like to hear some of that besides this problem with discriminatory approach to renewables outside of GHG zones. Because the hybrid method is based on the idea of zonal approach to do accounting based on load or zone. And if that is acceptable for CARB, for zonal approach, should be acceptable for hybrid approach. 
And by the way, resource-based approach, if it's using correct counterfactual GAG reference, either way with, with bid address or not bid outside, results in accurate dispatch and accurate incremental GAG cost for imports into GAG zone. So I really like to hear from critics of that approach, what are the deficiencies? Thank you. Thanks, Petter. And, and I know that LA is, I think, up next. So definitely looking forward to that presentation and hearing about that proposal and how it solves all of our problems. Um, I, I will say that I, I, I disagree that we can just conclude one way or the other about what is discriminatory or is not discriminatory. This is not something that for which there's a lot of precedent. And FERC's evaluation of what amounts to discrimination is, I don't think, clear to anyone in this room. So I, I, I don't think it's fair to make that um, level of conclusory statement even though we know that this question of whether or not it is discriminatory is something that we need to discuss. Looks like there was another question on the phone. Yes, we do have Mark Holman. Mark, please keep it short because we got to keep going on. Yeah, I'll just be quick. I was just going to, you just said what I was going to say is that I, I don't agree with the discriminatory uh, comment. I think two quick things. One is that the zonal approach provides for a resource specific where a clean resource would not face any hurdle rate at all. It needs to meet similar requirements to what exists for, from CARB from day one of the cap and trade outside of the EIM. The second thing that can be considered is also, as Mary described, potentially dropping the unspecified hurdle rate during certain conditions, such as renewable oversupply conditions in the external footprint. So I think it's, it's easy to say it's discriminatory without digging into the details. It, it's hard to see how it can be discriminatory, given that it's mirroring the rules that exist for the bulk of the imports that happen now, which occur outside the EIM. Thanks, Mark. Okay, we're going to keep going here in the interest of time and and um, giving next presenters their due. So just a little bit about addressing leakage. We've talked about this a little bit already um, and thinking about how are you gonna set that, the emissions rate, the default emissions rate. If, it, if that emissions rate isn't accurately low, you have issues because all imports are treated as clean generation. This pushes that leakage issue where you are, you are uh, shifting generation from inside the GHG zone to outside the GHG zone to potentially lower cost, higher emitting resources. If that GHG rate is inaccurately high, um, opportunities to reduce GHG emissions through import substitutions are not realized. And you are, again, using utilizing higher emitting, higher cost resources inside the GHG zone instead of that lower cost, lower emitting resources outside of the GHG zone. So the concept here is to address leakage by getting that default emissions rate as close to the marginal rate, marginal unit in the export in the GHG, excuse me, in the external area to, to try to um, most accurately have that, have that import GHG rate be as accurate as possible. So I'm gonna skip through these graphics quickly, just some, some looking at how to accurately determine the GHG rate for imports. Um, the idea is that if you have, you know, I think, I think I will say too, when we're talking about leakage, even I think CARB's regulations recognize that limit, that completely eliminating leakage is, um, going to be completely challenging, if not impossible. So the goal is really to minimize leakage. So we're really looking to get a solution that is as good as possible rather than something that's perfect. So setting that GHG rate um, at the mar marginal unit in every interval is likely not achievable, but what we might be able to do is get it relatively close, relatively uh, as often as possible.
So we talked touched on a little bit of this already, but wanted to tee up some uh, federal considerations and and really just note that there isn't a lot of established FERC precedent on incorporating GHG pricing in wholesale energy markets. So, and as I noted before, California and Washington are the only programs that regulate imports. So there really isn't a, a sort of legal or regulatory framework in the federal level to really address this. And really the only precedent that does exist is what CAISO has already done for the EIM. Um, other regional, other organized markets have explored these issues. They've highlighted this issue of leakage. Um, the New York ISO and PJM have uh, looked at these issues. PJM in particular has uh, states within its footprint. Some have um, GHG programs and some do not. So they have looked at sub-regional GHG pricing and looking at uh, addressing leakage through border adjustments. Uh, but um, those proposals have been discussed but not necessarily implemented and approved by FERC. And then last year, as many of you I'm sure know, FERC um, hosted a very lengthy workshop um, to talk about these issues and, and really kind of landed at a, in a policy statement of indicating that it would look at how to incorporate state GHG pricing on a case-by-case on a -case basis. So I think there's important considerations to look at, but I also think it's important to understand that there isn't kind of a, a, a body of settled law out there on this particular topic. So potential questions to consider. Uh, Non-discriminatory treatment of resources internal and external to the GHG zone. Um, again, very important, I think, both from a state and federal level to make sure that resources are treated compar comparably um, and they are, they are not discriminated against. External resources have that opportunity to deliver to the GHG zone on a specified basis and are functionally considered internal to the GHG zone. I would echo what Mark just said. The approach really reflects uh, what, what the framework is right now in the bilateral market. And so I think there's a colorful argument there that if something has worked and been supported in the bilateral market is something that could be supported in the context of an EDAM. Uh, the role of the market operator in the collection and redistribution of GHG revenue. Um, this gets a little bit, I think, to the point Jeff was making too is the market operator, what is the role of the market operator? Is there, is there a particular issue uh, with respect to um, FERC's definition of what a market operator should do, what dollars they should collect, um, and what their responsibilities are in terms of, and, and is it appropriate for the market operator to play that role? Uh, and then the ability of external entities to elect whether to serve demand in the GHG zone. This is something that FERC raised um, when CAISO filed the EIM proposal uh, a few years ago, and FERC wanted the entities in the external area to have the option of opting out of serving demand in the GHG zone. I think that the thinking on this is something that we need to talk about, but the um, what FERC was really concerned about was entities being able to opt out of being subject to a compliance obligation. And in the zonal approach, entities who are in the external area, unless they do want to sell on a specified basis into the GHG zone, will not have a compliance obligation. So our perspective is that in the context of the zonal proposal, this kind of becomes a non-issue because entities are effectively not required to do anything or perform any kind of regulatory function um, in the external area. But again, something that I think needs to be uh, raised and discussed. And then I did, Mark mention this as well, the concept where um, to address further sort of non-discriminatory ish, non-discrimination issues, the toll rate could be set to zero during periods of oversupply in the external area. So that you are trying to align what the emissions rate, what the default emissions rate is with what those, what the marginal unit is in the external area. Any questions or comments on federal considerations before we get to our last topic? Vijay? So 
I, I want to clarify what I'm reading on the slide, please. Again, very good work. Thank you, Mary. The, the, your federal considerations is those top three bullets, which are the questions to keep in mind. But that's not related to the zonal approach considerations, or you are trying to convey considerations on the zonal approach, keeping the federal context in mind. I'm trying to understand the second part of that slide. Thanks, Jay, and, and perhaps this slide I'm literal, sorry. Could, my could brain. use some could use some further clarification, but the the top three bullets are potential questions to consider in terms of you know what are the what are the issues we need to consider on a federal level. Okay. Uh, and and then the, and then below is okay potential ways that these issues could be addressed. Got it. In the in the zonal approach. Perfect. Thank you. That gets me to my question, which is and second last bullet. I, I'm not very knowledgeable in this area, but I do know from my time out east, there were some reliability must run situations or uh, exceptional stressed conditions that we are very familiar with. And so it's a question partly even for Cal ISO staff uh, is, could there be moments or situations where the day ahead market operator has to do exceptional dispatch, new words I came up with, uh, exceptional dispatch to serve load, which might require violating the condition of normal individual resources be specifically dispatched to serve demand in GHG zone. What if the LMPs are super high all over Cal ISO region and they decide to, for reliability sake or meeting load at all costs, uh, bring in some gas or other resources from outside California and serving JG on. Would that even be a possibility or I'm just cooking up a very complicated situation for no reason? <laughs> I mean- I mean, not I, for I, no reason, I do have a reason. I would, I would, I would probably ask um, Kaiser to answer that from an operational perspective, but I think functionally, if, the, when, if and when this design proposal is in place, you would not have sort of a, a one-off opportunity for the market operator to kind of assign a specific generator external generator as FJD. I just, I don't think that would be an, there wouldn't be an opportunity to do that. But Mark, did you have a? Yeah, I I think the answer is generally not. They could schedule uh, or they wouldn't do it in the day ahead market. They'd probably do it after the day ahead market and they may ask for some, if they couldn't find a market solution, they could get a uh, out of market um, interchange. Um, how that then that would be scheduled by somebody it would be tagged by somebody and they would i think currently be um responsible for the compliance obligations so that's how it, it would happen now thanks mark there's a question on the phone I do have a question on our chat isabella take it away thanks brenda Yes, yeah, so we do have a question in the chat from Power Costs. Uh, does the CAISO know what percent of current EIM PRSC resources opt out of GHG delivery by not bidding GHG or bidding less than max capacity? I don't have that information offhand, but that's something that we can look into. I, I don't either. Okay. Okay, we have one more topic to get through here, try to get through this very quickly. Um, really thinking the last topic here is really about verification of specified source imports. So I talked about this a little bit in the context of the bilateral market as there needing to be some verification of that specified source import in terms of an e-tag uh, tagged back to the generator or a contract, um, something indicating that the, the resource is um, essentially assigned to serve load or signed, assigned to demand within the GHG area and is not assigned, is not assigned to demand or serve load within that entity's internal area. Um, so, so important considerations when you're talking about supporting specified source imports, identification of the specified source and its emission rate, um, verification that the specified source was imported to the GHG zone. I think this could functionally look very similar to how it looks on the bilateral market today. Um, 
in terms of what is required. I do think the biggest question um, is really thinking about whether or not transmission should be required as demonstration of the import. As we were talking earlier today about the specified approach, transmission is not required in order to be deemed delivered to um, the GHG area. And, you know, as we were talking to in the context of an organized market, there, there isn't necessarily that link from resources to loads. And so you are, you are imposing one by requiring transmission um, that may be appropriate given the continued existence of the OAT framework for transmission. But I think an important question to consider um, and whether or not that should be a requirement. And I think also whether and how that requirement is defined, whether it's defined by CARB, whether it's defined by CAISO, sort of who, who, when you have, you kind of have market design and regulatory frameworks that need to kind of talk to each other and reflect each other. Um, and so it's challenging sometimes to really articulate which, which, which entity, you know, can really kind of define what those requirements are. So I think something for further discussion there. And that concludes what I wanted to get through today, just about right on time. Are there any further questions or comments? Okay, go ahead, Vijay. I'll be real quick. This is to Calais's staff. Um, I mean, we all have seen everybody other's comments, but is there any thoughts from Calais's staff on the zonal approach and the latest improvement of thoughts? Uh, do you have any reactions or thoughts about it, please? Keeping in mind specifically um, Mark's comment on the phone from PowerX about the, de the re this get rid of that deeming issue as well. I just want to know what your thoughts are. Maybe I'll start with some, some of the aspects that Mary raised. I mean, I really appreciate the additional details in terms of how the zonal approach is thinking through some of the design details in terms of who that FJD might be um, and some of the Federal Power Act kind of considerations. I think some of the FGD issues are really up to state air regulators, um, as are the proposals. And I think as we mentioned in, in, in my section, um, you know, the we do see that the resource-specific proposal is foundational, so that if there is movement at the state regulatory level to move towards a zonal proposal, we can accomplish that um, from an implementation perspective. Um, I think there's, yeah, still more more discussion to be had, but thanks, thanks, VJ. I don't know if anyone else wanted to add anything there. And there's one more comment on the phone. Our last question from Patar, but your line's unmuted. Hi there. Uh, going back to discrimination is is very interesting response. It's not the first time I'm hearing it that the only way to avoid further rate when you sell to GOG zone is to go for resource specific, like in bilateral. That means that that energy, that market run can only be sell, sold in GOG zone. In other words, in order to avoid discrimination inherent to further rate based market design, you have to pretty much opt out for, from the rest of the footprint. And not Calling that discriminatory, I don't understand uh, uh, argument that makes you feel that when you re reduce market access to some resources, not so to some other resources, that that may not be considered discriminatory. So your solution for non-discriminatory access is actually reducing access to some entities and not to some other entities that are equally situated. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Petter. I think I'm just going to respectfully disagree for now and look forward to further conversation on the topic. All right. Thank Thanks. you, Mary, for a great presentation and for a good Q&A discussion. Uh, round of applause for Mary. Thank you very much, Mary. All right, Anja, Anya, I think next round. All right. With that, I... Um, just want to thank Mary again for, for coming and presenting some of those additional details on the 
um, zonal proposal and some of the considerations for us. Um, at this time, if folks want to stretch for a moment, I also want to invite LEGWP up um, to present their proposal. Um, I know Stuart will be presenting, but I'm not sure if there's other LEGWP members that might want to join him and him and I up here. Um, I think we might need a minute, but thank you, Mary. Okay, thank you for that. And actually, would you mind passing down water? And um, just to, I'm just going to point this out, but to move slides forward, press the that arrow, move back, just have one inch of the slide. Yeah, sure. And then you can, I think you've got the best seat to view the slides too. Yeah, okay. Yeah. What was that? All right, good, we're still live. Um, all right, folks, I think we're, we're wrapping up. We've got our last presentation of the day. I appreciate LEGWP coming forward and presenting their proposal. We heard a preview of it at the uh, May technical conference. Um, but we've got LEGWP here. We've got Stuart, Anu, and Cindy to kind of speak to the proposal and, and answer some Q and A. Um, I want to say that this, you know, was first proposed at that last technical working group, and throughout the stakeholder comments, we did receive interest in further exploration of the proposal itself. I think some of the attributes that were desired. Um, was the lack of GHG attribution and the ease of reporting. Um, but I think there's some more information to get into um, as we'll discover with the presentation today. And with that, I'll turn things over to Stuart. Press the green ticked. Thank you, Anya. Um, well, I hate to disappoint. The LA proposal is not the be all and end all and fixes all the problems. So hands up there, but what we have tried to do is basically take the best of both proposals, the resource specific and the elements that were uh, offered up with zonal, the zonal approach. And that's why um, it's been described as a hybrid, but we're essentially trying to take the best um, from both approaches um, that were proposed. And I'll try and get through this relatively quickly because I know folks would like to get to the reception here rather than listen to me talking about GHG. But what we did do was develop this proposal based on the discussions um, that we heard um, through the stakeholder process. It was loud and clear in terms of two things. We needed to address deeming and we needed to free up entities that are out with a GHG zone from a GHG obligation. At the same time, uh, any solution that's offered up, make sure that we're addressing leakage and secondary dispatch. Um, the solution that we've been working on, um, we believe fits with both Kapan and Trade, as well as Kapan and Vest. And also, um, there's the element of uh, the other 
carbon reducing state programs that we need to consider. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later in this presentation. We specifically focused on the unspecified imports. We think there's an opportunity for the resource specific and zonal approaches to somewhat potentially coalesce. Um, and we've just really largely focused on the unspecified uh, energy component because we believe that's where the biggest issues are. Uh, with our approach, we completely eliminate uh, algorithmic deeming and we completely free um, entities out with the GHG zone of any GHG burden. You heard Mary um, talking about a FERC ruling uh, early on her presentation where by entities um, still have, well, let me, sorry, let me just frame this particular slide up. You've got four columns here and it talks about bedding, optimization, settlement. In the far right column, you've got after the fact GHG accounting. It's sort of grayed out. It only is applicable in our proposal um, to load serving entities within a GHG zone. When asked what is the hybrid approach, the hybrid approach is the resource specific approach with minor incremental changes to reporting and accounting for unspecified imports. It is the resource specific approach. And we believe that all of the um, elements offered up in terms of resource specific, those improvements, when it comes to that baseline, when it comes to the constraints, should all survive. Uh, but the one thing that we would advocate removing is the actual deeming within the resource specific approach. So just to make it clear, this is the resource specific approach with incremental reporting and after the fact accounting changes. When it comes to bidding, Obviously, with the resource-specific approach, you still need a bid order, but if you freed the entities in a non-GHG zone with the obligation um, for accounting and reporting and purchasing and retiring allowances, we are proposing that the market operator insert that bid order um, for optimization purposes. Uh, if you left the bid order with um, the entity that's submitting bids from the non-GHG zone, there is no incentive to put forward an accurate bid order, hence that change. Then when it comes to settlement, you freed the obligation um, from the generators um, of you know, reporting, accounting, and purchase from retiring allowances. So no longer does the credit uh, charge code 491, that credit go to generators and generators purchase and retire allowances for settlements. That payment that credit goes to load in the GHG zone, who then has the obligation to purchase and retire allowances. So just not worrying about the far right column at the moment, that is what we're talking about when it comes to the LA proposal. We are talking about resource specific with the changes in red text where the market operator now submits a bit of other, um, and the payment is made by load and they purchase and retire allowances. Um, and what that allows you to do is you no longer have to deem, which is one of the key objectives, and you have freed entities in a non-GHG zone from the reporting and accounting obligation. Now turning to the, the column in the far right, this is the after a fact GHG accounting. And if you look at the bottom right quadrant, um, you will see that, as Mary discussed earlier, we have this EIM outstanding emissions calculation um, where you have the imported megawatt hours times the default emission rate or demission, emission factor minus deemed delivered. And our proposal says you don't need deemed delivered. We, we're, we're stopping the deeming because it's causing so many problems. And at the end of the day, it does not matter because you're truing up in the current EIM outstanding emission calculation, you're truing up to a default emission factor. We are looking to change that to an after the fact weighted average emission factor because that's going to be more accurate 
it will pr absolutely prevent leakage and uh, deal with any secondary dispatch concerns. So when it comes to the benefits of load-based accounting, as we're calling it, it eliminates the need for algorithmic deeming, as I already said. Scheduling coordinators in a non-GHG zone no longer have to submit GHG bid orders, forecast carbon costs, purchase GHG allowances, or report and verify GHG emissions. It also avoids discriminatory treatment of like resources, and we can debate the discrimination or otherwise. It doesn't dictate GHG zone policy on market participants outside of a GHG zone. And in terms of the outstanding emissions calculation, the weighted average GHG emission factor is derived from actual dispatch for the actual dispatch interval. Um, therefore, there's no leakage or secondary dispatch concerns. And that proposal. Uh, is an improvement on what currently exists today. What are some of the issues with, with deeming? Uh, we've talked a lot about this uh, in the various workshops. Deem delivered resources don't correspond with resource they actually, resources that actually increase their production. Incorrect deeming leads to primarily renewable resources receiving a GHG award without the need to purchase and retire allowances. And there is edge cases here. If you think about transfers out of a non-GHG zone uh, that are constrained, there is the potential here for wrong resources to be getting these payments, even although they don't have a GHG obligation. Um, and as I said, irrespective of what resources are deemed, it's ultimately trued up to um, a wet wide default emission factor. So you, you, you come to question the need for the deeming in the first place. Um, for LSEs, we don't want to receive the energy from GHG emitting resources. Opting out, opting out of the market does not avoid them still being assigned GHG emissions because at the moment with the outstanding emission uh, calculation, uh, that is prorated in a load ratio share. So if you contemplate a world where an entity like LA is potentially completely carbon free, LA could still be paying for emitting resources through that load ratio share with that outstanding emission calculation. Sorry, pause on that a second. So when it comes to um, calculating the bid order it, that the market operator would insert, it's, it's relatively straightforward. There is an emission factor that does exist in the master file. Today was the first annual that I heard that potentially for some resources in the non-GHG zone, it, it may not apply. There's different ways around that, maybe tariff compliance or uh, a default factor, but there is primarily an emission factor that does exist in the master file. And that can, um, and then the cost of carbon can be determined in probably a number of ways, either use the secondary market or the average of the last two auctions, or even have a price determined by the regulatory agency. And the product of those two things would become the GHG um, bid order in this case. So that could easily be derived by the market operator and inserted by the market operator. When it comes to capturing um, the atmospheric impact, um, we, we already talked about you know, the default emission factor and the, the fact that Kaiser deemed eleven emissions are in that calculation and potentially may not want may not need to be. Um, just one second here. Oh, yeah, technical problem. But what, one of the considerations is, and as we try to live within the, the, the intent of what CARB is doing here with the outstanding emission calculation, the default emission factor is based on a wet wide proxy for marginal output that was calculated in 2010. Now, if you think about it, there's a lot of um, non-emitting resource that has come onto the system since 2010, and there's substantially more that's projected um, to come onto the system here in the coming years. So it may have been a good proxy back then, but it's probably out of date. 
And then when you start to consider EDAM and the volumes that are going through EDAM and what's actually getting dispatched at different hours and times of the day, I mean, Kaiso had its load, I think, almost served completely by renewables um, through certain hours and certain days. Uh, under the current construct, that default emission factor would still get applied and settled upon. And that for folks in the GHG zone, that, you know, load in the GHG zone, that's a problem in our mind. So that's where we get to proposing an after the fact weighted average emission factor. It, it recognizing, recognizes what resource ran in that dispatch interval. And that's what gets applied in the outstanding emission calculation. You completely do away with, with deeming itself. And yet the, the net result is a highly accurate and improved, and, uh, and improved calculation when it comes to EIM outstanding emissions. Yes. Okay. Mark Holman, your line is unmuted. Go ahead. Hey, Mark, can you hear us? Hi. Yeah, thanks. Hi, Stuart, can you hear me? Yeah. First, thanks for all the, the hard thinking on this topic. I know it's a really difficult topic. Really appreciate the presentation. I didn't want to interrupt you, but I had some questions around earlier slides just to make sure I understand uh, how it works, if that's okay, if now is a good time. Yep. I'm not quite understanding in the maybe slide five in the market optimization. Are you are you allowing all the imports and all the resources to be dispatched at zero that are external, or are you putting an adder onto all the external units? What are you doing in the optimization itself in and, your proposal? And I think that's the debate we we, we have to have, Mark, because. You know, it, it, and you touched, you folks touched upon that in the zonal approach, that FERC ruling and the ability to opt out. If the compliance obligation is not with the generators um, uh, in the non GG zone, then you can potentially, that's a position that can be taken. I think Mary made that statement. You could add that adder. Um, effectively to the generators in the, the, the GHG zone to get a, a more optimal result. Um, the alternative to that is to say that, you know, that is a consideration uh, and that, that ability to opt out must remain. And we've got a slide at the end, Mark, where we, we have to have that, that discussion. Yeah, and that I, debate. I wasn't really getting into the opt out. And I think there's some, some really good elements of what you're doing after the fact, if there are outstanding emissions to try to get the calculation more accurate. I, I think where I'm struggling is in the dispatch and pricing. So uh, in the dispatch itself, and maybe just use a simple example. If you've got an inside California gas resource that's $40 and has $15 of carbon, the software is gonna see that, that if it dispatches that, it's got it's fifty five dollars. Mm -hmm. If you have out of state, and we'll, we can start with coal, and then we can move to something clean. But if you have out of state resource that say is coal that's fifty with thirty dollars of emissions, are you dispatching that fifty dollar coal to displace the in state gas or not? And if you put no hurdle rate and no GHG cost then I think you're going to cause the software to dispatch out of state, higher emitting, higher cost resources to displace in-state gas. No, it, it works exactly the same way it does today, Mark. If, if that emitting resource is going to be uh, supplying in a, in a GHG zone, is going to be part of that import, it would have an adder. So it would have an adder. The question, the, the question sorry, the statement I was trying to make is, at the moment, as you can see in the slide, there still is the option of opting in or opting out. But if I, you opt out, then you can't be considered for the import. But don't you just get back to then, if, you are, if you're going to have resource specific adders, it's not clear to me how you're going to build that into the optimization to select those resources. 
you don't need to select the resources. You only need to determine the amount of net import into the GHG zone. And that is then you calculate the weighted average emission factor by everything that ran for dispatch or everything that's in the market footprint of that dispatch interval. And that's how you determine um, the accounting. I understand the after the fact accounting. I'm still, again, I, I'll let you move forward, Stuart. I just, I'm still not able to understand how the dispatch algorithm is actually going to work in terms of selecting resources and making sure that we're not dispatching higher cost, higher emitting external resources to displace in-state gas that's lower cost and lower emitting. Maybe I need to see the algorithm proposal to understand it, but there's still a gap for me. But I'll let you move on, Stuart. I don't want to slow you down. I think it's a good point for me asking a clarifying question because we've been thinking about this and what if there was not, first off, I don't know if you need to have the opt-out opt-in if you're not deeming. And if that's the case, what if there was not an opt-out opt-in? It's just all resources have an adder to the extent they are um, supporting uh, transfer into the GHG area, but there's no deeming. If that were the starting point of the solution, one to Mark, does that address his concern? And then two, um, Stuart, do you feel that is compatible with the approach? I, so, Mark, the part I'm the part I'm struggling with is, and it's it's, I, I don't see how the optimization solution works because, and I appreciate your point that if you put an adder on every resource because they're not having to take on the compliance or reporting obligation under this proposal, to me, then you're gonna get stuck with the problem of, you may be choosing one resource relative to another to serve load outside. So you run into that problem in the algorithm. In other words, you end up with an adder on every resource. And if that applies on all of their dispatches, then you might be applying GHG pricing to the selection of resources external to serve external load, which I think is going to be problematic. I think if you say, well, we're going to apply it to all the resources, but that serve imports, you get back into those resources run to meet load outside and to meet imports. So how do you determine which resources were the ones serving the imports versus the load? And how do you do that ex ante so the software can consider the GHG for the ones that are serving the imports? And that's what really led to this specified source approach in the zonal. I don't want to go there, but I'm still struggling with how the algorithm works. But I'd love to hear more. And yeah, Mark, I think it, to answer your question, I think it is compatible with, with our approach, but I, I just want to be sensitive to the slightly different perspectives in bringing that GHG bid adder to all resources, but there is a, a strong argument here if you're not impacted by the policy, and I think Mary alluded to that earlier, then there, there, there's possibly not an issue. Um, I'll, I'll just leave it there. So just turning back to the regulatory and reporting changes, and, and Cindy, you may want to opine a little bit more on this, um, but we, we think the load-based accounting approach fits within CARB's definition of first deliverer of electricity. The first deliverer of electricity means uh, and can mean an EIM purchaser, and, and that EIM purchaser means an electric distribution utility. You want to expand a little bit on that, Cindy? Uh, thanks, Stuart. Uh, so, yeah, so the, the electricity importer, which is equivalent to the first jurisdictional deliverer, um, fits within CARB's definition. Um, and the beauty that we see as far as um, having the EIM purchaser uh, be the reporting and compliance entity that retail providers or load serving entities within California receive an allocation of allowances from CARB uh, to protect the ratepayers from the cost of the cap and trade program. And if the EIM purchaser, which is the retail provider, has the reporting and compliance, they could use those allocated allowances uh, because the 
electricity purchased from the market is to serve native load, is to serve the customers. So that is what those allocated allowances are for. Um, so we see that as a definite plus to this approach. And then we also see that, you know, there's going to need to be some regulatory and reporting uh, accounting changes uh, made to support this proposal. We think that's possible also with the resource specific approach as well. And, and just to address the timing, I know that um, we're looking at this through a lens of FGD, which we, we recognize is important. And we also want a solution that's ready for the start of the market. What the changes we're contemplating here though, even if they were to take a little more time because they're fundamentally based on the resource specific approach, that doesn't mean to say that some of those changes, be it the weighted average element or the market operator and selling the bid order or whatever, or load-based accounting itself, couldn't actually happen after market go live. And we think that's an important aspect of the proposal. And we feel that with what we've gone through with some of the, you know, the stakeholder um, workshops and the level of effort that a number of people have put into this particular topic, I think it would be a, a shame if we stopped short of um, a more, you know, a, a, a less perfect solution um, just for the sake of trying to have something ready in time for market. And I believe there's a question on the phone. Do you have a question from George Angelitas? We call for him first. Maybe while we're waiting for George, I might sneak in a question. Um, you know, in your outstanding emissions calculation, you're using the weighted average um, emissions. Why did you go with weighted average rather than marginal? We just felt that with the weighted average, that that is a, a better representation of everything that ran in the footprint. And I think um, it was mentioned earlier by Vistra, we, we think the baseline component is also an important aspect because otherwise we're going to get a lower kind of marginal cost of GHG. So that was an informative discussion and we kind of felt along those lines, but we think there is a better representation. I think W, and we've left some room for, for Carly to you know, discuss, I think she's slightly different views on whether it should be just what's dispatched in the market or the full footprint. And, and we have to have that conversation. Question here from Mary. Thanks, this is Mary Winky from the Public Learning Pool. Um, just wanna echo appreciation of the effort on this and putting this forward. Really appreciate all manner of thinking on this topic. Um, and, I, and I appreciate also thinking about doing this differently in terms of using that weighted average and the after the fact reporting, which I think has an appeal for its simplicity. I think my question is kind of, kind of the question that Mark Holman was asking a little bit. And I, I think part of what my understanding of the FJD framework and the current approach is that is that it drives changes in the market in terms of price signals, in terms of investment decisions, and kind of quote unquote getting the dispatch right for, you know, and for appropriately pricing resources according to their carbon content and driving the right price signals. And, and while you have a reporting that captures leakage or captures all of the outstanding emissions, it doesn't, I, it's unclear to me yet how this approach minimizes leakage in the dispatch itself and really aims to reduce, you know, reduce overall emissions versus just account for all of them. Uh, three points there. One, one in terms of if you in, include the GHG order because you, you take the point that you know anything out with the GHG zone is not impacted. 
that that's one consideration and the discussion we have to have and i'd like to see the pros and cons and potential concerns on the draft final proposal the other element is as offered up by George earlier in terms of establishing that baseline and only considering what that upper economic dispatch is, that also helps because, to your point, Mary, if you didn't have that in this particular resource, it's arguable that you, you, you have more secondary dispatch. So we think that's an important element. And as we said earlier, we're trying to take um, the best, best of what you've offered and, and what George has offered and and come up with a better solution, albeit we recognize it's not as perfect as we'd want it to be. On the investment component, I kind of contend that point because if you think about it, there's hydro resources that have been in the ground for quite some time that are getting the benefit of that GHG payment. There's arguments that, yeah, they're a renewable resource um, they should get that payment, but there's there's kind of arguments that, you know, they didn't have to make any investment necessarily, so should they get it? Then for newer resources, you know, many of the utilities are contracting directly with those new resources. They're obligated by their other um, carbon reducing programs to, to put that in the ground or, 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 or buy those. So do you really need um, an additional a GHG payment beyond that, but at the same time, even though the resource, the where the resource specific is stepping away from the the green GHG pseudo tie, you still have the opportunity of pseudo tying. I, I know that's clunky. There's a lot involved in that. You could still self self schedule into a certain area and put any excess into the GHG zone to get the LMP and then cover the investment. I don't know if there's a perfect answer. I just want to make sure we tee up um, some of the key questions, address the pros and cons, uh, and set a long-term path of where we need to be based on all the discussions we've had. Yeah. Um, and I just wanted to add, as far as the investment, uh, so as an entity that's subject to California's renewable portfolio standard, I can say that that the utilities are the ones that are driving the development of new renewable resources by contracting with the developer, entering into a long-term contract to buy energy from that renewable resource. And so that is the true driver uh, behind building new renewable resources. Uh, Jeff Nelson, uh, again, I'd like to express uh, thanks for the extra thinking that's gone in here on some of the ideas. Uh, so thank you guys. Uh, I'm a little unclear if your proposal's locked down or if there's things you want to discover or discuss, especially on that GHG rate, because I see a bunch of ways that were sort of talked about. So I don't know, maybe you can sort of focus me on what your current thinking is, or if there's just a discussion. If there's a balancing authority, it's got a bunch of units running and it's exporting to California. So, so the first thing I heard was, well, the ISO can just calculate the weighted average of, of everything that's running in that balancing authority. And that can be what's deemed to be the GHG intensity of the import. That's one option I thought I heard. Maybe. Yeah, that, that's correct. After the fact, if you wanted to calculate that intensity, it's either what was dispatched. I think there's alternative views yeah. of what is in the, the, the market footprint. So it's not locked down. I, I think we just oh, okay. want to, okay. we want to tee up what we think are the areas for discussion. Okay. Uh, that's that's the after the fact emission calculation, carbon cost. Um, there's a couple of other things, but yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to sort of spew out alternatives that mm -hmm. I thought I heard discussed. So one is whatever it is, the whole the whole balancing authority, carbon intensity. You look at that. Another one is that there's some sort of baseline, and we've talked about the RSC baseline before, some sort of pre-dispatch. And just the stuff that's sort of dispatched above the baseline, you can look at the carbon intensity of that incremental dispatch and deem mm -hmm. that as that. And I think there is another proposal of something like, well, marginal, look, you can look at the marginal uh, GHG that's in the balancing authority as a carbon. Are there other flavors that are being thought about? Well Maybe WPTF can comment. They had some, they they had some, you know, feedback, and that's why we left this particular item open. So I think they have some views 
um, maybe and I'll defer to them or let them opine on it. If I, if I may, Jeff, are you wondering about the GHG bid adder that gets used in the optimization, or are you looking no. to get clarification of the after the fact? After the fact. So, you know, again, my understanding, again, is that the optimization like today is going to look at units in two ways. It's still going to look at them and to say, hey, if, if I dispatch you for California, what is your price? And it's your... For anyone else, what is your price? And it's just the, it's just the, right. and that gets to your point you raised earlier on the zonal approach. We're trying to preserve yes. the optimization that, components. That, right. yeah. The optimization stays efficient that way. Yeah. yeah. And I, the, the, the low hydro cost unit that wants to sell to California, but's prevented from selling by a hurdle rate in sort of the zonal, it doesn't have that problem. The optimization sees it and can still take that low cost energy that wants to sell to California. Yeah, so right. I think Payatar's concerns about discrimination uh, are addressed in this. It's just really the, uh, what is the intensity of the GHG that's deemed? And then my understanding is then that you allocate that obligation to load within California and for unspecified imports, yes. For unspecified imports. And how is that done? Is that in proportion uh, I, to net purchases out uh, of the market? Ideally, uh, ideally would be a, a proration of the net import. At the moment, you, we right, have the load to. ratio share, but that can't survive because then you're having customers in a non-GHG zone that are fully renewable, supply from fully renewable, and I don't know how we do that in the market construct, but still paying for emissions. So that, that, wouldn't, that wouldn't survive. That, yeah, that has to change. I was just given a ticket. Usually that's bad news. But that's you know, that's you. <laughs> that means you got an orange juice later. <laughs> Great, thank you. Thank you, guys. So, Jeff, Jeff, just wanted to add there. Yeah, just wanted to add there that the weighted average emission factor, the, the reason we're proposing that is to address the leakage and secondary dispatch issues, right? So whatever that was not captured within the optimization, which is the secondary dispatch, now based on the weighted average of the actual dispatch from our perspective in the non-GHG zone gets captured in that EIM outstanding emissions calculation. Yeah, and I, I, and I kind of see that because let's just say that balancing authority is running all clean resources at the time of this import, that calculation would say, well, Zero. there's yeah. nothing yeah. to do. Exactly. And if it's almost all coal at the time of this, they might say, hey, there's a whole bunch to do. Right. So, I, I kind so it's of, a much, much more accurate representation. I kind of see of the dynamic it. nature, which was discussed earlier. Well, how do you set that sort of dynamic uh, hurdle rate? Yeah, very, very difficult to yes. set prospectively. It's yeah. easier to calculate yeah. after, after the, the fact. fact. And if you move to the um, proration of the net import, then you're, you're not paying emissions if you on imports if you're actually exporting. That's another problem. You're... you're your load LSE could be exporting, but under the existing EIM outstanding emission factor, still paying a proration of the outstanding emission calculation, right? So. Yeah. Great, Th thank you very much. Yeah, a and the, uh, the concept was that the purchasers would pay based on what they buy. So megawatt hours purchase times the average emission factor would be your share of the GHG emissions. Okay, I think there's a question from Claire. Uh, Claire Breidnich, WPTF. Um, and I'm gonna, I had actually had a question, but <coughs> since you actually kicked a question to me, I'll take that as well. Um, starting on the emission factor issue, because I think this will actually segue to my question. Um, I think where we're coming from as WPTF, I think doing some sort of compliant, uh, some sort of weighted average emission factor for compliance purposes makes complete sense. If, if CARB were to consider something like that about turning about the emissions. Where I would take issue, and this is where I would like to explore a little bit more about how, and more specifically why you see benefits compared to the zonal approach with respect to the, the um, undifferentiated or unspecified imports. And so where I think we would differ, um, and I was happy to see that in the presentation on zonal, there is now thinking about using a marginal emission factor for zonal. Um, and our thinking on that is that we think for price formation, we actually need to get to 
effectively a mission rate that's close to the, the marginal resource so that both generation that is serving load within the greenhouse gas zone is getting the carbon premium. Clean resources are getting that carbon premium that reflects um, marginal generation. Um, but the flip side, and this comes to the why and what I see different about your proposal. The flip side is that um, as you're probably aware, um, if the if the price separation within the greenhouse gas zone and out of zones separates by whatever the hurdle rate is in a in a given period, um, then LNPs and what load is paying within the greenhouse gas zone is going to differ from at least in terms of the greenhouse gas component to outside of zone. So when I look at your proposal and the fact that you are not pricing in the carbon costs of resources that are serving this, uh, even though they don't actually have a carbon cost, but whatever the carbon value is for the resources that are uh, that are supporting this unspecified transfer, what that says to me is th that we have we will not have appropriate price separation. Um, and clearly utilities in California would pay less, utilities in Washington would pay less than they would under a zonal approach. I guess my question back to you is if the zonal approach were such that the compliance um, obligation fell on the load serving entity and then in settlement, effectively the CAISO would take, um, take payment from one pan, pay it back to utilities on the other to cover for an emission obligations and presumably keep you whole for the additional carbon obligation that you would get for zonal transfers what then is the benefit? Like, is there, is there another piece that I'm missing here in terms of how you see, particularly the impacts on load within uh, the, the greenhouse gas areas of your approach versus uh, zonal approach? No, uh, I think where Mary was headed in her presentation, uh, as I stated earlier, I agree with some of those concepts. I agree with, you know, there, there potentially is a role for a market operator um, to make that payment. I, I would refine that even further. I think there's a role for a standard carbon cost and there's just a direct payment. I don't see the need to, if an AMO is actually making that payment from the market for unspecified, you need to purchase entire allowances. But obviously that would take considerable rulemaking. We're just trying to lay a foundation for those possibilities in the future. The only contention I have with the zonal approach, as I said, we've taken the best of the zonal approach. We see some added value in a lot of the things that have been offered up. Just, just don't like the hurdle rate. I'm sorry. Okay. Like there's three questions. Oh. Oh, and if I can just uh, add sure. one point um, for that question, that the the difference with our proposal with the load serving entity doing the reporting and having the compliance is that they can use their allocated allowances. So there's no need to pay money to one entity and then that entity give it back to the load serving entity, take it out of one pocket, give it back to the other pocket. There's no need for that. Stuart, do you want to take the Marka. questions or do you want to finish your slides? I want to go to the bar. I know, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Stuart, before you go to bar, this is your Let, let me quickly me? finish. Sorry, that was right, my inside finish voice. The slides. I'll be two seconds. Um, this is just a comparison. You can read that at your own leisure um, of a before and after. Um, and this was just comparing proposals. I think the only important part here is that Ellie's proposal is the only one that absent deeming. And that was the genesis for the whole discussion. So I thought that was the end point we're trying to get to. Um, as I say, we've left over, uh, left open, you know, discussions on whether, you know, generators in a non-GHG zone should get the GHG bid order or not. Is there enough incentive to bid into a GHG zone at that point? I think there is because, you know, if, if you don't, you're going to find a lot of entities needing to curtail or spill water if they didn't do that. And I don't know why they wouldn't open up their resources to the full market footprint. Um, concern about the incorrect deeming. Um, and we, we obviously don't want to discriminate. The other component is the discussion of weighted average emission factor. We've left that open. We think our proposal will be informed by the expertise um, you know, in the room and on the phone. And then lastly, and we need to kind of think about linkage uh, you know, the cost of carbon, you could still have 
the same cost of carbon in the market for everyone, you could actually have a, a different cost of carbon for each zone, but only apply a single cost of carbon and true up after the fact. There's possibilities there, but a single cost of carbon aids linkages. But the other consideration here is if you don't have a single cost of carbon in the market, it's who's going to price their carbon the lowest, they're probably going to benefit the most. So um, we, we have some other stuff in terms of the appendices, but uh, we'll go to the questions on the phone. We do have Todd Jones. Go ahead, Todd. Hi, thanks so much. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, thank you. Uh, Todd Jones, Center for Resource Solutions, and thank you for the proposal and the presentation. Um, I, I had previously made the argument that some jurisdictions and programs may consider that resource-specific GHG attribution in the market to specific states or zones uh, affects the RECs associated with attributed generation and emissions. I wonder if you can explain how this proposal um, differs from the other two in, in terms of that concern. Do you see this proposal as, a, as addressing that concern in any way? I, I, I think it in part does address it because I, I would see um, those resources with the regs being treated as specified and um, be you know self-scheduled in the market and anything that's bid into the market probably doesn't come with those regs is kind of what I'm thinking but um, anything to add on and Cindy on that one? Um, yeah so as far as uh, renewable resources um, more than likely that is that resource is under contract to a utility that needs those recs for RPS compliance. So those recs would not be available for sale in the general market. That's right. Unless it's tagged and it's all specified and under the contract, then it gets treated the way it gets treated right now. But it, it, it does raise a question in my mind as we bring the bilateral and the spot market together and you know the key principle is not favor one over the other but if we continue to pay that bid adder based on the marginal cost of ghg to a, a, a larger set of transactions is there i guess there's a question in my mind is there a potential for a cost shift here because we're not paying um a bid adder in the bilateral market currently so that's maybe maybe something to consider as well Um, this is Vijay with WRA. Um, again, good work. Thank you for bringing along another proposal to compare to. If you go back a few slides, and by the way, I, I was hoping we'll get these slides. I didn't see them on the ISO website. Maybe it is, but thank you. See, right there, I think I'm curious, Stuart, or the whole team on what, why or what are you thinking behind revising the definition of imported electricity and electricity importer? to focus on the EIM, EDAM purchaser, because uh, I mean, I I'm trying to understand what are, what is your thought process there and why do you have to revise the definition? So the thought process is because the current definition focuses on the, the participating resource scheduling coordinator, which is associated with the generator. So if we want to shift the reporting and compliance burden to the load serving entity that who's actually buying the electricity from the market, then we would want to change that definition from the, the resource scheduling coordinator to the EIM purchaser, or in this case, the EIM slash EDAM purchaser. Okay, that helps a lot. So question then back to Anya in a way is, with the resource specific approach, I guess we don't have that situation. I mean, uh, it won't you, be in- Yeah, I don't think you have that scenario under resource specific. Okay, but then you, but you are, your proposal does take resource specific approach, but come up with a load based accounting only for unspecified emissions, correct? C correct. And we're, we're trying to contemplate some of the potential changes um, and, and in a way allow CARB to be pretty precise in CARB's comments <laughs> on this particular pro proposal. Uh, so, so that's why we've laid out in this way. So I'll, ask my last question, because I know you're keen to get done, is are you sure you, how easy will that be to get CARB approval? Will that require a legislative change going to Sacramento to get approval or it's a rulemaking change at CARB? It, I'll let CARB opine on that. We, 
we, we'll let them give us some feedback on that. But the key thing, BG, is we are saying if this is this is the right approach, we're, we don't need to be bound by um, the start off of the market because it's built on the resource specific approach. So we're trying to be pragmatic about how we nope. go about this. I get it. Thank you. Thank you. Question, questions on the phone? Uh, I have one, uh, Stuart. This is George and Gary with the SO. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, so this is on the calculation of this weighted average. Uh, you mentioned that it's going to be the weighted average of all resources running outside the greenhouse gas uh, area. And I was wondering, uh, why don't you limit that to the resources that in the first phase of the calculation got uh, deemed? Uh, okay, they, they got the greenhouse gas uh, attribution so that you know exactly, uh, you pick up exactly the resources that uh, uh, are deemed to be serving load uh, in the greenhouse gas regulation area because otherwise you may be picking up, say, carbon resource that is running just because it's of scheduling or it had bids, it cleared the market, but didn't get um, an attribution. Why would you pick that up in that calculation, uh, right? I, it, it's a completely fair point. And I'm, I'm just saying there's two perspectives on this. I think there's a broader fruit print aspect of it, but I, I lean towards, you know, what was actually dispatched to support that import. But, but we are, we're certainly looking for some feedback and to make sure we land in the right spot. Yeah, and if I can right. just add um, one more, uh, oh, if I can ahead. just add a point there, um, CARB was very concerned about the secondary dispatch, which was not being captured in the resource specific approach, and so that's part of this discussion is how why do you cast that net to make sure that you're capturing uh, the secondary dispatch as well. Right, and, and CARB does have a process in the IM today to, to calculate this residual uh, uh, dispatch, and they could continue doing that. Why would we do it here as part of this proposal? This is not clear to me. All our, all our settlement is based on marginal cost. We will be collecting, actually, uh, revenue based on the marginal greenhouse gas prices calculated by this uh, solution. So if then we use a different price, um, weighted average or whatever, uh, then we'll have a neutrality issue because we'll have a difference in money that we need to, to distribute. And if we distribute the same entities, the load serving entities that uh, the original uh, intent was, then we're coming full circle of essentially using the marginal price. So we're not using it right away. I don't have a neutrality issue and let CARB, if they want to have some secondary calculation to capture emission, uh, secondary emission, or whatever they want to do. I mean, why should we not use the marginal price, which is the result of this algorithm and it leaves the market operator neutral? Yeah, yeah absolutely. You can use the marginal price, apply it, make the, the payment based on that, and then, you know, you use the weighted average in, in the true up after the fact, and then you've covered everything. And if you have that baseline of reference point, you've minimized secondary dispatch. I think that's probably where we need to head, but need to capture some of the detail in this, this, this final proposal. Okay, so we got four questions. Oh, thanks, yeah, we got four questions in the queue. We can quickly get through those, then we can get Stuart to the bar. So, okay, Ra Rachel, go, go ahead. Hi, yes, good afternoon. Uh, this is Rachel Gold at CARB. Just um, weigh in to say that I really appreciate uh, the all the many aspects of the conversation this afternoon. Um, and I did just want to make a couple of clarifications regarding our existing regulation and how it's characterized here. Um, uh, so just two things to note. One is that um, our EIM purchaser um, approach is an approach to address the known leakage in the current WEIM. It is not equivalent to how we are require reporting for electricity imports or for direct compliance obligations. Um, so I wanted to just clarify that distinction in terms of the existing regulation. Um, and then the second thing was um, I, I wanted to clarify that um, in terms of 
um, our allocation to California electric utilities. It's only publicly owned utilities and electrical cooperatives that are currently allowed to use allocated allowances to, direct, to cover compliance costs. Our investor owned utilities um, are not allowed to do so and all of those um, allowances um, are uh, provided in the form of rebates or direct GHG reduction programs. Um, so I wanna make those um, clarifications. And then um, finally, I just wanted to know, I heard earlier there were some questions about whether or not changes um, for the EDAM would require CARB regulatory changes. Um, it's likely that they will require regulatory changes uh, that would go through our full regulatory process and require board approval. Um, what kind of changes will be needed will really depend on what the EDAM proposal is um, and, and, and uh, then we would go from there, but we do not currently have any active rulemaking. Thank you. That's extremely helpful, Rachel. Thank you for the clarification. Sure. More questions on the phone? Next is Mark Coleman. Your lines are muted. Go ahead. Hi, Stuart. Knowing that I'm keeping you from the bar, I will be quick. Um, just a couple of comments. One is that um, I'm really glad that this is recorded because I think that some of the comments were just exceptional today. I really appreciated the clarity with which Claire provided her comments and just the importance of dispatch and pricing. As you go away to think about your proposal, again, we like some of the elements of the after the fact pieces to the extent we need after the fact, um, but I'll say two things on your market optimization, dispatch and pricing. If you include GHG pricing on those external units as shown in slide five, we are concerned that that could raise a legal challenge because that will be applying GHG pricing to external generation serving external load, that it will make clean resources more attractive than gas and more attractive than coal. And again, not that we have a philosophical problem with that, of course, but I think that's problematic that your GHG policy of one state is exported to another. If you don't include that, and again, you have no hurdle rate, now we see a very serious leakage problem that, it, that may be even worse than today. All external coal, gas, hydro renewables would be treated equally with no emissions and would be free to displace internal gas, including coal. And we see that as problematic and we do not think the solution is to retire even more allowances because the way we see that is we're not grabbing the low-hanging fruit. The low-hanging fruit is to stop dispatching coal to displace internal gas, not allow that to happen, and then try to solve it in some other sector of the economy. So we're struggling with the dispatch and pricing, even though we like a lot of the thinking, uh, Stuart. We really see that as an optimization problem and the price formation, and we recognize the tension that was raised earlier. We understand that purchasers would be better by not having it in the optimization and just having extra allowances retired. But I think one of the goals of GHG pricing programs is to send really good price signals for clean resources to display, actually run, be imported or located in the jurisdiction and displace emitting resources. I said I'd be short, so I'll stop there. Happy to talk offline. Um, we are struggling with the optimization and the pricing. It's fair comments, but I think there's a middle ground there where folks either bid in or, or bid out of the GHG zone as they do today. And I think in part that ad addresses um, some of your concerns, Mark, and that's why we kind of deliberately positioned it the way we did um, because of these potential concerns. And and indeed, there, there may be aspects of this whole GHG payment that actually better fit under price formation and should be tackled under that initiative and at the end of the day i'll just you know if, if I, I don't i don't agree fully uh, on the you know the payment to non-ghg resources as the way of trying to get the right environmental outcome uh, I, I do and I, i've considered this previously and i'll say it again i mean if we could get to some kind of voluntary compact where folks were willing to disadvantage their emitting resources and didn't have to settle on it we'd probably get a, a good environmental as well as um, 
economic outcome. So I, I think there's a middle ground to be to be if found, Mark. If there's some other middle ground or some other optimization that we're not understanding from your slides, that's great. We, If you have any ability to put together a Excel optimizer like George has done in the past, that would be fantastic just because we're not seeing it from the slides. That's not to say there couldn't be some new brilliant idea that gets the dispatch and pricing right um, or more right. We'd love to see it. So we, we keep an open mind. Yeah, I, I think if you've voluntarily bidden into the GHG area, that, that's one way of doing it. But let us take that um, offline and see if we can address it. We can do Carrie next. I believe that's her phone. Yeah. Hi, this is Callie Wells with WPTF, and I will make this short. I actually was hoping to get a better grasp on the price formation coming out of the optimization in this approach. Um, but instead of asking my question, can I just ask that maybe tomorrow when I think George is going to be walking us through some examples for the resource specific and zonal approach, can we make a note to talk about the price formation from this proposal so we can get an idea of how it compares um, to the other approaches? Yeah, I, I and think then that's you can get a to the bar. Yeah, yeah, Kali, I think um, that's a good place to look at George's slides tomorrow. There may be some variations in what he's presenting, but that's probably a better place to talk about the price formation. We do. Okay, have one. great. Yeah, if we can make a note to do that, that would be wonderful. We do have one more question in queue, Patar. Go ahead. It's your excellent presentation, and, and I'm really sorry that we didn't see this, this great idea when we were fighting with two, two pass approach five, six years ago. But I guess we needed somebody to propose zonal to get the idea how to improve resource-based approach. Going back to, to, to what Mark Holman said, I would recommend that George pulls that formulation from 2013 about how algorithm works. It's very short add improvements uh, relative to GAG reference and show it this presentation tomorrow to show that there is really no impact on LMPs outside of GAG zone because that marginal GAG price is negative and is automatically subtracted from LMPs outside of GAG zone. But it was always like that, even from the early days, that's how it was designed. So your proposal is exactly the same as the resource base fundamentally uses GAG reference to avoid security dispatch. And going back to your idea to use average rate to capture atmospheric impact and using the whole print, footprint, even resources who are not delivering to California is not correct. As George pointed correctly, you know exactly which resources are delivering imports to GAG zone. You know their GAG beat others. You know marginal GAG cost. And you have multiple options to discuss with CARB. They can use as bid GAG for those that are emitting. They can use marginal. They can use unspecified average, whatever. But averaging to the whole footprint, including GAG emission resources that are not selling to GAG zone, is not correct. Yeah, that, that's a good point. And George's slide, the, 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 there may be some confusion because it looks at different outcomes, but everything else being equal, it should be the the same outcome under certain scenarios. But um, yeah, we'll maybe talk a little bit more about that tomorrow, Peter, and uh, we can think about it as well in terms of trying to address Mark's Holman's uh, comments. All right. Thanks very much, Stuart, and to the LA team for your presentation and for entertaining so many questions. Thank you very much. All right, so just a quick wrap up um, and just some reminders for tomorrow. So before everybody leaves the room here, I just wanna thank everybody who joined us virtually. And so tomorrow we'll see you back online at nine o'clock mountain time. So thanks for joining us. And for those of you in the room, um, we do have continental breakfast tomorrow morning between eight and nine, and then back in this room at nine. So earlier we were ticketing everybody um, so that is not a free entry pass to EDAM, but it will get you two drinks at the bar. Um, so if you go back towards the lobby, 
you will stumble into the networking area and enjoy a networking event. So look forward to seeing you there. Thank you. That concludes our conference. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.